Hey guys, I've had some of you request that I do a compilation video, so thanks for voting in the poll. I've combined July's videos into one big compilation, for those of you that like to put my videos on when you go to sleep. Enjoy, guys. Let me share the story about the time my mother and I discovered a homeless man living in our cottage basement. This was February of this year, 2021. We have a cottage about 45 minutes away from my parents' main home, and it's not too far from Huntsville, Muskoka, Ontario, if anyone wants a visual. Thing is, it's completely unfurnished. The bedroom has no proper flooring and has a slight water leak right now, so there are plenty of fans and a dehumidifier running. As a result, one of us needs to check on the place at least every two to three weeks to empty the dehumidifier in the basement and make sure everything is okay. To describe the house layout a bit, the entrance to the basement is directly in front of the main entrance. It's a long skinny staircase down with a low roof, so you need to crouch on the way down. There is one crappy light bulb in the ceiling, so it's always super dark down there. There's one big room, then two hallways branching off. One hallway leads to a bedroom, and the other leads to not only a second bedroom, but also a washroom all of which are completely unfurnished and without lighting. The second hallway is much longer, and the rooms are just way off in the back corner of the basement and are completely dark. In other words, it's creepy looking. Okay, so let's get to the good part. The day it all went down. My mom and I are headed up there to empty the dehumidifier, have some lunch, and clean out some junk. We're slowly gutting the place, it had nearly been three weeks since we checked up on the place by this point. We stop at McDonald's beforehand and each got a filet of fish combo. We get into the place and put our food on the table, then turn the heat on. The first thing we do is run downstairs to turn the water on and check on the dehumidifier. After turning on the water, we head over to the dehumidifier and notice that there's hardly any water in it. It looks like it's only been running for a couple of days. There was still the regular amount of moisture on the ground, but it was strangely empty. My mom and I head upstairs, and she grabs her phone to text my dad, and asks if he stopped by the house to empty the dehumidifier recently. He said he hadn't. We were both puzzled as to why it looked so empty, but never considered there was a third person in the house with us. After heating up our food, we both sit down at the table and turn on the TV. About five minutes into our meal, we hear a massive bang downstairs. Almost as if someone stubbed their toe really badly on a cupboard or something like that. We instantly jump and look at one another with a freaked out look on our faces. The TV is still playing rather quietly. Then we hear the worst thing. We hear a small grunt downstairs. It was unmistakable. A human vocal sound. My mom whispers to me, was that a person? And I smirk and nod my head yes. Although it was freaky at the moment, I wasn't really taking it very seriously for some reason. Looking back, this was pretty serious, and the person could have been very dangerous. I just told her, grab your jacket and let's head out to the car and call the police. We gather our stuff, and I grab a kitchen knife on the way. If you'll recall, the entrance to the basement is directly across from the main entrance of the house, so I had to make this peek around the corner and was fully expecting to see a person on the dark staircase. But luckily, it was just a series of stairs down into the dark abyss. Once we're out front, we jump into my car, and she calls the cops immediately. Within three minutes, four cruisers show up, and five cops got out. We told them what had happened, and they headed down the driveway. They were in the house for probably about 10 minutes before the door opened. A couple of cops walked out and boom, the third cop brought out a short chubby guy with long black hair and pop bottle glasses. They brought him out handcuffed onto the front steps and another cop had a bag that looked like his belongings. We were in our car which was set up the street a bit and facing away from the entrance of the cottage. But my mom was turned away as soon as he was brought up the driveway. She didn't want to get a good look at him, as the whole situation was pretty unsettling for her. 
They loaded him in the back of one of the cruisers and took him away. One cop came over and spoke with my mom for a bit about the situation. Ultimately, my parents had decided not to press charges against the guy when it was all said and done. He was just sleeping on the cold cement ground with a small roll-out mattress. Even though there was a proper bed upstairs, this made us think that he'd been down the back alley in the unfinished bedroom for a while. We probably walked downstairs to empty the dehumidifier and turn on and off the hot water a number of times, and he was like 15 feet away in one of the bedrooms. He probably wasn't a bad person, and I'm personally at least a bit thankful he decided to empty the dehumidifier. Hopefully he lived in there for most of the colder months this past winter. We're just lucky it didn't turn out to be one of those crazy squatting situations. I was 14 years old when I had to live with my grandparents. I had to live with them because my sister was in college and my parents were divorced. They lived in this old bungalow type house. It was one story and we have stairs that immediately goes to the attic. An attic, which no one really uses. We just put stuff in there. It's too hot and stuffy up there. The sole window up there didn't really help. The attic had old creaky wooden floors that I remember that I have to polish with a coconut shell because that's how we do it here in the Philippines. That and my grandparents are very traditional. Anyways, my door room was near the stairs leading up to the attic. Like you open my door and then face right and the stairs would be immediately right there. I hated that every time I left my room because I would expect that something would be immediately crawling down from the attic. One night, my grandparents had to pick up my aunt's family from the airport, but because of hellish traffic here, they had to leave at 7pm, and their expected arrival back home would be at most 5am. So a 14-year-old girl would be alone at home the whole time. I told them I would be safe here. We lived in a gated community, and we have tons of guard dogs. Everything will be okay. Or so I thought. Before they left, we already had dinner, so I was stuck with cleaning the dishes. As I was doing that, I could hear a bunch of neighborhood dogs bark a lot. I didn't really think much of it, because the dogs always do that. When I finished cleaning up from dinner, I immediately had to lock every door and window and turn off all the lights before heading to bed. When I entered my room, the lights were on and it looked normal. My anime posters were on the wall, my closet was untouched, my bed was next to my barred, tinted windows. We had to tint them because I was on the first floor and my grandparents wanted to make sure that no one could peep into my room. They were barred too because my uncle, who used to use this room, always escaped through the window to go to parties. This was my grandparents' solution to that. Nothing was out of place to alarm me. Everything was normal until I turned off the lights. As soon as I turned off the lights, a silhouette of a man was illuminated by the streetlights outside. He looked like he had thick curly hair and a skinny build. I thought I was having hallucinations, so I turned on the lights again and he was gone. I turned them off again and he was back. I turned them on again and he was gone. And then I finally turned them off. And he wasn't there. I sighed in relief. I was just tricking myself, I guess. Or something else was casting the shadow. I double locked my door just to be safe. One lock was the doorknob, and the other one was one of those latch types. Then tucked myself in. It was hard to fall asleep when a lot of dogs are barking outside. They weren't our dogs, they were just the neighbors. But I was finally falling asleep when I heard something from above me moving. Something in the attic. I pushed the thought down. I'm tricking myself again. I hugged my pillow. It's just rats, I said to myself. These rats seemed heavy and were also pushing furniture around. My heart sank when I heard them hurriedly go down the stairs and stop at the bottom. I covered myself with my blanket and I waited for something. I was also wishing that my parents gave me a phone at a time like this. 
and suddenly I heard my doorknob being gently fiddled. I wanted to vomit when I heard a click, followed by a quiet turn of the knob. The knob turned, but it didn't budge. When they noticed, they tried to push it. This time, I finally stood up, shaking. I was a kid, home alone with no phone, no means of defense. All I had that was saving me was this thick door from the old days. I softly pushed my body up against the door and locked everything up again. I didn't want to make a sound. I didn't want to scream. I didn't want him to know I was here. I don't know why he stopped, but he did. I didn't go back to bed. I just sat there at the door, waiting. It felt like forever. I heard the footsteps go upstairs, but I still sat there. I saw something moving in the corner of my eye, there, out of the window. The shadow was back. I forced myself not to look. All I could think of was that thank God they were barred. I don't remember what happened after that. I think I fell asleep, or I was too scared to even think straight. I just remember the next day, when my family and I were having breakfast, I casually brought it up to my grandfather, telling him that I think I heard footsteps in the attic last night. My grandmother scoffed, it's probably rats, I never brought it up again. I didn't want to worry them, but I do know this, our dogs were caged up near the gate and were far from my room, so they wouldn't have seen anything. The only dogs who were near my room were the neighbors. There was nothing outside my room that could cast a shadow that looked like a man, and lastly, the attic window was wide open. So back in 2010, I lived in a real dive of a place with four other guys. It was a triplex that the owner had converted into one house. The place was just short of being condemned, but we were all in our 20s and wanted a party house. So it totally worked for us. We threw so many parties that we just didn't notice a lot of stuff. Like when the spare bedroom window was smashed, we assumed one of our drunk friends did it by accident. And any time food went missing, obviously one of our drunk idiot roommates just stole it, even though no one fessed up to it. We also had a ridiculous problem with what we assumed were raccoons. All the damn time, we'd hear scratching and shuffling up on the roof. Every morning we'd go out, and our trash would be all over the place. Well, after about a year of random messes, missing food and alcohol, and eerie scratches, one of my roommates and I were leaving the house at the same time for work. As we step outside, there's a familiar woman in our front yard. We've seen her a few times wandering the streets in the neighborhood, but never really paid her any attention. She's wearing one of my t-shirts and going through our trash can, tossing things on the ground she's not interested in. My roommate and I both freeze as we see the woman doing this, and she very slowly looks up at us. Her eyes are totally glassed over, and she stares at us with confusion all over her face. My eyes go wide as I recognize my t-shirt, and I go to open my mouth. When she says something that to this day has made me shudder. Why are you living in my house? And that was all I could handle. I assure you, I'm not someone that is ever short on words. But this rendered me entirely speechless. My roommate and I stared at each other, eyes wide. Got into our cars and drove the hell away from our own home just to get away from that situation. That night, when we had all the boys together, we told them what happened, and we finally made the decision to investigate the roof. Turns out, we had a flat roof. It's not generally the kind of thing you think about. Most roofs are slanted or have angles. Not ours. It was just a flat roof, like a two-story building got cut in half. You just couldn't see the top, because it had an awning that blocked the flat roof from view around it. So for the first time, we climbed up there and discovered someone had been living on our roof. Many of our missing items were strewn all over. There was a makeshift bed, spare clothing, food, wrappers, water, and even books all just sitting there. We moved out shortly after that, 
but I've never forgot the look of that lady staring through me and asking what I was doing living in her house. Madame Roof Dweller, let's not meet again. For some context, sometime in late 2019, I started seeing someone. We'll call him Shu. Shu seemed nice enough and was generally what appeared to be somewhat of a normal guy. He kept insisting we move in together, despite dating for only a few months, and the fact that I already owned my own house. That should have been enough to tell me to run, but no, I didn't. Shu started showing up my house late at night, without announcing himself or asking to be invited. At first, it wasn't too bad, but it became nightly, then he started lying for attention, even going as far as to claim a close friend had died. No, a close friend had not died. He showed up drunk and demanding attention and refused to follow my house rules. If I did let him in, he'd refuse to leave. Long story short, Shu's behavior kept getting worse and worse, showing up drunk from being at the bars all night during COVID, demanding my attention despite knowing I'm high risk. He tried one last time to get into my home, and I cut it off right there. I told him to leave me alone. The next morning, I got a call at 5am to come into work on my day off. I was annoyed but agreed. Then the call started non-stop. I tell him to leave me alone and hang up again and again. When it was time to leave for work, I assumed it was my boss calling to tell me he was here to pick me up. It wasn't. It was Shu. Well, your boss is here for you. Click. Sure enough, 7am and he was camped out on my front porch and tried to grab me in broad daylight in front of my boss. This kind of behavior went on for nearly a week. My employees refused to let me walk home after he started showing up at my place of work at closing time and would try to cut me off when trying to get into my house. I found out that he kept calling because he could hear my phone ringing through the thin walls of my old home, trying to locate exactly where I was. Every day, I'd have upwards of 20 phone calls and 50 text messages. I finally called the police after he threatened I was too poor for a restraining order. The cop drew the line right there and took it as a direct threat to my well-being. When I got home that day, I noticed cigarette ash all over my porch and a hole burn into my patio chair. Soon after, I found a window in the basement forced open with a surgical mask on the floor. I told my roommate and my neighbors what had been going on and gave a description of Shu, and to be on the lookout. Things quietened down after a few months. The phone calls from the call VPNs had finally stopped. I was in the car with my housemate earlier this week, and I mentioned a smudge of the garage door. He parks in front of the garage, not in it, when he told me, yeah, I think a homeless guy was squatting in there for a while. Probably weeks, I found a bunch of clothes in there, and then they disappeared a couple of weeks ago. My heart dropped into my stomach. I noticed tracks in the snow, too big for my housemates to have left, but thought, no way, couldn't be. I was shoveling snow all through the night for my neighbors all winter, and he was literally within arm's reach of me, able to see directly into the windows of my house. And yes, I scolded my housemate. I get that he's a guy, and doesn't really get it when a woman says he's dangerous, Call the cops if anything weird happens around the house. But come on, man. Shoo. I know you're still around. Let's not meet. For your sake. I've just recently moved into a decently sized two-bedroom house with a full basement where a lot of my family's not so important belongings are still stored in boxes to be sorted through. 
Our house resides in a quiet neighborhood, but our elderly neighbors have advised us on some sketchy figures wandering about late at night. As there's a section of the neighborhood two or so blocks away that houses those who have no place to go. Fast forward to maybe two weeks ago. I had gone down to the basement to sift through my items and had noticed that a few random things on our tables, toolkit, binders, family photos, etc. had been opened and strewn about carelessly. Thinking another family member was sorting as well, I picked them up and went about my task. Over the following week, I would hear strange banging coming from the basement. Sort of like our washing machine lid being shut. Now I'll admit I'm skittish, and my mind sometimes jumps to the worst possible outcome. So I became worried. At the time, I was the only person home, so I grabbed my pepper spray and went to check. Stupidly, might I add. Our basement has two full rooms, plus two adjoining smaller rooms. One of which has a door that I myself have never opened. It is also barred by a beam of some sort, but the door stands slightly ajar. I assume it's just some small storage area. Upon turning on all of the lights and cautiously looking around, I'd seen that a few more of our belongings and boxes that weren't unpacked yet had been opened and laid on the floor. What concerned me the most was that our basement door that leads outside to the side of our house was unlocked. That is not something my family would forget about. Further inspecting the basement proved that no one was inside, though I didn't pry open the barred door. Telling my father about this, he said that the noises were probably the heater popping, and perhaps he forgot to lock the side door after taking the trash out. I'm not so convinced on this theory, but I really hope I'm not correct in thinking that someone may have found the way into our home and has been scavenging through our basement. As of writing this, nothing has happened, but hearing people walk on the streets shouting on some nights has made me uneasy. I make sure the doors are locked every night now, and on a free day, I'll have my dad open the barred basement door just to put my mind at rest. I was in a single room apartment dorm with a roommate. We lived on the second floor. We had bunk beds and I slept on the bottom bunk. Just to give a quick layout, when you walk into our room, you immediately face our tiny kitchen. An L shape taking up the left wall in the left corner. To your immediate right would be the foot end of our bunk bed against the wall. If you go forward and to the right, that's where our desks are at. Closets in the bathroom to the far right so when I'm laying in bed, I'm facing the kitchen. I have a clear view of the corner counter and our sink. Anyway, I used to sleep terribly and would wake up in the middle of the night. Multiple times a week. I usually just wake up in a daze and fall asleep after. This one particular night, I woke up to some soft sounds. I figured it was our neighbors in the next building or something. Because we always kept our kitchen window slightly open to let our room stay cool. Like I said, I woke up, and I opened my eyes just a little bit, and was about to grab my water when I saw some figures sitting on the kitchen counter. I didn't move or make a sound. I wasn't even that afraid. Just watching. I was in a half-asleep daze, just watching the person on my counter. It was a lanky guy, just sitting and looking at our cabinets. He wore dark clothes, maybe a grey sweater. He didn't move. And before I could process it, I fell back asleep. I told my roommate about it the next morning, and she thinks I saw a ghost, but I'm not sure. We locked our windows closed from then on, and just decided to buy a fan, and leave our bathroom window open instead. It was tiny, and one of those crank open ones. I've never experienced that since. When I was 10 years old, 
my parents sent me to summer camp in a village. There were around 30 kids, all between 10 and 13 years old, with six camp monitors, all in their 20s. We were staying in a relatively big house, which probably used to be a small boarding school or an orphanage of some sort. From the first week I arrived, I already started hearing stories about the attic and how the ghost of a kid who used to come to that summer camp haunted it. I don't remember the story very well, but the kids would say that the squeaking of the wood you could hear at night was caused by the ghost of the dead boy moving around in the attic. However, at that age, I already knew ghosts didn't exist, and the squeaking was probably from the wind, so I wasn't particularly scared by that story. One day, however, I was talking to another girl about the ghost from the attic, a female camp monitor who was also around, so we asked her what she thought of the story. She didn't want to answer at first, but when we kept insisting, she got unexpectedly upset. Don't talk about that stuff, seriously, it's not funny she said. She left looking annoyed, and another monitor went to go talk to her. Since I thought this was all pretty weird, I later went to ask the other monitor about why she'd gotten upset. He was the one I was closest to. At first, he didn't want to talk about it, but I insisted, because I could tell there was something he was hiding from me. Finally, he said, all right, all right, I'll tell you but you have to swear that you won't tell any of the other kids. I promise not to, and he went on to tell me the story. A couple of weeks before the camp started, the six monitors had been taken there to visit the house where we would be staying. They were shown around so that they would know where everything was and all that. Soon after the visit started, they heard the wood squeaking from upstairs. The girls in the group were a bit freaked out, but they all continued the visit. Later on, after visiting all the other rooms, they decided to go up to the attic. Here's where it gets weird. There were a bunch of covers on the floor, leftovers of food, and on the dusty floor, you could see human footprints. Basically, it looked like someone had been living there. I immediately regretted asking about it, and then had trouble sleeping for the rest of the camp. This really happened, and it's one of the most unnerving things. So it was the 4th of July, and my brother and I were setting off fireworks in the woods behind our house. We were passing back and forth, an aim and flame cigarette lighter, and lighting firecrackers, and other small fireworks. It was around 2 in the morning, 5th of July. I left to go get something to drink. I left my brother there lighting fireworks. I get back around 10 minutes later, and he asks me for the lighter. I told him I didn't have it, I left it with him, and he was actively lighting firecrackers as I left. He says, yeah, I know, but I just gave it to you a couple of minutes ago, where is it? I know my brother, this isn't something he'd lie about. We've talked about it many times over the years, and the story has never changed. The moon was bright that night, bright enough to see. He says he saw me, in my same outfit, same face, same hair and everything. Apparently, the doppelganger said nothing, went up, and put his hand out. My brother assumed he was wanting the lighter. He gave him the lighter, and whatever it was, walked away. Never said a word. These were privately owned woods by my family, far out in rural Texas. Nobody else was out there, and if they were, that doesn't explain how they looked exactly like me. We continued setting off firecrackers till around 4 in the morning, having to use a short cigarette lighter because the thing stole aim and flame. Pretty creepy. This past 4th of July, I was coming back from a friend's house, around 10.30 at night. I drive a 2019 Forerunner. They live out in the country, outside a small town in Arkansas. It's also along the Trail of Tears. 
I pull onto a two-lane highway, and as I'm leaving town, I'm following three other vehicles, and no vehicles following me. I'm driving along this flat and smooth two-way highway, listening to the radio, when I feel my vehicle shake just a little. Not like a vibration, or running over something, but just a shake, like someone pushed on it. I thought it was strange, but it didn't concern me too much. However, almost immediately after, I heard a knock on the back glass. Knock, knock, knock. Knock, knock. I started reasoning in my mind. Fireworks? No. It was a clear knock from on the glass. I was covered in chills and freaking out. I called my friend and just made him talk to me. When I got into my town, I pulled over into a well-lit gas station to check and see if I had hit anything even though it didn't feel like that. There were no signs of anything on the outside, so I went home and completely freaked out. I might have slept a bit that night. I hadn't thought more about it until seeing a story recently on here about something similar, and it made me wonder. My uncle used to live out close to where this happened to me, and I asked him if he ever experienced anything out there. He told me he once had two Doberman pincers and took them outside one night, and their hair immediately raised, and they went into full protection mode, and headed towards a pond. He grabbed a flashlight, and started following. They were barking, and headed down this little hill. When they came to a full stop, and stopped barking, they started backing up a little. He shined his light ahead, and didn't see anything, but could tell the dogs were afraid of something, so he decided to trust them, and head back to the house. Years ago, me, my family, and family friends would go camping at some cabins in Lake Placid, New York. Despite what happened that weekend, that campground holds very fond memories for me that I will cherish forever. The incident happened 4th of July weekend. My family was grilling, and me and my friends, children at the time, were running around and playing cops and robbers. While we played, the campground owner came over to my parents and offered to pay for some food. My parents being nice gave him some food and beer for free. Eventually, the owner overstayed his welcome and was asked to leave by my friend's dad. This angered him and he took his shirt off and tried to fight with him. We were not aware that he was an alcoholic and already drunk when he asked for food and beer. They eventually got him to leave and he came back, this time with a rifle. As me and my friends played, he walked around, drunkenly, trying to load a rifle. One of my friends, being an innocent kid, walked over to him and asked what he was doing. The owner said, I'm going to show your dad something. One of the adults saw this and rushed over. My friend's dad took the rifle from his hands and threw it across the parking lot, screaming at him that there were kids around. At this point, I knew something bad was happening and I rushed all my friends inside our cabin. At this point, my dad called the police, and he was recording this whole thing. The police eventually came and arrested him for the night. While the campground owner tried to claim he never had a rifle, while saying on video, give me my rifle. The police came back the next morning and let us file a temporary restraining order while we stayed the weekend. While this is an incident my family laughs at from time to time, I can't help but wonder what would have happened if you'd gotten that rifle loaded. So to the campground owner, let's not meet. I witnessed something late at night on the 4th of July that I feel I need to share. To give some context, I'm a weirdo and spend a lot of my time hiking. I've been dealing with serious emotional and mental distress, brought on by things which are out of my control. My way of coping and finding comfort is being a weirdo and tempting fate by going for late night hikes. Turns out, I made the right decision by going out to the countryside late that night 
to enjoy the view of the full moon, see the fireflies shine deep in the woods and across the fields. I parked my car at an unmarked pull-off next to the river, which is surrounded by dense forest and unforgiving swamps. I started on my way on foot at approximately 11.30 p.m. I may, or may have not, had a few white claws stuffed into my backpack. That's besides the point. After walking for about two and a half, mostly uneventful hours, I decided it was time to double back and go find my car. This is the part where things go from, I feel a bit better and more at ease, to oh holy shit, what have I stumbled onto? I began crossing the bridge to get to my car, when I hear footsteps on the asphalt, approaching from behind. My mood shifts to, make my day, I'm so ready to cut you, if you even think about attacking me. I whipped around, and see a man wearing all black, who was much closer than what it sounded like. We make eye contact. It was a full moon, so it was pretty easy to see at night. And this dude breaks into full sprint towards me, but then veers around me at the last minute. Maybe it was liquid courage or pure adrenaline, but I yelled out to the guy, Hey man, you good? Sup? And he replies, I gotta go get my wife. He swiftly veers around me and keeps running. I'm thinking to myself, okay, kind of weird, considering it's, you know, 2am and in the middle of nowhere. But I digress. He runs out of sight, and I keep walking to my car. I make it about 1.5 miles further when I hear a woman screaming, crying, and wailing. The kind that makes your hair stand up. The kind that tells you in your gut that something is seriously wrong. I stop and listen. Through her sobs, I hear her say, Please, I can't take it anymore. I don't want any more. Please don't. At this point, I wanted to throw up. Her screams were coming from the same path I had to take to get back to my car. I channeled the energy of the movie Tropic Thunder and went full Viet Cong. Dove into the bushes and stealthily made my way closer to see what the hell was going on and find the screaming woman. It didn't take long because I now see the same man that ran past me earlier and a second much larger man also dressed in black walking on the road coming back my direction. The larger man had the woman slung over his shoulder like she was a sack of potatoes. She wasn't screaming anymore but she was crying and completely incoherent. She looked like she was maybe 19 to 21 at most, blonde hair, and she was very small. I'd say 110 pounds at most. I popped out of the tree line and asked man number one, is that your wife? Is everything okay? And he says, yeah, she's fine. She just can't handle her drink. As he said this, both men continued walking past me. The woman is clearly not drunk, but appears to be drugged. She was trying to talk, but her speech was very slurred, and she could not even lift her arms or head to get out of this man's grasp. To the best of her ability, the woman keeps trying to say, please no, no, help. She was trying so hard to lift her head and to look at me and reach her arms out to me, and she was so weakened by whatever they had done to her, that she was incapable of even making out a single word. Something was seriously wrong, Something much more than alcohol. Not 15 minutes prior, I was able to hear her screaming actual words. And now, she appears barely conscious. I carry pepper gels, razor blades when I hike. However, I knew there was no way I could take on two men by trying my hand at some vigilante justice. I'm about 5 foot 6, 140 pounds, and definitely no match for two men twice my size. Self-preservation and survival mode kicks in for me and for my fellow woman, and I say to man number one, Oh yeah? Man, I've been there before. I'm sure she'll sleep it off and be fine. Please understand, I only said this to him as a means of playing dumb. Again, I am not equipped to take down two men. The woman tries to cry and plead more as they carry her away. And I was quite honestly terrified. That sight and the connection I felt between myself and the woman pleading for help is something I will never forget. 
Once they are about 20 feet behind me, I take a quick glance over my shoulder to see what is happening, because the slurred cries she was letting out were nauseating. I wanted to be sure they weren't harming her further. I see they've stopped in the road and are looking back at me. It took everything in me to be cool, act as though as I didn't notice them looking and couldn't care less what they were up to. Again, self-preservation. They begin walking further away from me then. I quicken my pace to go hide behind a sloped railroad track out of their view. I call 911. I describe to dispatch what I've just seen and that I believe the woman was being taken against her will and appeared to be drugged. The dispatcher on the line says, We've got two other calls earlier tonight. We'll go ahead and work on sending someone out. Great police work, my dudes. Keep in mind, this is one of those out in the boonies, and most people seem to think that sort of thing don't happen around here. Even though we have an extensive amount of cold cases of women and children here in this area. I'm only about a mile from my car now. Obviously the police didn't care about this woman's safety, but I was so disturbed by what I saw that I knew it was time to go find these guys, since it seemed no one else was going to. Side note, the amount of cigarettes I smoke in a day is roughly equivalent to the amount of toilet paper sold during this pandemic. I was huffing a cigarette, crying silently, praying for her safety, praying they wouldn't disappear with her to God knows where, to do God knows what. What I'm saying is, I ran like never before to get back to my car and track these men down before they could drop out of sight with her. I don't personally know this woman, but I'll be damned if I don't do everything I can to help her when she was clearly in danger and unable to help herself. I floored it to where I saw them last. Maybe 15 to 20 minutes had passed between the last time we crossed paths. And I got my car, and much to my relief, as I round the corner, I see multiple police units on scene up the road. I drove up closer just to be sure they found the right guys, and they did. They had the men up against their cruisers, with their hands up, and were being frisked. Paramedics were on scene. This poor woman was laying on the ground. As they were working to place her onto a stretcher, to get her to a hospital, I assume, the sense of relief I felt was unreal. Though probably not even a fraction of the relief this woman felt when police finally intervened. Dispatch actually called me back and advised they'd not sent officers previously as the situation was described to them as a noise disturbance. Not unusual for a holiday weekend, so I can't wholly blame them for not coming sooner, since they'd not received any calls specifically stating there was a woman screaming for help or being carried off caveman style against her will in the middle of nowhere in the wee hours of the night. Needless to say, I didn't sleep at all the rest of the night. I went home and sobbed all day, mostly out of the horror of what I saw, and the awful thought of what if I hadn't taken that walk, what if no one got her help, what if they would have grabbed me too. I'll close this with, to not be a bystander. If you see something, say something. All I can really say is that my goal in life is to treat others the way I hope to be treated. And that includes advocacy for others who cannot do so for themselves. Whatever the circumstances may be. Because I hope someone, some stranger, would do the same for me if I needed it. As I'm sure we could all say for ourselves. I'm not sure I could live with myself if I hadn't made the call to the police. I hope my story can be a reminder to trust your gut instinct when you know something is wrong, whatever it may be. When I was 11, my family and some extended family were shooting fireworks on the 4th of July. My mother, Stepdad, little brother and I lived about 15 minutes from our nearest town in northern Ohio. Visiting with us was my stepdad's brother, his wife, and their son. Anyways, it's night time and we spent quite a bit of money on fireworks this year. The adults are drinking some around a fire and shooting off fireworks. My mom was getting cold and asks me after a while to grab her a blanket from inside the house. 
None of the others heard her ask me this, I'm sure of it. The house is a stone's throw away, and the kitchen light was the only one on in the house. This is before cell phones, so I had to use the house lights to see where I was going. To get to her room, I had to go down to the end of her hallway, into the room, and the blanket was on the end of her bed. I was a little scared to go into the house by myself. I turned on the hallway light to start down the hall, and when I got to the room, I turned her overhead light on. It's one of the ceiling fan ones. I turned the light on when I entered her room, and the light bulb popped, which cut my neck just a little. It wasn't bleeding or anything crazy, but it scared the shit out of me. So I'm now using the light from the hallway to navigate in the room, and just as I make it to the side of her bed, I hear something crash into the wall, right beside my head. I thought someone was messing with me at first, but I was still scared shitless. I ended up turning on the bathroom light in the next room, to see better, but there's no one there. I look in both rooms, checking the closets, everywhere someone could have been. So I think maybe it was a bat. We have had one get in the house before, and had to chase it out. I'm looking around the room for what it could have been, and I reach under the edge of the bed, and it's one of the Christian Left Behind books. I think it was the first one in the series. What's even weirder is that a bookshelf she kept the books on was on the other side of her bedroom. I honestly have no explanation for it. When I ran back outside with her blanket, I asked if they were messing with me, and I could tell she had no idea what I was talking about. That house has given me the creeps ever since. I had one other weird experience there, and my brother claimed he had seen a ghost there before too. I know what happened that night, and it wasn't just me being young or my imagination. I'm a 21-year-old male. It was July 4th, 2019. I live in Kansas, in the USA. At the time, I worked as a corrections officer at a maximum security prison on the night shift. The cell house I was in charge of was a maximum general population, one man to a cell. This is where the worst of society were housed. Before work, I was doing the typical American 4th of July thing, grilling, blowing up fireworks, had a beer or two having a great time with my now wife and family. My wife kept telling me I needed to just call in sick and take the day without pay. I said no because we were a little behind on bills. I really wish I had listened to her now. As the night went on, it came time for us to leave my mom's and for me to go home and get ready for work. I took my wife home and dropped her off, got ready and left for work. My wife's car was broken down so she was stuck at home for the night. As I drove to work, which was about an hour drive away, I watched the fireworks going off all around. It was sad. I had never had to work on the 4th of July before. After I got to work and got all my equipment, I got into my cell house. Business as usual. Inmates were showered and locked up. I got my night cleaning crew out so they could clean the rest of the cell house and met up with my partner for the night in the officer's station to get our briefing from the last shift. Fast forward an hour into my shift. So it's now around 12.30 a.m. Another officer came into the cell house. So now there are three of us. This happened often on a night shift, as there was nothing to do except rounds every half hour or so. Out of nowhere, we hear an inmate laugh like a witch, like a cackle. That was strange, but nothing to be alarmed with. Illicit substances were a bad problem in that facility. Still is, as far as I know. Eventually, after a few more cackles, I decided to go see who was making that sound, in case they were high. I walked through and checked all 200 inmates. Nothing. There were a small few that were even awake, so I brushed it off and just went back to my office. My partner and the other officer were asking if there was anyone else that needed their cell searched. I couldn't think of anyone in particular I suspected of having anything. 
So I went and checked all the cells again to see if I could get a whiff of smoke or see something. As I was walking on the second story cell run, I found an inmate that was acting weird. He was in his bed facing the wall, talking. This was also common as there were a lot of inmates with minor mental health issues. I figured he was high because he turned and looked at me and told me to piss off. I was going to leave him alone, but the disrespect made me change my mind. The time is now 2.40 a.m., July 5th. I walk back to the office and tell the other two officers which cell he was in, and I wanted him searched. Cell 218. So how the cell house is laid out is there are 100 cells per level. From the officer's station, you can see the north side, first and second floor. But you can't see the south side unless you walk 50 feet over to it. Picture the movie Shawshank Redemption type cell house. Except instead of being able to look through and see cells across, you just see a wall. The cells are back to back. As the officers go in to pull him out for his cell search, I went to the ground floor and was watching from below. The reason why is that I wanted to get the inmate on the ground level and not the second floor. All that was there for protection from going over the edge was a handrail. I noticed the inmate was taking forever to get out of his cell. He came out in shorts and a do-rag, which is weird because he wasn't fully clothed, didn't even put sandals on, just shorts and a do-rag, yet took five minutes to get out. That made me nervous. The inmate was six foot tall, 250 pound muscle bound dude, definitely had size on us. So from the ground, I holler at him and tell him to come down to the ground and that he could use his phone or check his email or even commissary. He declined my offer, which never happens. I knew something was up. He was watching them search his cell from the control panel box. This was alarming. They were in his cell. I was on the ground. He could have easily ambushed them. He would have made it to them before I could get up the stairs. So to try to keep them safe, I went upstairs to the inmate. He was standing in the corner, against the handrails at the top of the stairs. He knew I was the officer in charge of that cell house, and he knew I was the one that saw him talking to himself. He asked me why I was having his cell searched. I lied. I said, It's nothing personal, man. I just have a quota to fill for cell searches in a night, and you were awake, so I chose you to have you searched. It'll just take a second. He was uneasy. He was pacing. Something wasn't right. Then I saw it. He had just turned right. And I saw in his do-rag, the Samsung logo, reflecting the cell house light. Shit. I knew there was going to be a problem as soon as I saw it. He had a cell phone. I called over the radio for two additional officers to come to me. The inmate didn't seem to notice I made the call. My supervisors responded, saying two of them were on their way. Side note, at this time, only segregation officers had protective vests. So out of the five of us that were now in there, only one had a vest. I was not that one. I'll change the officers' names for protection. But it was South, who had a vest, McCormick, Collins, Sheffield, and me. The time is now 12.58 a.m. As soon as South and McCormick got up to me, I told the inmate to turn around and cuff up. South and McCormick were on the inmate's right side. I was in front of him. Why? He angrily asked me. I refused to give him a reason at first. After a few minutes, I had enough. I told him, Look, man, I can see the cell phone in your do-rag. You know you're not supposed to have that. The inmate and gets a defeated look on his face, with fire in his eyes. His body relaxes, and he slowly reaches up to retrieve the phone. But does he pull out a phone? No. He pulls out a six-inch sharpened metal rod, with ripped fabric wrapped around the bottom as a handle. Everything froze for me. I knew I was going to die. Everything starts moving again. I now have an inmate twice my size, charging me, thrusting quickly and repeatedly towards me. Oh shit, was all I managed to yell. I immediately went into defensive mode, trying to grab his arm and disarm him. 
His wrist kept slipping. I couldn't keep hold of it, but at least I managed to block his attempts at my lower abdomen. Suddenly, he aimed high and went for my chest. I felt it make contact. I had just been stabbed in the right part of my chest. Spray him, I yelled at the top of my lungs. McCormick was already working on spraying the MK9 OC spray. For military readers, you know what I mean. For others, MK9 comes as a pressured spray bottle, about 20 fluid ounces. You can buy it at camping stores in the USA, otherwise known as bear spray. It's stuff that you spray into bear's eyes so you can get away. South had come up behind the inmate and grabbed him around his chest and pulled him backwards right as McCormick sprayed. I didn't realize it at the time, but the spray hit me, the inmate, and South, as well as everyone near us. I was able to turn and run. I ran around the stair railing, past the panel box, and out onto the run of cells on the second story. I ran past a few cells and turned around to see he wasn't chasing me, but South was wrestling him to the ground while gagging on the spray. As was I and McCormick, Sheffield, having heard the commotion, came running out of the cell, saw what was happening, and ran to help. The inmate grabbed South by the vest and tried to throw him over the end of the landing, but South dropped to his knees before he went over. I grabbed my shoulder mic and screamed into it. Level A response to Charlie 2 now. Dispatch said something back, but I didn't hear it. I started to charge back to help save South. Before I could get away from the cell I was in front of, Collins grabbed me from behind and told me not to go. Due to the layout of the runs, I didn't see, but Sheffield grabbed the inmate from behind and body slammed him on his face and began cuffing him. Sheffield got covered in OC as well, due to the inmate being covered in it. As soon as Collins let me go, I stood still and watched. Up the stairs came four more officers, the captain and a lieutenant. The lieutenant came and asked me what happened. I started to explain, but he cut me off after he saw blood coming out of my left arm. After taking me out of the cell house, he made me lift my shirt because he saw the blood. He examined all of my wounds. He had removed all my equipment and held paper towels to my arm. I was rushed to ER. I was able to grab my phone out of my rental car. I called my wife and told her what happened. She called my parents and siblings. Luckily, my injuries weren't too bad. I was stabbed four times, once in my left arm, just below the elbow. That was a through and through. Blade went in one side and out the other. Twice in the top of my left hand, and the one that hit my chest went in the skin and hit one of my ribs, keeping it out of my lungs. Out of 37 plunges, I think it's safe to say I'm lucky to be here, writing this story. I didn't sleep for two days following that event. I still have nightmares almost daily. I'm always paranoid. I openly carry now. After my attack, I was forced to resign for safety reasons. Everyone statewide that works in max security prisons now has vests. None of the people from there talk to me anymore. I feel abandoned. I have one guy from that facility that I still see. My sergeant, who wasn't there that night. Court is coming soon to add three more attempted murders on the guy. Turns out, he was a shot caller for the Crips gang. And to the bastard that stabbed me, I hope for your sake that we never meet again, aside from court. So I work in a prison in the UK. I always like to work nights, because you do seven days on, and then seven days off. Whilst on nights, I get locked into a wing with no keys. We have a sealed pouch with a cell key inside for emergencies. Like if someone's hurt themselves badly and I need to go help them. I'm in charge of looking after 200 plus prisoners. After a busy few hours on the landings, answering cell bells and doing my checks on people who are on watch, the wing starts to settle down and through the night I do multiple patrols. During these patrols, I've witnessed many bizarre things. Here are just a very small portion of things that have happened to me whilst on nights. Number one, one night I was on the threes landing, doing my checks. 
I heard a loud bang come from the ones outside the surfery. When I went to investigate, there was a broom on the floor. When I reviewed the CCTV footage, you can clearly see the broom slowly being lifted away from the wall that it was resting on and then quickly getting thrown to the ground. We have the footage burned off and most of the people at work have seen it. We usually show it to the new staff before they do their first night shift to freak them out. Number two, one night, we had someone overdose. He was located in cell 237. I was working the week after all this had happened and the cell was locked off for a police investigation and was completely empty. At about 3.30 in the morning, the cell bell for 237 was pressed. At first, I didn't even know that this cell belonged to the guy that had died the previous week. But as soon as I looked into the empty cell, I realized and just froze. It takes a lot to freak me out, but I didn't want to walk back on that part of the landing until roll count. Number three. These are some more minor, but still equally as creepy things that happened just last week. That prompted me to share this. While walking the threes landing, one of the showers on the twos turned on by itself. The only way to turn it on is to press a button on the wall inside the shower. I went to investigate and the showers were locked and lights inside turned off. This was about 2.30 a.m. Approximately 30 minutes later, I was walking down the twos landing and the office door slammed shut. I checked the landings for open windows and they were all shut. Again, every time I hear a noise, I always investigate and love anything creepy, but this sent shivers down my spine. I live in the UK. I'm not an overly superstitious or spiritual person, but there have been three occasions in my life where I have felt what I can only describe as pure dread. The most unsettling instance happened a few years ago when I visited Shrewsbury Prison, which was decommissioned in 2013 and opened to the public as a tourist attraction. The then current buildings were built in 1868, but there has been a prison there since 1793. Visitors are able to explore the prison via guided tour or on their own. I decided not to take the guided tour as I prefer to explore places at leisure. The layout was spread across a main building and a smaller gatehouse. At the time, I had no idea about the history of each area or what each part was used for. In honesty, I was just wandering around. In part of the prison, I can't exactly remember where, I came across a corridor with no real defining features, just similar to most of the other corridors. As I looked down the corridor, I had a sudden strange feeling of what I can only describe as impending doom. A voice inside me said, stop, don't go any further. I stopped dead in my tracks. I suddenly felt cold dread wash over me, so intense that I had to get out of there. But at first, I couldn't move. I had chills. I wanted to shout out, but no sound would come out. I do not remember how I got out, but I found myself back at the exit. As I left, the guy on the admissions desk asked if I enjoyed the visit. I mentioned that I had to leave, as I'd had this inexplicable terrible feeling. He described part of the prison and asked if that is where I was referring to. It was. There were various signs up for reference. I asked him why. He then said, You're not the first to have a bad feeling there. That's the execution wing, and is where they used to perform the executions. I was chilled by this. I had no idea that that was what I was looking at, but I felt enough fear and despair to have to leave before finishing my visit. It turned out that 58 men and two women were hanged there between at the time the new buildings were built and the end of capital punishment in the UK. I'm sitting in my car in the parking lot of the prison my husband and I work at. He works an hour later than I do, and today I decided to wait instead of coming back. The temperature has dropped quite a few degrees in the minutes I've been sitting out here, 
The sky has darkened and the wind has picked up. I go back to scrolling on my phone when I hear the sound of running footsteps on the gravel. I sit up and look around the car in mirrors and see nothing and the noise stops. There are some cars parked around me, but for the most part, the lot is empty. I hear it again and it sounds as if the shoes skid as the person runs around. I then, very slightly, hear the sound of children, but only for a moment. I thoroughly check my area and there is no one, and they always stop when I begin to look. These steps are quick and clumpy, like those of children, and this facility at the time did used to be where mentally ill children were housed. In fact, I'm sitting in front of the condemned infirmary right this very moment. I started working at a prison about three months ago as a correctional officer. I work nights, the 6pm to 6am shift, and I work utility, which means that I do not have a permanent post yet. I work in whichever cell house they need me in. Now I've gotten settled into the routine, it has given me more time to notice little things I might not have had the time to notice before. The past few nights, I have been seeing things I cannot explain rationally. Three days ago, in the early morning hours, around four o'clock in the morning, I begin to see blackish wisps of movement in front of the cell runs in L cell house. Not in my peripheral vision, but straight on. It went on for a good five minutes or so, too fast to have been smoke, and not all the same direction. This cell house was built with no air conditioning, and the fans were not on at the time. The following night, same thing. I was beginning to lean towards a haunting, but it was still just wisps and glimpse of movement. This morning, around 4.20am, in D cell house, I started noticing movement in the background, as I was sitting in front of the computer, so I paused my work just to watch. Then I saw what looked like a silhouette of a crouched human figure glide in front of a cell door and then disappear. This is the first time I have ever glimpsed what could have been called an apparition of any kind. It wasn't scary, it was fascinating. I don't know if it's connected to the deaths we had in the past few months or not. I hope that if it is lost souls, that they will find the way. I can't think of a more pathetic way to spend eternity than to be tied to the prison you died in. For the last 10 years, I've been employed by the Department of Corrections as a correctional officer, sergeant, and then lieutenant. Over those years, I've encountered quite a few things, ranging from relatively mundane to downright unsettling. So here it goes, I suppose. Now I'm far from a brilliant writer, so apologies ahead of time, but was repurposed to be a work camp, and then eventually a correctional facility. For context, this place used to not have a fence when it first started, according to some of the older officers I work with. I never bothered to look into this place's background until some of the stranger things started happening. Trust me, I know it sounds cliche, but the more I researched, the more I discovered that a fair amount of old hospitals were repurposed into prisons. My first encounter with strange happenings came some years ago when I was still a fresh-faced officer. The facility has two different parts. One side has a higher level security setup, while the main side houses our lower level offenders. At the time, I worked at the higher level side with the level 2 offenders. For the most part, they behaved pretty well, except for a few times here and there. But that's not important. What is important is that their cells had thick metal doors that locked whenever they closed. These doors could be opened via a mechanism that would unlock the doors all at once or individually with a normal lock. I was walking the halls, checking in through windows, making sure doors were secured. Pretty much anything to get me through the night. For those that work nights, I'm sure I don't have to explain that some nights can be dreadfully boring. 
While performing my rounds, I turned the corner to head back to my office when I heard the loudest slam from where I had just come from. I turned back around, and to my surprise, all of the doors had somehow unlocked themselves and flung wide open. Needless to say, all of the offenders were freaked out once they realized what happened, as was I. After ushering them back inside their rooms and giving another check, I went back to my office, almost expecting it to happen again, and I phoned my sergeant. I asked what the cause could have been, and he just laughed. Now a bit of backstory on this guy. He was the sergeant for apparently forever. According to some of the stories I've heard, one of those old grizzled types, just jaded enough to keep the job, but not enough to become fully disillusioned, if that makes any sense. He was a good guy overall. He had an older technique of dealing with some of the offenders, but I guess that came with the territory. I trusted him well enough. However, when he said, Oh, that's just Ben acting up. I was skeptical. Who's Ben? One of the old TB patients. Huh? Yeah. This wing used to be part of the tuberculosis clinic, back when the place was a hospital. So the ghost of some TB patient opened all the doors at once? Yeah, Ben. He's harmless. Just annoying sometimes. Right. So needless to say, I asked around about this elusive Ben character. And sure enough, some of the other officers corroborated the story. Sometimes he'd tap underneath the floors from the basement, open and shut the windows, the whole nine yards. Obviously my instinct was to try to research the patients, but I guess due to the age, they didn't keep good records. Either that, or just simple ineptitude. With me being unable to research it, I chalked it up to superstition and moved on. Small things happened here and there as the months went on. I would do a round, come back to my office, and my cup would be in a different spot than where I left it. Or someone would knock on my office door, but when I checked it out, there wouldn't be anyone there. Now, normally I'm a pretty skeptical person and would chalk those occurrences up to the long shifts or other officers pulling pranks. Even though my dorm had doors that would lock, and I can definitely hear when those big damp doors would close, but as more things happened, the less sure of myself I became. Eventually, I got promoted to sergeant. With that came more pay and more responsibilities. One of those included doing regular basement checks. Now I dreaded this, not because of the creepy factor, I could handle that but because the basements are just slightly taller than the cells in most places due to the piping and electricals. Being a tall person, I hated doing basement checks, but since they were part of my responsibilities, I didn't complain too much. My knees, however, did. Surely enough, while doing one of these checks in the facility's medical building, I got another unsettling encounter. The basement of the medical building must have been an old morgue, since one of the rooms as that big metal wall with the slots for, well, bodies I'm guessing. In the darkness, I tend to glance through that room as quickly as possible. Well, unfortunately for me, I noticed that one of those doors to the slots was open. To be honest, I was more irritated than scared, because now I had to do a more thorough search of the basement. I radioed the situation into my lieutenant and let them know that I was going to be doing a detailed search after cautiously entering the room, I found the light switch and went to work. Naturally, I found nothing out of the ordinary. I closed the door to the slot, gave the place one last sweep, and headed topside to ask the medical staff some questions. General stuff, did anyone go down there, etc. No one had been down there in a bit, since most of the basements are used for storage. And as convenient as a morgue's body wall is for storage, it wouldn't be the best idea to utilize it. Still, I couldn't shake that creepy feeling of being watched, even before I found that slot open. The next big event to happen came in the dead of night of one of the more boring shifts. Mind you, this was back on the higher level part of the campus, though by this point we had lost most of our higher level offenders, so it's pretty quiet over there. After talking to the officer responsible for that dorm, I made my way outside to the sally port an entrance essentially, 
to pick up some items. I shot the shit with the officer there for a bit and made my way back to the dorm to resume a bit of paperwork and time killing. On the dorm, there are three wings, so the building essentially looks like a T. Only all legs are equal size, and each wing has two floors. Ever since most of the offenders were released or moved, only one floor of one wing has been utilized. I tell you all of this because when I glanced upstairs into one of the windows, I saw what appeared to be a silhouette of something vaguely human. It was unmoving, didn't shift or disappear as I kept my eyes on it while approaching the door to the dorm. I radioed the officer and asked what his location was. I'm in the day room, Sergeant. Downstairs? Downstairs. Now, keep in mind, the wing I saw the silhouette was also entirely inactive and being used for storing old bunks, mattresses, and other items. Also, there are doors that lead to the second floor of each wing, and only sergeants and above have access to the keys that unlock them. This entire time, I still had eyes on the thing, or person, so I talked to the officer again. Meet me at your hallway door, please. On my way. Eventually, he made his way to the door and we talked. I looked towards him to ask if he saw what I saw, and of course as soon as I looked back, the thing is gone. I felt like I was in a cliche horror movie at that point. I was expecting heavy breathing in my radio next, or some bullshit like that. So, once again, being that I saw something suspect, I had to be the dumbass to go check it out. I made my way upstairs, unlocked the door, and checked the place out. Thankfully, the lights are almost always on up here, so I didn't have to deal with the darkness like in the basement. As soon as I entered upstairs, the hair on the back of my neck stood up, like I was being watched. I got this horribly uncomfortable feeling of not being welcome, like I had just entered a bear's turf. This entire time, I was checking the place out. I couldn't shake that feeling. Eventually, I found the room where I saw the silhouette, and wouldn't you know it, there wasn't an item in the room. No coat rack with a big jacket to make it look like a person. No lamp with a hat on it. Nothing. After checking the doors and windows, I promptly got out of there and met up with the officer again and let him know what I saw. He was understanding, but seemed a bit skeptical, since he was a newer guy. Can't say I blame him, to be honest. There are several other smaller things that have happened as well. I guess I've been here long enough to experience a few different types of bullshittery. More silhouettes in the windows of abandoned buildings old storage buildings that light up all at once at night and then flicker on and off throughout the night. With that one, I told my lieutenant that my ass wasn't going in there alone and not at one in the morning. Objects moving on their own, even in our security footage. Hell, I've even spoken to several offenders who told me they hear voices at night in their rooms and others that refuse to sleep in certain rooms at night. If you work in a place where you have access to security cameras and are bored, definitely check those things out. I've seen chairs scoot around on their own. The hair of the offenders move on its own, balls rolling on their own, and a few other things. Sadly, I can't show you the guy's footage, since there is no legal way for me to get footage outside the gate, and I'm not about to lose my job for something that may just be easily explained. Besides, being a lieutenant now, I mostly get to experience stuff like that through cameras or the stories that my officers tell me when I make my rounds. As I said before, I hate going into the basements of various buildings for security checks. Two of our main buildings have basements that must have been used to house patients back when it was a medical facility because the place is set up much like the hallways on the first and second floors. When you think of where I work, don't think of one big cell block. Think more of a college dorm style of housing. At least on the main campus. I've taken my fair share of peeks around the basements. Especially in the rooms and little cubbies that the place has. And the creepiest things I've encountered are the following. Number one. There is an old wooden door on one part of the basement. And as the phrase, run away, scrawled into the wood. Now, obviously when I first saw it. I was a little freaked out, but since the words were on my side of the door, 
I quickly figured it must have been a previous officer or the staff member that did it. The maintenance staff run through the basement all the time. Hell, it could have even been one of the offenders. Since before the pandemic, they used to work with the maintenance staff, not really paranormal or anything, but a neat little thing I wanted to add, I guess. Number two, in several of the old rooms, I've seen actual chains and places in the stonework where manacles once resided. When I first heard about it from my sergeant at the time, I obviously brushed it off as some workplace bullshit that someone tells you to freak you out. Gotta get through night somehow, right? But surely enough, once I saw it, the realization happened. Yeah, this place used to be a medical facility. God only knows what kind of crazy and human stuff went down here. And number three, the tunnel network. I wish I was joking. This place has a full-on tunnel network that connects most of the buildings. Now this is one of those where I don't do too much poking around with. Mostly because, I mean, tunnels. Honestly, I've yet to explore them fully, but I have found some dead ends. It's weird as hell to turn a corner, walk a little bit, and then just have the tunnel stop all of a sudden. I'm guessing they had plans for expansion or something at one point. Or maybe even old buildings that got destroyed over time. When I asked the veterans about the tunnels, I got this. So why does this place have an entire tunnel system? That's how they transported bodies, so that other patients wouldn't see them. So what? All the buildings are connected? To the morgue, yeah. Screw that. Foolishly, it was around this time I finally decided to do some deep digging of this place. Now in my first part, I said the place was a hospital, then a work camp, and a correctional facility. But unbeknownst to me, this place had been an asylum to begin with. Once I learned that, obviously that little spark of excitement and muted fear entered my head. Like I said before, I'm a skeptic, always have been, but when you learn that the old buildings you walk through regularly were part of an asylum and had a TB wing, well, the horror movie buff inside me was practically giddy. One of the strangest things I've had happen to me involves me doing what 90% of my time was spent doing at night, walking around old buildings and checking doors. I was assigned to the administration building that night, and after the place settled down, I decided to make my rounds of the place. Now, the building has a few places, a library, visitation rooms, classrooms, you name it. The main attraction, however, was the administration hall proper. This is where the warden's office resides, among several other higher-ups. At night, this place is pretty dead, since most of the admin folks work the 8-4 to four shifts. I was checking every door to make sure they weren't locked when I heard something further down the hall start to rattle me. For a visual, the hall is designed like a blocky, chubby U-shape, if that makes sense. The sound seemed like it was coming from the other leg of the U, whereas I was on the opposite leg. I turned the corner and made my way down after calling out to see if someone was there. No response, of course, but that's when every door in the hallway started to shake all at once, as if a horde of zombies got their cue to bust out into the hallway. I'm not ashamed to admit that I booked it the way I came and closed the door behind me. Having been an officer at the time, I let my sergeant know and once again was met with, yeah, that happens. Having been one of my earlier encounters, I obviously said, what do you mean that happens? How messed up is this place? Very. Leave it to me to find a career in a place where everyone is just numb to weird, unexplainable stuff. The last story I have is, to me, the creepiest one I have to offer. Door shaking and stuff moving, I can kind of explain away. But this one, well, I can't explain it away easily. Now I'm not a drinker, I don't smoke weed, never tripped on shrooms, or anything like that. The worst I do is smoke, and have a caffeine addiction. But whatever, I preface because I need you to know that I was of sound mind and body when I had my little interaction. One night, as per usual, once the offenders had gone to bed and the place was settled, I was doing rounds after browsing Reddit for a bit. Most nights, at the time, 
were spent browsing Reddit and doing security checks. Not a bad gig, right? When I saw some movement going upstairs, confused, I thought it was my sergeant or another higher up that came on to do their rounds. Figuring I'd break up the solitude, I went and searched for them, for some bullshitting about their night. I didn't hear boots going up the stairs, but I had a quiet sergeant at the time, so I just called out to them. Hello? Sergeant? No response. Cool. I turned to the stairs to head up, and at the top of the stairs is a door with a window in it. Well, I saw what looked like a white sheet or something that moved away from the door. Weird. Laundry was closed, and even if it wasn't, there wasn't a setup for a washer dryer there anyway. I trotted up the stairs and opened the door and saw what looked like a woman in what looked to be one of those old white nightgowns facing away from me. Also weird, because the offenders are not issued granny clothes, especially not nightgowns. Okay, so this was some kind of prank. We had female officers, and still do, on shift, since the place I work at is all female anyway. So obviously, it was one of them having a laugh, after being spurred on by one of the sergeants. I rolled my eyes and called out, Alright, funny, haha, good shit. I've seen horror movies too. I know this trope. How the hell did you even get a nightgown through the gate anyway? Did she get a release for it from the warden? No response. She moved into the room. It was a bathroom. Another roll of my eyes, and I made my way towards the room. Stopping at the door, I announced my presence. Male staff have to announce before we enter the bathroom, for obvious reasons. And I walked in. I checked the place pretty thoroughly, and found, well, no one. The stall doors were open, shower curtains were pulled back, any hiding places were snuffed out. Okay, so I was clearly seeing stuff, right? Well, my sergeant thought so, since by the time I got back to my office, my phone was ringing. Hey sergeant, are you okay? Yeah, well, sort of. I saw you looking around all weird and shit when you left the bathroom. Yeah. Hey, did you see anybody enter the bathroom before I did? No. It's like 2am, dude. Great. So I'm losing my mind. And that's when I told him about what I saw. He didn't seem too surprised. But this was the same cat that was unsurprised about literally every other weird thing that's happened to me. I promise, I work with other people besides him. There isn't anything else to that story. No grand discovery of an infamous woman in white, or anything so romantic. Just some unanswered questions. Namely, what did I see? This happened about seven and a half years ago, when I was 13. My grandmother was in hospital with pneumonia. By the time my family got there, there was about 11 to 15 of us. Yeah, it's a lot, but five of the eight children were there, with their families. After a little while, they told us we needed to leave, so they could give us some shots. At the time, we didn't know there was a waiting room on the floor, so my uncle suggested we go down to the first floor, so we could sit in the ER waiting room. We had to go down on two separate elevators, since there were so many of us. Once we got down there, we saw two nurses hiding behind a door. When we asked what was wrong, they said nothing, you can still go in there. When we walked in, it was about 2pm on a Sunday. There was no one in there, and the lights were off. Yes, in retrospect, we should have just turned around and walked back out. But like all white people in horror movies, we didn't think anything of it. We met up with the rest of the family. That's when we noticed two other guys. The first man was sitting with his hands behind his back. The second one was standing behind him, holding his wrists together. The man sitting was staring daggers right at me. After about 10 minutes of sitting and staring, a third man in a hospital security uniform came up and asked if we saw anything. Visibly confused, we said no, and they told us we needed to leave. We went back up to the fourth floor 
camera and found the waiting room. It was right next to the psych ward, with a sign that said stay clear. There is a high chance of flight risks. Now, you might be thinking what's so scary about that story. A random guy was staring at a 13-year-old girl. Well, a little later, we found out what had happened. The man sitting with his hands restrained was a junkie, looking for a quick fix. He had walked in and was told that he couldn't get anything without a medical reason. So he pulled out a weapon and stabbed the woman at the reception in the neck. Why we were allowed into the room with this man while the hospital was supposedly in lockdown, I have no clue. I also have no clue where the police were during the whole situation. This story does have kind of a happy ending, for the woman at least. About two years ago, this incident was brought up at a family gathering. My cousin said that the woman did survive. She no longer works for the hospital and has a lot of difficulties resulting from her injury, but she was working as a secretary for a school. So, Junkie who stabbed a woman and kept staring at me. Let's not meet. When I was six years old, I loved the fires on candles because it fascinated me, which it still does. Around the time of Halloween, when we carved pumpkins and made lanterns out of them, I got a little bit too excited and couldn't wait for my mom to help me light the candle. So I sneaked away with one of the candles, and a dumb six-year-old me thought, hey, I'll show them how much of a grown-up I am. I could light this candle myself. Or so I thought. For a reason I don't know anymore, I lit the candle up behind our couch and got a little bit too close. Then it happened. My shirt started to burn, and I ran into the kitchen where the rest of my family was. My brothers both started to scream. Meanwhile, my mother ripped the burning shirt off of my body, all while my stepdad played World of Warcraft. A few hours after this, I still wasn't in the hospital because my stepdad thought it was a great reason to start a fight over this. Two weeks forward, I had been in the hospital for two weeks now and had multiple operations on me because apparently three plastic-like threads got burned into my skin and needed to be removed. I also had two skin grafts, one time for my butt, which didn't work, and one successful for my thigh. After this operation, I got introduced to my new roommate in my hospital room, a kid who was there for a reason I didn't know. Three weeks forward, I became friends pretty quickly with my new roommate. We played, watched TV, and did everything we could do while being in a hospital. Our families tried to visit us as much as possible, if work allowed it. Because my mom usually works overtime, she asked her boss if she could get some days off, which she thankfully agreed to. So in the sixth and last week of my hospital stay, my mom came to see me every day. And on the last day, she also got some sleep at night in the hospital bed with me and my roommate. But in this last night, I noticed a shadow on my bed. I got scared and screamed. My mom woke up immediately and turned the light on. And there he was, my roommate, and his hand was a knife, which he somehow managed to hide from the nurses. According to my mom, he whispered the whole time that he didn't want me to leave, and that he could make me his best friend if he wanted to. Turned out, he was 14 and had some kind of mental illness, and was there because he tried to hurt himself. So yeah, Former hospital roommate and friend, let's never meet again. When I was 16 years old, I decided to surprise my parents with a bouquet of flowers for Valentine's Day. We've always celebrated this as a family holiday, rather than a romantic one. I didn't have a car to drive to a florist, but my high school was within walking distance of a hospital, boasting a gift shop that sells floral arrangements. Between classes during the week of Valentine's Day, I set off for the hospital by my lonesome, cutting across campus to walk through a network of side roads populated with specialty doctor's offices that keep odd hours. The sort of buildings where traveling doctors mainly hold surgery consultations or perform small procedures a few times a month. The trip there passed without incident. 
As I was walking back through said deserted roads, with a vase of flowers in tow, I noticed an unkempt 1990s car close behind me. While my memory of this car is hazy, I am left with the impression that there were at least two men within whose faces I could not see. Initially, I assumed the driver was simply afraid of hitting me, the reason they weren't passing by. So I made a point of dramatically trudging further into the grassy shoulder of the road, demonstrating to them that they could safely drive ahead. They still refused to pass me by, continuing to creep along behind me at a slow pace, beginning to suspect that the driver was more interested in me than a destination, I began to walk faster. The car confirmed my suspicions by matching my speed. Despite the impracticality of my shoes and the threat of spilling water from my face, I commenced to run as fast as I possibly could. They hit the gas and matched my speed. I realized at this point that the car was following me, that there was no one in sight to notice, and that I needed to get away. I bolted into the first parking lot I saw. The car turned in after me. Despite there being only two or three cars in the spacious front parking lot and there being no other sign of activity at the office, this car did not stop to park in the numerous spaces available there. The driver, instead, opted to pursue me into the partially under-constructed back portion of the slot behind the office. It passed every available parking space to corner me against a pile of debris and rubble from the construction coming to a diagonal stop less than three feet away. Before anyone could emerge from the vehicle, I somehow managed to scale the small prominence of the rubble against my back, base in hand, and jump from its peak to land painfully on the other side, which fortunately was a plot of undeveloped land within sight of my high school campus. I took a quick peek back over my shoulder to see if they were still in pursuit, but the car had sped off after I reached the top of the rubble pile, and was now nowhere in sight. They had not parked in the lot at all. They had no business there. The driver was following me. I sprinted at top speed, and didn't stop until I was soaked with sweat in the dead of winter, and panting in the student lounge among my classmates, who didn't seem to give a damn when I told them, possibly because our hometown is supposedly a human trafficking capital, and the crime rate is outrageous. Although I am convinced that this was something more informal than human trafficking, as the dilapidated car suggested poverty, and I have read that human trafficking usually arises through grooming and not being snatched off the streets. In retrospect, I should have told an adult, alerted campus security, and called the non-emergency line of the local police station. But I was young, foolish, insecure, and afraid of getting into trouble for leaving campus when I didn't have a signed permission form permitting me to do so. I kept trying to convince myself that I had misread the situation or was overreacting. I don't know what I would have even told the police had I called them as I was entirely ignorant on the subject of cars and couldn't have identified the make of it had I been asked to. And I couldn't see the faces of the occupants. I was also worried that my parents would restrict my already extremely limited freedoms if they knew I had been in any danger. I feel horrible for having never told anyone and earnestly hope that my secrecy hasn't led to someone being hurt or killed. I believe the only missing people aside from runaway children or elderly adults with dementia in this city right now though are men, aside from one woman a few decades ago. Whoever followed and try to kidnap a 16-year-old girl with flowers at a doctor's office just before Valentine's Day of 2016. Let's not meet. This time last year, I admitted to a psychiatrist that I wanted to take my own life and was going to jump in front of a train, so he admitted me to a hospital. This is where I met Bradley, who was sitting rolling cigarettes as I was waiting for my room to be cleared. I asked him how long he'd been in hospital. He said five months, and I gulped. Five months in the loony bin. But he seemed normal, calm, content. Maybe that would be me, because right now I was a wreck, shaking on the verge of tears. My own mind 
had turned against me, screaming at me that I was weak and pathetic. Seeing him gave me a glimmer of hope, a lit match on an ocean of darkness to guide me out of this hell. He gave me some advice, stay out of my room, socialize, do the groups. He told me he was putting on a pub quiz in the main lounge and that I was welcome to come. I said I would. Bradley was nice and we got on well. We watched NCIS together and he always loved the art I drew in art therapy. He showed me his car tricks, we watched films together, and we smoked together. After a week of bonding, we were watching Hacksaw Ridge. He reached his hand over to mine, and I held it. After a moment of hesitance, he kissed my forehead and told me he loved me. I believed him, but I was scared. I started crying on his shoulder, his blue fleece jacket soaking up my tears. I hadn't felt loved in ages. I hadn't had anyone tell me they loved me in even longer. We started secretly going out, as he warned me it was against the rules of the hospital. I was so excited, almost 19 years without a boyfriend, yet here I was. I had found true happiness in a place of brokenness. Someone who loved me and understood and accepted me even though I hated myself so deeply. Then little lies started so subtly. He told me he had no visitors, then they arrived. He told me he managed a restaurant full time, yet another nurse told him he was to collect his job seeker's allowance one morning. He told us during group therapy that he had a three year old son when another nurse reassured me he had no children. Then one day he spent extremely moody and withdrawn, kicking and punching the walls over his dead dad. That was the only thing that came out of his mouth that was ever confirmed to be true. Then after a week of being together, he was sent to a different hospital in the middle of the night while I slept. He was ripped away from me. I went hysterical. I was in floods of tears and tearing my hair out. Till another patient gave me his number, writing it on the back of the King of Hearts drawing I'd done for him. I'd sent him a text saying I loved him. At exactly midnight that night, I got a call from him. He told me how shit his new hospital was, that they were only allowed out for cigarettes every hour on the hour, and that he'd been denied a last cigarette before bed. We continued to speak on the phone, and in each phone call, with a sweet, I love you, he continued to tell little lies, telling me he got severe food poisoning from the hospital food, and had lost half a stone in half a day from vomiting. He also told me he hugged another girl, almost as if he was trying to encode jealousy from me, but I trusted him. He got discharged before me, and that's where things took another turn for the worse. In between, the lies of owning a Land Rover, a Range Rover, a Bentley, a Rolls Royce, and a company van for his as of yet unclear job. Take your pick between security guard, songwriter, bodyguard, floor fitter, hitman, chef, assistant manager at a Domino's Pizza. The list goes on. And buying a Lamborghini for his 16 year old sister's first car. He began to tell disturbing lies that his ex and the mother of his up to five children, depending on the day, was a severe alcoholic who used to beat him. He would break down to me on the phone, saying he had flashbacks when he dropped a glass and heard it smash, and told me he was off to do bodyguard work for Ed Sheeran in Manchester when he was in Australia at the time and that he had to rent a hotel room for it. Only after the fact did he tell me that he shared the hotel room with another girl and even slept cuddling together, but nothing happened. At this point, I was so used to him lying that I felt nothing. If anything, I found it sweet that he was trying to provoke jealousy. He seemed deeply insecure about being perceived as boring. He never had a dull day. He was chasing down people for money, collaborating with Ed Sheeran, teaching Gordon Ramsay a new recipe, partying with Little Mix, or getting high off his olanzapine. I got discharged around a month after he did. We lived miles away, him near the coast, and me near the city. I always told him he was welcome round, but there was always an excuse as to why he couldn't come round. In the six months we dated, he never once saw me. And then one night, I call him up, and I ask him how he is. He replies in a ragged, breathless grunt. No. I ask him what's up concern ringing in my voice. I ask him if he's called an ambulance. He said they'd be four hours away. 
I found that odd. I'd never heard an ambulance crew once say how long they'd be. I tell him to tie a tourniquet above the wound. He says he can't be bothered. I tell him to raise his arm above his head. Same response. He hangs up, saying his hand has gone blue and numb. I found that odd. If that was the cause, he would have severed an artery, and his life would be gone within seconds. Still concerned for his safety, I call him back. No answer. Over the next hour, well into the early hours of the morning, I was crying and shaking in terror, my heart in my mouth, trying to get a hold of him. Eventually someone answered, not Bradley, but someone who identified themselves as a police officer. They said they had Bradley in the other room and were speaking to him to calm him down and take him into hospital. I said thank you to the officer more times than I could count, in shocked relief as I bawled over the phone. I went to sleep happy that my baby was safe. Then when I woke up, doubts began to creep in. No police officer would give information to someone over the phone. Definitely not to some random girlfriend. I asked a friend who asked a high up police officer they knew, who told me the whole story was complete bullshit. I always wondered why he faked taking his life to me. Was it to listen to me cry, proving my love in the sickest way possible? I was scared to confront him. After all, he was vulnerable like me. And he loved me. I was never going to find anyone else who loved me, so I might as well get used to constant deception and manipulation. I was utterly blinded by love. He called me up one night as per usual, this time doing his bouncer shift. He told me he'd seen a really fit girl, and when he died deed her, she was born in 2004. He asked me how old that would make her. I said that would make her 14. He was 21, I was 19. He went off about how fit she was. I again reminded him she was underage, and that it would be illegal. He ignored me, continuing to say, but you should see her. Then you'd understand. I started to get quite forceful. I was uncomfortable with the situation, which he just seemed to find funny. The entire exchange left me with a bad taste in my mouth. He was still, as another patient had put it, a lost boy living in a fantasy world. He acted like a kid, still playing make-believe, and in a way, it was quite charming if revealing a serious issue. Perhaps he viewed himself as a child still, and so thought his little crushes were cute. Later on, I came to find out from a patient called Henry that Bradley had routinely assaulted other female patients before me. This left me feel stupid for having fallen for his I love you lies. That was simply to make me believe that him taking advantage of my vulnerability was anything but predatory. Then, the final straw was when he called me up one morning, which was odd in itself, as we usually spoke at night. He called me up to say he'd been drinking and getting stoned all night which was again odd the way he describes the effects. I was so messed up I couldn't sleep, made me doubt he'd even tried weed or booze together, but I humored him after the call, joking with him in a text to save some for me. Again, trying to keep the hope alive that one day I could see him again and have him hug me and kiss me like he did when we were inpatient together. Then he called immediately after. I answered to hear a girl screaming down the phone. Why are you telling my uncle to save you weed that's mine, you stupid bitch? Why are you texting my uncle that you love him? It was a joke, I explained, taken aback by your explosive hostility. And I do love him, I explained. You're pathetic. He doesn't love you, she spat with pure venom on loudspeaker. I could hear Bradley laughing in the background, like the whole thing was hilarious. Each laugh was like a stab to the heart. He does. I was struggling to speak now choking back tears. My whole world was crumbling around me. My chest was growing tight. He doesn't. Why do you think that? She screamed to the sound of hysterical howls. Because he said so, I choked out. Well, he was probably drunk when he said that, she screamed. I'm always drunk, I heard him yell in the background. And why do you think you're gonna go out with him? What makes you think you're worthy of my uncle? She demanded to know. Her words sharp and pointed as a razor blade. Because he asked me out, and I said yes, I explained, growing scared at my public humiliation that Bradley seemed to relish in. Leave my uncle alone. 
If you try to contact him again, I'll do you in. She screamed before hanging up the phone. Leaving myself to cry to pieces, I called a mutual friend. A rich friend who Bradley used to buy his clothes. She was furious with him. She left him a scathing voicemail and cut ties with him. Then the floods of calls came in. I let them all go to voicemail. It must have been at least 20 texts begging me to call him. Crying myself into a state as I debated to hurt myself for real. I was humiliated, ashamed, spiraling, in shock, disgusted and dripping with self-hatred. I wish I could say I got better, but it's like an open wound. It scars over but it never fully goes away. I still miss him, my compulsive liar, attention-seeking, manipulative and borderline abusive, genuine psycho of a boyfriend. You can't get much crazier than hooking up in a locked, acute psychiatric ward with how enraged he would get, how out of control he would get, whether it was punching and kicking things, till he had to be physically restrained or screaming and swearing over the phone had his made up problems. I'm terrified to think of what would have happened had we met up outside the secure confines of the four hospital walls. So yeah, Bradley, let's never meet. This all begins when I'm at my friend's apartment, who lives in a really rough part of town. In a series of poor decisions that night, I decide to get belligerently drunk and take a few pills of god knows what. I know, I know. Safe to say, after a solid night of partying, around 4am, I was not in the right state of mind. My substance addled brain decides that instead of staying the night at my friend's apartment like I normally would, I wanted to take an Uber back to my own apartment. My friend's apartment had two separate entrances and exits to the building, one in the back which was an unlit parking lot of the building and one facing the street. They had two sets of keys for each door and I only had keys to the one in the back of the apartment. Since my Uber would obviously arrive at the street and the door in the front of the building locks itself behind you, I exited this way when the driver was soon to arrive. Looking back, standing outside the apartment, I realized I looked like the easiest target on the planet. I'm a small, petite female, in my early 20s. I can hardly stay upright. I'm using a street lamp to prop myself up. I'm not doing a good job at that either. The light was basically a beacon for any nearby predator saying, come and get me. I'm not paying attention to my surroundings at all in this state, despite the fact that there was literally a bullet hole in the front door I just came out of. Not good. I remember checking to see what car I was getting picked up in. I was only able to pick out the fact that it was a black sedan. Soon after stepping outside, a black sedan pulls up to the curb and starts rolling down the window. So I step forward. Before this man even spoke, I could feel something wrong. He had an expression like he was tearing me apart with just his eyes. After seeing that look, it gave me a new meaning to the word predator to describe a criminal, because I then knew what it felt like to be prey. He basically barks at me, I'm your Uber driver. This was a second red flag that somehow made its way into my brain. Normally, an Uber driver just rolls down the window and asks for your name. I think I just stared at him for a second, my brain slowly piecing together the situation I was potentially in and I ask him, what's my name? He immediately is enraged and starts screaming about how he doesn't have time for this and just get in the car. I don't think I've ever sobered up so fast in my life. I'm completely panicking. Obviously, this wasn't my Uber. Quickly checking the license plate, I immediately see it's not a match. Meanwhile, this guy is still screaming at me and I have absolutely no idea what to do. If I bolt in either direction, this guy could easily outrun me, or have a weapon. I'm also pretty sure at this point that if he's trying to nab a random girl on the street, he must have a weapon of some sort. I can't run back into the apartment door right behind me, since it locks behind you and I don't have the keys, nor the time to unlock it. Running towards the back door would do nothing as well, 
as he's idling right by the mouth of the driveway toward the back parking lot. And again, I would have to take the time to find the right keys and get in. If I screamed, I'm not exactly in the type of neighborhood where someone would try to be a vigilante, and I can still hear the music radiating from my friend's third floor apartment. I knew they wouldn't hear me. And also, it's 4am, and absolutely no one is around. People talk a lot about how they either sprint into action or freeze, but I felt incapable of doing either. It was the absolute worst feeling I've ever felt in my life. Everything in me wanted to run, but I felt that if I did, it would be the end of me. But if I kept standing there, staring in shock at this screaming man, the result would be the same. From when he started screaming at me to this point, I'm guessing only 20 seconds has passed by. Just as he's looking like he's getting ready to get out of the car, another black sedan pulls up right behind him. Checking the license plate as quickly as I could, I realize it's my actual Uber and make a full sprint to the car. Really only like six steps. And I throw myself in, screaming at my Uber driver, what's my name? The poor dude looks terrified, but responds with my name quickly. To which I reply, get me out of here, that man is trying to kidnap me. If I was in this Uber driver's position, I think I would be too shocked to react as quickly as he did, but my dude flew out of there, offered to call the cops for me, which I declined, and now regret, and then walked me to my front door of my apartment, ensuring I got inside safely. Truly an incredible human being. You can rest easy, knowing he's got the fattest tip my college student bank account would allow for, although he deserved much, much more. So, to the man who ruined my sense of security and caused countless anxiety attacks when out in public for months, let's not meet. A few of my friends and I were out in West Hollywood bar hopping, which we do often. It was just after last call, about 1.30 a.m., and we were heading back to the car when one of my friends saw one of those HIV testing vans and wanted to get tested. I told the three of them to go ahead, and I'd wait up for them. I wouldn't do this anywhere else, but I'm familiar with the area and feel safe there. The bar's open until 4 a.m., so on the weekends, it's not unusual for the streets to still be packed at 2 or 3 a.m., and it's what I think would be referred to formally as a gay district. So as a woman, I feel safe being left alone, because I'm not worried about encountering creepy men. After standing for a while, I heard my name being called. So I turned around and saw another friend of mine. I ran over and hugged him, and we chatted for a bit. He told me where he was going and asked me to meet up with him if we were still around. This only added to my sense of security, but nothing would have prepared me for what came next. We said our goodbyes and I went back to leaning on this newspaper stand that sat near the corner of the street. I'd been wearing heels all night and my feet were starting to hurt, so taking a bit of pressure off was a huge comfort. I watched the cars go by for a bit as they slowed down to a stop with the changing of the traffic light. A nice, new-looking grey car came to a stop and rolled the window down. The driver called out, Miss. I pointed at myself to question whether he was calling for me or not. Yeah, over here. I made my way over, thinking maybe he'd be asking for directions or something, and in the process, noticed he had an Uber sticker on the windshield. Now it made sense. He was looking for whoever requested a ride. I didn't call on Uber. He smiled and said, I know. At this point, I'm starting to get a little uncomfortable, but I stayed, figuring maybe he really did need directions or something. I've been watching you, and I really admire your figure. My girlfriend is looking for someone like you. Note, the fact that he'd been watching me, not. I just pulled up and happened to see you standing there. Also, what do you mean your girlfriend is looking for someone like me? What for? Thanks, I said. How would you like to become a model? I made a joke about being too fat and too short to model, 
to which he replied that I had a perfect figure. At this point, the light turned green and he asked me to move out of the way so he could pull his car out of the way of traffic. This was the perfect chance to get away. Had the alcohol not been impacting my sense of judgment. So, when he pulled up to the curb, I went over and continued our conversation. He asked if I was working and what I did for work and told me this would be a great chance to make a little more money. I told him no, I wasn't interested. He said, here, tell you what, you give me your number and I'll have my girl call you in a few days so you can think about it. He handed me his phone and I put in a number from a texting app that I use specifically for situations like this. As I was handing it back, he grabs my wrist and comments on my tattoo. Then, he asks if I came here alone, rubbing his thumb over my wrist slightly. This was kind of the last straw for me, and I wanted out immediately. No, my friends are right there. They'll be out any minute. I should get back. Why don't you sit and wait for them? Your feet must be hurting. We can listen to music. I'm thinking, hell to the no. Man, I'm not getting in your car. What the hell? But he still had a grip on my wrist, so I politely declined. I didn't want to upset him any, because I didn't know what he would have done. Just then, I saw my friends out of the corner of my eye. Thank God. I told him they were back and I had to go. He then let go of my wrist and pulled out a huge stack of money wrapped up in rubber bands. It must have been at least three to four inches thick. He waved it around a bit and said, just think about that offer, sweetheart, before speeding off. So, creepy, potentially fake Uber guy with a fat stack of cash. Let's not meet again. A close friend of mine was on a fall break from college and decided to go to an Odessa concert in downtown Chicago. We grew up in the suburbs, so going to Chicago to have fun was common for us. Anyways, we had a great time at the concert and decided to Uber home since we weren't close to the train station. My friend told me that Uber wasn't working for him at the moment, so I called the Uber, but this was my first time ever calling one and I accidentally called an Uber bull, not knowing what it was. My friend saw that and was like, eh, it doesn't really matter. So the driver picks us up from right outside the concert venue. There was a lot of intoxicated people around, as one could imagine post Odessa show, but we were pretty sober, as all we did was smoke some weed, which we were used to. We get in the car and everything is going normal but we didn't notice the direction the driver was taking as we were wrapped up in talking about the show. Turns out, the driver was going to the south side of Chicago, which we realized after some time by looking at maps, but our suburb was the exact opposite direction of this lengthy drive south. We decided to attribute this to the fact it was an Uber pool and shrugged it off until we picked up the next passenger. To be honest, this girl scared us I don't like to judge people, but she scared us just by looks and how she talked. Once the girl got in, we asked the driver where we were going first, to which he stopped answering. Next thing I know, my phone lit up and said the Uber trip was cancelled, and for this duration of the ride, Uber had no record of me being in the car. I asked the driver what the deal was, and he didn't answer. The girl and the driver 100% knew each other as they were calling each other nicknames. The girl was being weird and seemed to be doing some hand signals to him. Then we proceeded to drive further south to this neighborhood, the sketchiest neighborhood I've ever seen. I didn't realize a neighborhood like this even existed. Every house was completely wrecked. There were no street signs on most streets. Most street lights were out or flickering. Homeless people lying on the sidewalks and there were beat down warehouses and alleys. This was by far the scariest area I'd ever seen. No one who cared would hear a scream in the area. Once we started seeing all this, our hearts dropped because the driver would not respond to us. My friend then looks over to me and whispers, 
We need to get out of here. To which I replied, Dude, look where we are. And so we stayed in the car. Then we get driven down this alley, behind a warehouse, where the streets ended, and there were just fields beyond it. The driver is going down this alley, at two miles per hour, but keeps going. The girl and Uber driver were clearly discussing something serious, but we couldn't make it out, since they were mostly using signals. At that time, our hearts sank even more, and we both thought we weren't going to survive in this alley. Or at best, someone was going to get in this car and rob us. He stopped, the doors unlocked, and I was in complete shock with a pale face. When all of a sudden my friend says, Hey, I'm completely sober, and I'm about to call 911. I'm assuming the driver was waiting around the concert to pick up some wasted people to allow this to happen. But we were completely sober. My friend was serious. He had 911 dialed up on his phone. The Uber driver looks back at us in shock after he sees 911 dialed on his phone. My friend's about to push call. He looks at the girl. The girl is in shock too. She nods her head no. She says, what the hell, Ree? And gets out of the car. The driver then drives out of the neighborhood and onto the highway towards our suburb. All of a sudden, my Uber app gave me a notification saying we are now in a ride. All of a sudden, the driver starts talking to us again, but he wasn't giving any answers, just saying he's driving us home. We were asking, what the hell just happened, dude? And he just wouldn't answer stuff like that. He would answer about where we're going, but nothing about what just happened. We got home safely and reported the Uber driver for this ride because it was obviously messed up. We think that Uber driver was trying to wait for wasted people to call for a pool so we could get away with this, but realized we were too big of a risk when it came to do what they were planning. We've accepted that we were part of a mugging scheme and got lucky when we decided not to get drunk at the concert. We had anxiety for weeks after this, but we now know just how sketchy some areas can be and how to be more safe in Chicago by not calling an Uber pool outside of a concert or bar. It's so weird to me that people live this sketchy of lives and do this to people, but it was eye-opening. So, let's not meet Rye ever again, or any Uber pool for that matter. So a few years ago, I worked at a grocery store as the manager for the online shopping department. I didn't have a car at the time, and so I would take Ubers to work occasionally. The night before this incident, I was at a local brewery with my friends. I took an Uber home then. I thought the driver was kind of off, because of how inquisitive he was, but played it off as him just making small talk. The next morning, I requested an Uber, and it was the same guy. No big deal. It happens all the time here because I live in a small town. So I got in the car and this guy remembered everything about me, but again, played it off because I literally saw him like 12 hours before that. I was definitely getting creeped out though. So he started chatting again and he was telling me about how him and his wife were having problems. I thought it was weird as hell, but figured that maybe he just wanted to talk about it because that's my personality. Then he starts talking about how they used to ride four-wheelers together, amongst other things, and how he misses it. And I, stupidly, said I've always wanted to ride one. Are they fun? And he said, they're great. You should definitely ride sometime. I have a few. I got sketched out and was like, oh cool, I should see if my boyfriend would be down to ride sometime then. Finally we get to my work. He gave me an awkwardly long goodbye speech and thanked me for using Uber. About an hour later, my co-worker and I heard knocking on the door that leads to the pickup space. It was the Uber driver. I awkwardly opened the door, and the driver asked me to exchange numbers with him because he wanted to take me for a ride. Yikes. Luckily, my co-worker was like, Dude, I'm a boyfriend. What the hell, man? And we closed the door. Steve was an absolute champ. He didn't leave. We had to page my boss and then he called the cops because he wouldn't leave. 
He ran off when the cops showed up. It was super creepy. I contacted Uber, got a refund, and also got a pretty strong confirmation that he no longer works for the company. Me and my wife had recently moved into our first house, and we just had our first baby. To make some extra money, I had started driving for Uber a few times a week. Anyway, I got a hit and started driving to the pickup location, which turned out to be an extended stay American hotel. I've picked up people from these sorts of locations before, and some of them have been very unique individuals. I pulled up front. The notification was sent to his phone that I had arrived. I waited a minute or two at the front entrance, where I presumed he was going to be emerging from. The sun had only just started to set, so the visibility was pretty good. I noticed the bushes and foliage started to rustle next to the entrance. About ten foot from the side of the building, a man emerged. When I say emerged, I literally mean that he must have taken a running jump because he burst through the bush line and landed on two feet. He was around 40, slim built, and had a spring in his step, which was noticeable. He wasn't dirty or unkept in any way, so I just presumed he was in there having a smoke or something. He had awful teeth and his skin very pale. Either way, him emerging from the bushes so dramatically was strike one. He got in the car and we greeted each other. He was immediately very chatty and started telling me about all the aspects of his life, without me asking or getting a word in. He told me that he had just come back from a business trip, that he had been kicked out of his house, because he'd been away on business for so long. We were on his way to his house, so he could pick up a few things and head back. Delightful. He started asking me about myself, but between every new question, he would ask me again what my name was. To which I told him, over and over again. He was in the back seat, and I could feel him really close behind me, breathing heavily as I answered his question, in a guarded but friendly way. It sounds strange, but I'm sure he was sniffing me. When he started to twitch, it dawned on me that he was tweaking. Not terribly, but enough to know it was pretty noticeable, if you were aware of the signs. Strike two. We arrive at his house, and I pull up into the driveway. He says he won't be long, and that'll give me a good tip when I take him back to the hotel. He gets out. I leave the car on. Lo and behold, he doesn't seem to have a key. After trying the basement entryway, a few windows, and kicking the door multiple times, he storms up the outdoor staircase to the ground floor entrance. He starts aggressively, trying to force the door, whilst hurling a tryout of abuse at whoever he thought was responsible for his situation. A guy suddenly appears from around the side of the house, and he shouts that he told him to never show his face here again, and to give him his money. Within seconds, they are full-on fighting in front of my car. There's a large thud as the grappling duo land on the hood of my car and roll to the ground. I zone out for a second, thinking how the actual hell have I found myself in the situation. At this point, they are rolling around on the driveway, fighting in front of my car. The homeowner must have been winning, because suddenly, the man I picked up started screaming at the top of his lungs, Uber driver, help me. Uber driver, why won't you help me? Over and over, the look of exasperation I must have had on my face. How can this dude not know my name? He asked me at least 30 times. Strike three. I calmly put my car into reverse, and drove the hell out of there. I looked into my rearview mirror, and they were still brawling. I have no idea what had happened to that Uber passenger, or the homeowner, but I went straight home, thoroughly creeped out. I've been driving for Lyft ever since. I live in a college town, and when I was going to university, I used to take Ubers everywhere that I couldn't walk to. Not very cost effective, but a surefire way that I'd get to where I needed to be, without losing my parking spot or getting accosted. Anyway, 
The night of this particular incident, I had been at a friend's house, about five miles from my dorm. I called an Uber, as usual, and I was picked up by this guy in his mid-twenties. Followed standard safety procedures, asking his name, checking the license plate, asking what my name was, all clear. The guy is definitely an Uber driver, he even has a little light on the top of his car. I get in, and immediately, this guy begins conversation. I don't mind talking to my Uber drivers, I figure it's just polite. But this guy starts our drive by asking question after question. There was the standard, where are you from, and are you in college? Super normal, right? Then, how much do you weigh? This threw me off more than a lot, seeing as that definitely isn't a normal thing you ask a stranger. But the guy had a thick accent and seemed unfamiliar with the area. He was ignoring maps, taking weird turns here and there, but was ultimately heading in the direction of my dorm. I answer his question, following up with a sort of nervous chuckle and telling him that really wasn't a question that he should ask a lot of people. Just a joke, but still. But you are so beautiful, probably just the ideal weight for me. Alright, red alarm bells, grade A inappropriate. I should have said something snippy back, but all I could do was just sort of laugh. I responded with, eh, ideal weights fluctuate. Stupid, right? But I froze up, maybe it was just his culture or something. I turned the questions on him to sidetrack him from that weird ass comment, and it turns out this guy's from the Ukraine. He doesn't need any invitation to start talking about himself, and I lapse into the standard, uh-huh, and wows, to keep him on track. Honestly, this trick works really well when you straight up can't avoid someone who might be flirting with you. They get so caught up in themselves that they forget you're listening. However, this guy seemed to take me asking vague questions as me taking an interest in him. He starts staring at me through his rearview mirror, catching my eyes for uncomfortable amounts of time. He's still driving, but I notice that we're starting to take a super roundabout way to my dorm. Of course I'm nervous now. The roads are deserted. It's late as hell and I'm alone. But I try to brush it off as a culture thing. Maybe I got too chatty. Maybe it's my outfit, etc. I pick up my phone and pretend to text. And this guy takes the cue to pry further. He asked me, do you have a boyfriend? I replied, yep, we've been together a year. Then he asked, wow, I ever want to try the market out? You're so young. I responded to him by saying, nah, we're really happy. That's a shame. Really a shame, he replied. He's still trying to maintain eye contact, leaning towards the back seat. I hum or something in response, and to my joy, I see we're finally approaching my dorm. This guy super slowly creeps to a stop at the curb, and I belt out the standard, thanks for the ride. I'll rate you five stars, and go for the door handle. This guy hits the bottom lock, and I'm locked in. I whip my head around at him, and he's turned all the way around in his seat. Seat belt off, and grinning like he's just won the lottery. I'm freaked out. Um, your doors are still locked. He ignores me, still grinning, and asks bluntly for my phone number. I decline as politely as possible, even though I feel like knocking his lights out. No sale. He asks again, this time more forcefully, and adding, I would really love to get to know you better. I can meet you right here tomorrow, if you want. Once again I decline, reminding him that I have a boyfriend, and he most definitely would not like that. So you're not allowed to have friends? We can just be friends. Lots of girls around here have friends. At this point, I'm in full panic mode. What he said sounded innocent enough, but he was borderline cornering me into his back seat and was boring holes into me with his eyes. I was afraid he'd drive off with me if I said no again. I had no means of fighting on me. I'm tall, about 5 foot 11, but my limbs are like noodles. This dude had biceps like basketballs. There was no way I'd be able to fight him off. He asks for my phone number again, 
I don't decline, but blurt out, unlock your door. He starts to protest, but I repeat myself, pulling the door handle a couple of times. I raise my eyebrows at him, trying to give him my best, entitled bitch face. I said, unlock it. Finally, looking crestfallen, he turns back around, slowly puts his seatbelt on and unlocks the door. I bolt out of the car, slamming the door and breaking into a sprint, until I'm safely locked into my dorm. I'm freaked out for another hour or two, but I'm able to go to sleep. I woke up the next morning to a text from this guy, who told me I was the most beautiful woman he had ever met, and how he wished I hadn't left the car. I immediately block him and report his Uber. I haven't heard anything from the guy since. So, Ukrainian Uber driver, let's definitely never meet. So, two friends of mine and I went to Nashville to watch a football game a few weeks ago. We stayed at an Airbnb that we have never stayed at before, but it was a good deal and we all got our own bedroom. The first thing we noticed was a door in the middle of the hallway It was not a bedroom. It was a door to the basement. The walkway down was as creepy as one could imagine. It looked like something out of The Conjuring with stone walls and rickety stairs. My friends thought it was a little creepy, but I got an immediate feeling of uneasiness and discomfort. The hair on my arms stood straight up as my friends decided to go down into the basement and look around. The next thing we noticed was that the door would not close. There was no latch and no way to keep the door closed, so we decided to put a basket in front of the door to keep it shut. We went to the game and then out afterwards and got back to the house around 2.30 a.m. The door was closed, but the basket was pushed away from the door by about five feet. My friends didn't think much of it in their drunken state, but this really did not sit well with me. I begrudgingly went to my room to go to sleep, making sure to lock the door behind me. I woke up around 8 a.m. the next morning and heard the doorknob to my room slowly turning. The door being locked, it wouldn't open, and I figured it was my friends trying to get me up for breakfast. Then I hear a very distinctive shh come from the other side of the door. Not thinking it was anything other than my friends, I just went back to sleep. About an hour later, my friends got back from breakfast and I got up. I asked them why they tried to open my door this morning and why they were shushing people. They both looked at me confused and asked what I was talking about. They were very adamant that they did not try to open my door and that they did not shush anyone. I spent a year studying in Mexico recently, as you do on exchange. I tried to travel as much as I could. Between the semesters, there was a big break, and me and my buddy that I spent most of my time with during the exchange decided we go on a longer backpacking trip through Mexico together. We had a rough plan on where to go and what we wanted to see, but we hadn't even booked our flight back yet, and we weren't even sure where we would take it from. We wanted to keep it flexible. We had an amazing time, and a few days before our trip ended, we finally decided we would take our flights from a city that was close and had really cheap flights. But the city itself didn't really have anything to offer. Then, on Airbnb, we found a room, very close to the airport, in a house with a pool. So we thought we'd just treat ourselves to a relaxed pool day at the end of the trip. It turned out that the hosts were a family. The husband was Mexican, and the wife was from Europe, and could even speak our native language. So we arranged that we would take a bus to the airport, and that they would pick us up from there. When we finally arrived at the city, it was already dark, and the bus driver refused to drive us to the airport, since it was not directly on his route. So he just dropped us off on the highway. That was already a pretty bad situation to begin with, standing with our backpacks at the side of the road in the middle of nowhere in a not-so-safe city in Mexico. But I called the hosts and sent them our GPS location, and they say no problem, they will come get us. So the husband came to pick us up, and it was already a very uncomfortable situation, 
getting into the car with a stranger in the night, in the middle of nowhere. It also didn't help that the guy looked like Danny Trejo without a mustache. And as I tried to make small talk with him, he only gave monosyllabic answers or straight out ignored me. Well, he's not just a big talker, I thought, and hoped we would soon arrive. Looking back, I can see a million red flags, but for some reason, at that time, we just didn't see them. Either we were too tired, or to be honest, we didn't really have any other choice but to go along anyway. But yes, we arrive, and that should have immediately set alarms off. We were in the middle of nowhere. There were fields with sheep and goats around, and all of a sudden, a gravel road branches off from the paved road, and along that gravel road, there are about six huge mansions, all with two meter walls around them, topped with NATO fence, huge gates, and at least two gigantic guard dogs per house. When we entered the house, we were greeted by the wife, a bubbly, middle-aged woman that was very talkative, but still pleasant. She had actually cooked dinner for us, and we ate, while exchanging small talk. The husband just sat at the table, not saying a single word. After dinner, we more or less went directly to bed, because it had gotten late, and we were tired from the long day. The next morning, we saw the weather was not that good, so we decided to go into the town, and just see the few touristy things it had to offer, instead of spending it at the pool. When we came back, it was already dark, but we decided to jump in the pool anyways, to cool off because it was very hot and humid. The wife joined us, and at some point, my friend made the mistake to ask how they were able to afford such a house. It didn't really match the price range of what they were telling us that they were doing, and she deflected a bit and added that her husband was very handy. He had grown up in the streets and basically built the house himself. We realized it might not be the best topic and broke the conversation off. That was the last day of our trip, and we had a flight back home early the next morning. We still had some weed left that we had bought on the trip, and we thought it would be nice to smoke one out since it was our last night. But as this was a family home and they had kids around, we thought it would be better to speak to our hosts first if they would mind. So later in the evening, we asked the wife if it would be okay if we smoked out on the terrace, which for some reason she found quite amusing and started laughing. She shouted to her husband, who was lying on the couch watching TV. My love, the boys ask if it would be okay if they smoke some weed. What do you think? And he just laughed, but didn't give an answer. We looked at her with dumbfounded expressions, and she told us sure, just go ahead. So we went to the terrace and start smoking our joint. Later they joined us, and we had a chat, and this is where things got really messed up. For some reason, they start asking all sorts of questions about the weed, where we got it, how much it was, who we got it from, and how much we would have to pay for it back in Europe. They just seemed way too interested in the weed, and at one point, the wife just nonchalantly revealed to us, yes, we thought about doing that as a source of income, selling weed, but too many people die doing that, because the cartels don't like that. Actually, my husband used to make people go missing for doing that. I immediately felt sober, and as if he read my mind, her husband added, Yes, when I was about 16, I used to make a lot of people go missing, for the cartel, in exchange for money. And he said it in a tone, as if he just said he used to mow lawns when he was a teenager. I still thought I must have misunderstood, so I texted my friend, who was sitting across the table from me, trying not to make eye contact, because I knew we would freak each other out. He confirmed that I had indeed understood right. We discuss what we should do and agree that there's no immediate threat and that we should just stay. We don't have anywhere else to go anyways and it's already very late. But things got even crazier. We tried to keep our composure and not completely freak out while still making conversation with our hosts. A few minutes later though, the husband got up and went inside to get something and he came back with a kilogram of weed pressed into a brick. He proceeded to break bits off the brick and roll them into a joint that would probably have knocked out Snoop Dogg. It was about the size of my thumb, and I guess it had about two grams of weed in there. Of course, he offered the joints to us, but we politely declined, saying that we were already pretty stoned. He seemed a little offended, but fortunately, 
he bought our excuse, but it got even worse. A few minutes later, we hear a couple of loud bangs. The wife became a bit uneasy and asked, what was that? To which she calmly answered, nine millimeters, to confirm my suspicion that that was indeed shots. I would say it was around seven or something shots, fired pretty quickly after each other. The wife got nervous and asked if we should maybe go inside and asked him, what do you think they're shooting at? In the air? At cows? At people? But he just shrugged it off and we stayed outside. Again, a few minutes later, there were more shots. This time, even closer, the wife got even more upset and asked again, should we maybe go inside? What do you think they're shooting at? Should we go inside? And I think I will never forget when he answered in the calmest way imaginable. No, everything's okay. I don't hear any screams yet. I don't know why, but the way he just calmly said that freaked me out. And is still making my heart beat whenever I think about it. After that, we quickly excused ourselves and went to our room. When we could finally talk, and we both lost it and panicked. Just what were we supposed to do? We're locked in a house with a contract killer in the middle of absolutely nowhere, and people are shooting outside. We decided that it was probably best to stay, because we thought, well, we are his guests. He's not going to harm us, hopefully. And it's better to have walls and dogs in between us and the people shooting around. So we barricaded ourselves in the room and didn't sleep a second until morning. When we noped out of there and went to the airport, I was never so happy to be patted down at security my whole life. My husband and I got married during level 3 lockdown in New Zealand. We wanted to do something special the night of our wedding, so we got an Airbnb in a harbor near where we live. The place was the back of someone else's house and kind of in a forest. It was also pretty small, one room and a bathroom. We had just gotten married, so we were acting very in love that night, for lack of a better word. We also had the windows open because we believed that where we were was very remote. When we decided to go to sleep, my husband decided that since we were in New Zealand, there was no need to lock the door. And like an idiot, I went along with this. We go to sleep, and a few hours later, roughly 3am, there was a distinct loud knocking on the wall that our heads are laying against. There were about seven knocks, spaced out evenly to be exact. It was the kind of sound that, to me, was deliberately trying to wake us up. I shrieked, and then my husband looked out the window for movement. There wasn't any movement or sound after, just extremely still. What's also weird is that the Airbnb had motion-sensing lights on the opposite side of where the knocking came from. It was almost like whoever it was knew not to set off the lights. I know in my gut that this knock came from a person and not an animal or the wind. After a few hours of being terrified, we didn't hear anything else for the rest of the night. The next day, I asked the Airbnb host about it. They said they didn't know anything and were genuinely sorry. They even let us stick around past checkout to enjoy the view a little longer. To be honest, I genuinely don't think it was them. My experience happened in Malaysia back in March of 2018. To better understand the scenario from my perspective, I will paint a small picture of who I am. I am a strength athlete, trained in Muay Thai for a few years, proficient in self-defense, and served in the military as a commando for two years. With my background, I am a confident individual and not easily phased. Back to the trip. There were seven of us, five males and two females, booked air tickets to Malaysia for a short vacation, along with a rather affordable Airbnb condominium apartment that was huge enough to fit all of us. Upon reaching the apartment, we opened the door, and I was the first to enter. 
I would always do a quick recce around the new environment to make sure it was safe and have the layout in my mind, which was a military habit. As I walked towards the master bedroom, I froze. The room was dark as the lights were off and the curtains were fully closed. My instincts kicked in as I froze right outside the master bedroom door. I thought to myself, what the hell? I have never felt something like this before in my life. The unexplained sense of fear that even my trained mind and body is preventing me from taking another step. It was at that moment I felt something was off. As I stood there for the next five seconds, with various thoughts going through my mind, my friends caught up to me and they went right into the room. They barged right in, opened the curtains wide, which exposed the balcony right outside. As most of them were smokers, they could barely contain themselves after the plane ride and decided to puff a few at the open balcony. As seven of us stood there for a chat while enjoying the high-rise scenery, one of them pointed something out. A graveyard. A graveyard just a few kilometers away. That was clearly within sight. We looked at each other and soon realized why the Airbnb condominium apartment that was large enough to fit seven of us was such a good price. That was the end of my personal encounter, but the start of my friends. In case you're wondering, no, I did not choose the master bedroom. Someone else did. After the first night, one of the female friends looked a bit unwell. I asked the others what's up, thinking it could be her period. I went to her room to check up on her, to see if she needed anything. Turns out, she had a nasty nightmare in which she refused to share what it was about, and she woke up with a high fever. On the second day, one of the guys, Alex, had stomach discomfort. We assumed it was food poisoning from all the feasting being done when you're overseas. In the early afternoon, three of them decided to head out on foot to the nearest mall, while three of us decided to head down to the swimming pool. And of course, Alex opted to stay in the apartment so he wouldn't have any accidents in the pool. At around 4 p.m., when we finished our swim, we headed back to the apartment. I didn't bother to ring the doorbell, as I figured Alex might be sleeping or resting. As I inserted the key, unlocked the door, and turned the handle, I heard a loud slam in the apartment. I swung the door right open and was ready to engage, thinking there was an intruder, as it was a foreign country. Turns out, Alex was lying on the living room couch with a blanket over him, watching television, while the loud slam was actually the sound of the dining room chair that had fallen over. Upon analyzing the scenario, I realized Alex was clearly in shock. I asked him what happened. He said that the dining room chair had just tippled and fell by itself the moment I opened the door. Naturally, you would think Alex is screwing with you, but physically, it was impossible for him to push the chair over from the dining room, proceed to run over to the living room, lie down on the couch, and put a blanket over him while I swung the door open in a second. Not like it's a hidden camera prank show, and not to forget about his stomach discomfort. I chose to believe Alex as I grabbed the chair, held it up high, and slammed it back into position, and I aggressively told whatever was there to back off right now. The trip was over. A few days later, I met up with the guy who chose the master bedroom. I asked Ben if he had any weird encounters back in Malaysia, and not to my surprise, he did. While using his phone on the bed, facing up, he would often see shadows fly past the curtains. While he was going to the bathroom in the master bedroom toilet, he heard a knocking sound by the toilet door, and thought it was me trying to disturb him. He asked me to quit it, only to soon realize and feel that it wasn't me who was outside. He mentioned that he originally wanted to stay in the apartment and was too lazy to join for the swim, but the creeps he got from the apartment made him want to get out of there. My husband and I went to an event with our friends and stayed in an Airbnb apartment. It was a cute old place above a little store in a small town. It never once felt creepy or uncomfortable. 
the days we were there. On the last night, we went to our rooms. My husband was falling asleep while I stayed up looking at photos from the event on my phone and talking to my sisters in a group text. When out of nowhere, I hear a whisper from the door. It called my name and told me to come out into the hall. It was the voice of my friend in the other room, but it wasn't her because she was asleep. Her boyfriend had carried her to bed after she fell asleep on the couch. Besides, if she needed me, she would have texted me first, or at least made sure she had my attention, before just whispering a sentence and hoping I heard it. Normally, I would have gone after it, but after that, I slowly got extremely freaked out. I almost worked into a panic attack, and shaking, which I don't do. They didn't believe me that it happened, and my husband just believes that I believe I heard something. I'm currently in Prague, Czech Republic. I usually rent an apartment whenever I travel, and I've never had an issue with any apartment in the past. I know Prague is very rich in history, especially when it comes to ghosts, gory history, etc. Within the first few days in my apartment, my cousin sent me an article about lemons. Maybe you've seen this floating around the internet. The trick is to place lemons where you have unexplained activity and if the lemons turn green and moldy, they have absorbed the negative energy, or something to that effect. I didn't pay much attention to it, but I did buy lemons for cooking with, and within 72 hours, they had turned green, like I had never seen before. I suppose it could just be a bad batch of lemons though, right? Then the following week, I was waiting for the shower to heat up. As I was watching the water run, a black blob of a shadow about the size of a large grapefruit or a small melon came out of the shower head and fell to the floor. Picture dropping a grapefruit. It was of similar speed. You would expect a grapefruit to fall and with a similar splat, ending when it hits the ground. When it landed on the shower floor, it seemed to morph or melt from its circular-like shape into liquid form and slithered down the drain. I've never seen black blobs. And in my experience, most black figures are not nice. And two weeks ago, I was laying in bed reading. I looked up from my iPad and a white mist was floating over me and going out the bedroom door. I've never seen this mist before, but I have been attacked by a bubble-like entity that would hover over me when I slept and strangle me. This mist was very white very light moving. It didn't seem ominous at all. I rolled over to tap my husband to wake up, and there were massive white wings flapping over his side of the bed. They were absolutely stunning and beautiful. I could see the feathers in such great detail, but I couldn't see where the wings joined each other, or what they were attached to. The wings started to ascend, and went up to the 12-foot ceiling and disappeared. Between reading and surfing on my iPad, I was silently talking to my mother, who passed away two years ago. We are in Prague for a type of fertility treatment that isn't offered in our home country. I was begging her to finally let this be our time. I rarely receive signs from her, which I find frustrating, because this woman, when her dad passed away, she could literally command a sign at any time, and her dad would send one. So I was always upset why she wouldn't do the same for me. Was this my mom? Was this incident with the mist and wings her? We found out this week we are indeed pregnant. But the real test is whether the pregnancy sticks as the rest haven't. One thing I find most intriguing about this apartment though is a locked room. It has a sign on it saying private. I'm nosy. I tried all of our keys, and naturally they don't open this locked door. It's an old door, with an old style long skeleton lock. During the day, I can look through the keyhole, into the room. And there has to be a window, because the room is super bright. Initially, I thought the owners used it as storage, but it's not. It's a child's room. 
There's bunk beds and other furniture. This creeped me out. It looks relatively untouched, and that it could be used at any time. Now I'm wondering if something happened here, and the owners are renting it out, because they can't part with the memories. I could totally be reading too much into it, but maybe these experiences aren't related to me, and are instead related to the apartment. This all happened when I was 19. I'm not the best looking dude, so I've never had much luck with women, and I ended up on Tinder. I wasn't having much luck there either, until the third month of using it, when a blonde woman named Katie messaged me. She was pretty enough that I just dismissed her as a bot. It wasn't until three days later that she messaged me again, which was odd, because bots never message more than once. I clicked on her chat and replied, then looked at her profile. What I saw was pretty generic, but definitely wasn't a bot's profile. We'd been talking for like a month when she proposed the idea that I come see her. I was pretty reluctant as she lived nearly 8 hours from me by car. But I had to admit, I really did like her quite a bit, and I had been thinking about asking her if I could see her for a while now. After a bit more badgering from her, I finally said that I would take the drive to go see her. At this point, I had no reason to doubt she was who she said she was. We had video chatted every other week, and called most days. I just assumed I got really lucky. Things did get a little weird on their way though. She kept messaging me, asking me where I was, and making sure I was still coming. At some points, when I took more than 30 minutes to respond, she would send me a slew of annoyed messages. Admittedly, I had chalked this all up to her being nervous about me coming to see her. I was pretty nervous too, so I couldn't blame her. I had a hard time finding the house at first. The directions she gave me were pretty confusing, and it was back through a series of gravel and dirt roads, and a large thicket of trees. It was still about midday when I came onto an old looking house. A window on the second floor was boarded up, but it didn't look abandoned. Just worse for wear. Katie's red buggy that she liked to talk about was parked in the front of the garage. I took out my phone and texted her that I was there. She only sent me a smiley face in return. When I got out of my car to knock on the door, I noticed someone was looking at me from the second floor windows. I found it a little creepy, but figured it was just a father or something. She had told me that he comes to stay with her every now and again, so I ignored it and knocked on her door. She answered with a smile and even gave me a kiss, which surprised me and I followed her inside. We sat down on her couch and started talking about our plans when I asked about her dad. You didn't tell me your dad was here, I said. Was that going to be a surprise or... Katie looked confused and told me that her dad wasn't there. I still thought she was keeping up the act, and I told her that she didn't have to keep pretending, and that I had seen him looking at me from the upstairs window. Katie went pale, and said that we had to get out of there now. We both ran out to our cars, and when I questioned Katie, she informed me that her dad wasn't there, and that she had been home alone until I showed up. I called the police, and while I was on the phone giving the address, Katie gasped and pointed to the window where I had seen the guy last. He was looking at us from the window again. I got a better look of him, and he seemed older and frail, almost like he hadn't eaten anything in a while. He left the window after he saw that we saw him. The police took half an hour to show up, and the whole time Katie was crying and mumbling about how she was an idiot for not keeping her doors locked. When the police finally did show up, one started asking me and Katie questions, and the other two searched the house. They came back out a little later, and told me and Katie that, while they didn't find anyone, they did find that the back door was hanging open. Whoever it was had run out into the woods, but the cops were sure the house was empty. After the cops left, Katie asked me to stay the night, because she was too scared to be in her house alone right now. I gladly did, and we slept downstairs on the couch, as Katie's bed was the room next to the one the man had been in. Katie had also brought out the shotgun that her father had given her, but she had never used. I told her it was fine. The man's gone, but she insisted, saying she'd feel safer if we had it out. I'm glad she did. 
Later that night, I was still wide awake, watching TV. Katie had somehow managed to fall asleep. From the kitchen, I heard the sound of the door not being turned. At this point, I wasn't even scared. I was just pissed. I flipped on the light in the kitchen and pointed the gun at the kitchen door. And there he was. The guy that had been in the house before was standing on the other side of the glass door. He looked shocked, and I'm glad we had locked the door. The man unfroze and yet again ran into the woods. I woke Katie up and told her what had happened and called the police yet again. When they arrived, they did a sweep of the woods and found no one yet again. They told Katie and me that it would probably be a good idea to stay somewhere else for the night. Me and Katie said our goodbyes. She was going to stay at her friend's house and I was going to go home. I left a little after Katie did. I was on the phone with my brother, telling him about what had happened. My headlights were on. As I was talking, something caught my eye. The man was standing at the corner of the house, just watching me. I gunned it out of there and didn't even bother calling the police again. But I did text Katie and she said she was going to call them again. I don't think Katie ever went back to that house alone. Three years ago, I tried Tinder for the first time. I was 25 at the time, and while most 25-year-old women have dabbled on Tinder or the like, I hadn't been single since I was 17. I met my ex while I was in high school. Six years later, we got married, had a baby. I was happy. But those last couple of years together, he had really begun to resent me and the family we had created together. I fought to keep our relationship together, but the abuse became more frequent and more intense. It got to the point where I took our baby and fled the house in the middle of the night. My mind was scarred and my heart was raw. It was a really difficult time in my life. A couple of months after I left, I had a new home, a new job, and a renewed sense of life. I was starting to open up and could feel myself healing. I was, however, lonely. I was adjusting to shared custody and spent my weekends alone. I didn't want to jump into a relationship, but I did want to experience some of the things my eight-year relationship hadn't allowed me. Joining Tinder felt fun. It was new and scary, and after so much trauma, it felt nice to have so much positive attention. My self-worth was low, so the cheap compliments and instant gratification of the app felt incredible. Who am I? to deserve their attention. Why would they choose to speak to me of all women? Not my healthiest coping mechanism, but I wanted to feel desirable. That's when I met Derek. Derek was an unassuming, average guy. He was cute enough, but not so attractive that I felt self-conscious. Derek and I shared a few interests, craft beer, hiking, and he had a sense of humor that I liked. We agreed to meet up at a local restaurant. I was so nervous. My first date in eight years. I donned my cutest dress, got made up, and headed out. As I waited in the restaurant, my palms were sweaty, my heart was fluttering, and I began to question myself. He arrived, and everything was awkward at first. We ordered our first beers and started to break the ice. As soon as the buzz of the alcohol began to hit, our conversation took off. We had relaxed in each other's company and the rest of the date went smoothly. We joked about karaoke across town. He laughed about how he didn't like karaoke. I'm a huge fan of karaoke. While no superstar, I've spent a good amount of time in choirs and can carry a tune well enough. One of my favorite rowdy weekend activities is going to that bar and busting out some songs with a sweet taste of gin on my tongue. I convinced him to go with me and we left the restaurant. We sang into the night taking shots, flirting, laughing. We ended the night in his truck, clumsily fumbling with each other's buttons and zippers, hearts racing with excitement. This had been what I needed. We texted back and forth more often, and soon we were talking about another date. I had enjoyed our time together, and like that I didn't feel a deeper connection with him. It was fun, and that was it. Because my heart wasn't tangled up in feelings, he felt safe. 
we decided for our second date that we would go tubing down a river that runs through our town. We had parked his orange truck at the end of the tubing run and took the tubes in my truck up river. We agreed that he would zip my truck key with his into a pocket on his shorts and that he would drop me off at my truck afterwards. Bright summer heat warmed our skin and the water felt crisp and fresh on our toes. The afternoon slipped past as we floated down river. When we reached the bottom, we deflated our tubes and headed back to my truck. Only, when Derek reached into his pocket, his face sank. He looked at me and said, Your key is gone. I laughed. Surely he was joking. He insisted this wasn't a joke. Gravity pulled at my stomach, and I began to panic. This was the only copy of my truck key, and I had taken it on the river. I felt foolish and worried about how I would get a new key if we couldn't find it. The river was long, we had been tubing for hours. We stopped at several places to swim. He offered to drive me home, and I accepted. During the drive, we made a plan to meet up the next day to search for my key at some of the stops we had made. We spent the next afternoon combing our swimming holes for my key. Up and down we swam, with very little hope we would ever see my keys. We had to try though, and we kept at it. From one spot to another, we drove, we swam, and we moved on. At the very last place we checked, as the light of the afternoon faded into hazy orange, something caught his eye. Underwater, near the shore, were my keys. We were elated, and could not believe our luck. To celebrate, we went back to his place for some drinks. He drove me down a long wooded driveway. At the very end was a shaded trailer. He told me that he was only renting a room here from an elderly couple, but they were on vacation, so we would be alone. We walked over the creaking porch and entered the trailer. Inside, I could see the kitchen was messy. Not just a couple of dishes, but every surface was covered with a mess. He ushered me away to show me his room. It was small and not very clean either. Dirty clothes, mattress on the floor, a rubber-made bin with some snacks like Doritos, and cheap warm beer. We slept together, the yellowed light of the trailer accentuating the stains on the walls. Afterwards, the spark of fun I had felt when we first met had withered, and I felt gross. I decided that it would be our last date. A week passed, and we hardly texted. Our brief fling was ending, and I didn't expect to see him again. My mind moved on to other things. The coming weekend, my friends were coming to town, and I was excited. We made plans to go to karaoke together on Saturday night. When the day arrived, I was surprised to see a text from Derek on my phone. Are you going to karaoke tonight? It read. I responded that I was, and he texted back that he would be there. I thought you didn't like karaoke, I asked him and he said that he had been invited by a girl he worked with and thought he should give me the heads up that he would be with a date in case I was there. I thanked him for taking the time to let me know, reassured him that I wouldn't be bothered at all, and said that I hoped he had a great date. Around 9.30 that night, my friends and I arrived at the bar. The dim lights and reflective foil stars, an all too familiar scene. We got our drinks and picked a booth with a good view of the stage. I had a strange sensation, like someone was watching me. I turned my head, scanning the bar, and our eyes locked. Eric and his date were a few booths away, and he was watching us. He waved zealously with a big smile. His date turned around to look, and I managed an awkward wave. I was absolutely fine with him being on a date, but I didn't want to advertise that we knew each other or make his date uncomfortable. My friends were all aware of the time we had spent together, my thoughts on the experience, and the text he had sent me earlier. We were all thinking it was a bit odd that he would go out of his way to interact with me in front of his date. But no harm, no foul. He was just being friendly. The evening carried on, and we all had a great time, basking in the atmosphere, drinking in the songs and laughter. A couple of hours in, we were sitting in our booth, when Derek stumbled over to our table with his date. He introduced her as Kate and plopped down beside me, pulling her down into our booth next to him. A strong sense of alcohol oozed off of them, and I could see they were hammered. 
It became obvious that both of them had too much to drink. Their eyes glazed and words slurred. Kate seemed really nice, despite her state, and she launched into a drunk story to the whole table. My friends and I were fairly uncomfortable and were unsure what was going on. Under the table, I felt Derek's sticky hand slide onto my thigh. His date was right there and I was stunned. Without making a scene, I subtly removed his hand and excused myself to get another drink. As I walked across the room, I could feel his eyes raking my back and sure enough, when I turned around, he was watching. When I got back, Kate was slurring that a taxi had come. She and Derek exchanged a sloppy kiss and goodnights, and then it was just us and Derek. Derek's mood shifted after that. He was drunkenly unaware of how uncomfortable the table was, and we could tell he was brooding about his date, having left without him. Derek turned his attention to me. He slung his heavy arm over my shoulder and leaned in. His sour breath, managing to come together, to form clumsy sentences. You're so cute. I love your laugh. I was rigid and just wanted him to leave. When he got up to get another beer, my friends and I spoke about the situation. One of them remarking, you know you can do better than this, right? I said that yes, as casual as this had been, I had made a mistake. We came to the conclusion that it would be best if we ended the night early, as we didn't see him leaving me alone. As a backup plan, if anything went south, we agreed that the girls would go to the bathroom and leave out the back door while our male friends would distract him and slip away. Derek arrived back at the table, sloshing his beer onto his front. He slurred, where are we going next? I hesitated, but my friend told him that we would all be going home. Derek said he would walk us there and we politely declined. He was leaning up against a wall and barely holding himself up at this point. We asked how he was going to get home, and if we could call him a cab. Derek drunkenly pouted that he would just come to my place with me. Trying to shut him down as politely as I could, I told him that my child was there with a the sitter, so I couldn't have him over. He didn't need to know that wasn't true. He refused a taxi and said he would just sleep in his truck. Since his eyelids were drooping and looking at the rest of his state, it seemed reasonable that he would be able to fall asleep in a truck and we accepted that answer. As we started to leave, he stumbled after us. We stopped and reminded him that we were going to bed. He argued again that he should come with me. My friends and I lock eyes. It was time to engage with our backup plan. The two girls and I excused ourselves to the washroom while a friend distracted him. Slipping out the back door, the cool rush of the night air hit us, and we hurried to the path that led to their hotel. Our friend caught up with us, and he said he had left Derek behind at the bar. We were all relieved to be out of there and started to walk back to their hotel. One of the girls was sober and offered to drive me home when we got to the hotel, and I accepted. A few minutes down the path, my phone began to ring. I looked at the caller ID and felt my stomach drop. It was Derek. I turned the volume down and let it ring, and to my surprise, he left a voicemail. I turned on the speaker and played it out loud. Derek's voice sounded confused as his words melted together into the phone. Where are you guys? I thought we were gonna hang out. I don't understand. We were all glad that we had left and agreed that this had been wild. That's when the phone rang again. Another voicemail popped up on my screen. In the dim light of the trail, I played the new voicemail aloud once more. His drunken speech was more intense this time as he launched into how he didn't understand why I left. I had hurt his feelings, and he was in love with me. The tone of his voice shook me when I heard him say, I love you. There was something dark and heavy about it that left me feeling unsettled. We were all creeped out, but happy to see the bright sign of the hotel ahead. We traveled the carpet hallway to their room so my friend could grab her keys to take me home. As we entered the room, my phone began to ring again. This time, the voicemail sent shocks of fear through my body. Derek's voice had again taken on an edge, as he repeated that he loved me, but he was actually really mad at me for leaving him at the bar. He went on about how could I do that to him. He didn't know what he was going to do. His voice shook with anger as he stumbled over himself, expressing how I had betrayed him. The last thing he said before hanging up echoed in the hotel room. You know, I'm really starting to hate you. 
This guy was unhinged, and I was terrified. I was grateful this side of Derek hadn't shown up when we were alone in a secluded trailer. My friend gave me a hug and told me to call them if I needed anything, and to keep them updated. My friend took me home, and as I unlocked the door and stepped into the comfort of my home, I felt exhausted. It had not been the night out I had expected, and Derek's erratic behavior had really freaked me out. Fresh out of an abusive relationship, his actions at the bar, then the voicemails rang some all too familiar bells. That's when I saw the headlights. It was very late for anyone to be driving down my street. I peeked through the curtain, my blood ran cold and I trembled. Sitting in the cab of his orange truck was Derek. Mind racing, I panicked. This dude could barely hold himself up when we left. He was blackout obliterated. How did he drive across town to my house? How did he find me? I immediately remembered the other week when he dropped me off, after my keys were lost. How could I have been so stupid? I barely knew him. We'd only met three times. Derek's face was stony and etched with rage as he sat in the dark cab staring at my house. He wasn't getting out. He was just staring. While I was on my hands and knees, peeking out the window, all the lights were off inside. I was sure he couldn't see me. Then the screen of my phone lit up. He was calling me again. I quickly hid it so he wouldn't see the light. My hand shaking, I played the voicemail as quietly as I could. Derek only said one thing this time. A phrase that sent terror shooting down my spine. In a drunken sing-song voice, almost taunting me, he quietly said, Where are you? Click. I was so terrified. Somehow, I hadn't really considered I could be in danger and chalked up all the fear to my past experiences. Surely I was overreacting, and it wasn't my fault for reading too much into this. I shouldn't be this scared, and I don't want to make a scene. The last voicemail sealed the deal. I figured, even if I was overreacting, at the very least, he was a drunk driver. I called 911, and the dispatcher said someone would be there in a couple of minutes. As I peeked out the window, I saw him get out of his truck. He was done waiting. His feet stumbled as they hit the pavement, and he looked around. Derek's voice cut through the night. He started yelling my name. The wild anger in his voice was tangible through the walls, and he just yelled into the streets, Where are you? Derek started to stumble towards my house when the flashing red and blue lights cascaded down the street, lighting up his face and highlighting every ounce of rage carved into his features. Two police cars pulled up, and the officers got out. I was still peeking out from the inside of my dark house and couldn't hear much of what was happening. I watched them breathalyze him, which he obviously failed. The officers inspected his truck. They all spoke for a while, and one of the officers came to my door. I spoke to him about what had happened, and he was very empathetic. He said, as unsettling as his actions had been, there wasn't much they could do without a direct threat. The officer let me know they would be taking him in for the night, and he would be charged with drunk driving, but that he would be out tomorrow, and to make sure I kept my doors locked and stayed safe. The tow truck came to remove his orange truck from the road, and I could see him arguing. The officers weren't having any of it, and they turned him around to cuff him. As the handcuffs locked around his wrist, he yelled out one last time, looking directly at the window I was peeking out. I know you're in there. Why don't you come out and say goodnight? As quickly as my street had filled up, it was empty. The quiet shadows of late night, swallowing the earlier chaos into nothingness. Derek texted me the next afternoon. I'm very sorry about last night. I was in a bad place. I responded that his actions were unacceptable, and how dare he show up at my house that my child lives at and that I would prefer not to hear from him again. He apologized one last time, and I haven't heard from him since. Over the next few months, I would see him on a bike, going to and from his workplace, so I know he lost his license. I was always wary that we would bump into each other, which thankfully never happened. I can only imagine how much angrier he was after that night lost him his license. I found out that he moved to mainland a while back, which was quite a relief for me, and I no longer feel as on edge around town. 
So Derek, let's never meet again. This happened to me my freshman year of college. Tinder was new, and everyone at my university was on the app. I joined to see what all the fuss was about. Looking through profiles, I found a few guys that were really interesting, and this one guy in particular caught my eye. We will call him Walter. I swipe right on Walter, and we matched. I was excited and kinda giddy because he was super attractive. He messages me, and I got butterflies in my stomach. We message on the app for maybe an hour. Typical conversation is happening. I asked what he did for a living. He asked what my major was. Harmless conversation. After a while he asked for my number, so he could text instead of message on this app. I gave it to him. He seemed nice enough. We messaged back and forth for a few days. Lots of flirty conversation and plans to hang out finally occurred. By the fourth day of the conversation, he started calling me babe which gave me mixed feelings. It was cute, but also a little weird. We didn't really know each other and had never met. I ignored it and continued on with the conversation. He started saying he wanted to be exclusive, and he really wanted to see me in person. He was begging me at this point to come to his apartment, to cuddle and watch movies with him and his dog. I told him that our first meet needed to be in public. I would not be going to some stranger's apartment. He said I was overreacting and kept begging. I ignored him for the rest of the night. The next day he apologized and said he understood we needed to meet in public, so we made plans that weekend. The weekend came faster than I expected and it was the day we were supposed to meet. Something just felt off and I decided to back out. I texted him apologizing, saying my mom wasn't feeling well and needed me to come help her with some chores around the house. This made him annoyed, and he said, Your mom's a big girl. If she needs you, she can call you. Just come over, and you can leave whenever to go help her. I really want to see you and kiss you. I told him no, that I would be staying with my mom that weekend, and that was that. I only lived about 30 minutes from home, so I actually did go to see my mom that day. After what he said about my mom, I started ignoring him, and the text started rolling in, Text after text. Babe, I'm sorry. Please come over. Babe, I miss you. Are you going to come over? I planned on replying the next day that I was just busy with my mom. Then he started calling me. I had a total of 45 missed phone calls within a two hour period. He left voicemails saying he was sorry and just missed me and wanted me to call him back. Similar voicemails continued almost the entire time I was home. My roommate texted me shortly after I finished dinner with my mom and asked if we could go out that night. I agreed and went back to my university dorm. Suddenly the calls from Walter started to increase again. More texts, voicemails, and he started messaging me again on Tinder, asking why I wasn't replying to him. I wasn't planning on replying until I got a message on Instagram that said, Why didn't you tell me you were coming back to town tonight? Getting this message really freaked me out. I replied to him and said, Sorry, I've just been busy with my mom. How did you know I was back in town? He said, Well, I checked your Tinder, of course. Tinder doesn't tell exact locations, but has a within one mile message. This really freaked me out, and I messaged him back and said that he was being really creepy. He seriously had to be constantly refreshing my profile to see the distance change. The messages, calls, and voicemails continued. All were him now apologizing for making me feel weird about him knowing where I was. He was just worried about me. We had been texting for less than a full week. I told my roommate about it, and so we decided to stay in that night. The last straw for me was getting a message saying, Look, I'm really sorry. I'm outside your dorm with flowers and chocolates. Please forgive me. Oh, hell no. I called campus security and told them about this guy, and they never found anyone waiting outside of any of the doors. I'm assuming he was in his car, waiting for me to reply. I blocked him on all socials, phone number, 
deleted Tinder and have never been back on since. I have seen him once, out and about in town, but thankfully he never recognized me. Walter, if you ever read this, I'm glad we never met. I was one of those kids you see walking around zoos or amusement parks, wearing a leash. Those were already a thing 20 plus years ago, but less common, and were initially only tied around the wrist. In my case, it was a necessity. I would always start wandering off from the rest of the family, no matter the situation. This is one of those stories that led to me earning my leash. It happened when I was about six years old, and I went to a zoo with my mom and sisters. Before every family outing, my mom made sure to give me the talk about not walking off again or face the consequences. My mom was a strict parent that made good on her promises, which she had to, being a single mother of three. I didn't try to disobey her per se, but I often just didn't pay attention to the world and people around me. No different this day. I behaved and followed the group for a while, but then a butterfly garden caught my attention, and off I was. When I finally realized I separated myself from my mom and sisters again, I panicked and started walking around the zoo looking for them, being afraid for my mom's reaction more than anything else. After a while, I somehow got it in my head that if I could just walk out, find our car, and wait there, my family would eventually find me. So I did. I got lost within a couple of minutes, walking around a strange neighborhood, looking for either our car or the way back to the zoo. Nothing looked familiar. I started crying. My mom was going to be mad. Then this man came up to me, just normal looking, about 40 years old, asking me if I'm lost. I explained I lost my family when we were visiting a zoo, and I'm looking for the way back. I couldn't believe my luck when the man told me he had just come from the zoo and saw a family standing near the entrance who were waiting for a little girl with blonde hair and a baseball cap, but it was still a few blocks away. So he proposed I walk with him to his car, and we could drive the rest of the way back. Just the mention of his car finally made me hesitant. I told him I wasn't allowed to get in the car with strangers. My mom would be so mad. He then said something like, That was true, but I looked smart enough to know if I could trust someone. I don't remember the exact words, but something like it. Also, he added, he spoke to my parents earlier when they were looking for me so he's not a complete stranger. That didn't seem right. I asked him if he really talked to my dad, who had died a year before. And when he said he did, I broke down crying uncontrollably. I still didn't understand the situation I was in. I was just really confused about everything and scared of how angry my mom was going to be after all this. Finally, my crying caught the attention of the security guard of a parking building we were standing next to. Asking if there was something he could help with, the guy stepped aside with the security guard and started explaining the situation, but made it vaguely sound like he was my father and we were looking for his wife. The security guard seemed to believe him, pointing us in the direction towards the zoo. The man thanks the security guard and proceeds to grab my hand to walk away. The security guard takes one last look at me and asks, in a comforting friendly adult to child kind of way, why I'm still crying. I tell him my dad is dead. He looks really confused for a few seconds, then asks if this man is not my dad. I tell him again, no, my dad is dead. In a split second, his whole face and posture changes, and he turns to look at the guy, who's trying to explain he never actually said he was my dad, that the security guard must have misunderstood, and he was just helping me find my mom. The security guard said he appreciated the man's help, but he would take me off his hands now and the guy immediately took off. I don't think there was much else the security guard could have done. I explained the whole situation, and after making a phone call, he walked me to the entrance of the zoo, which was just around the corner from the parking building. From there, we were brought to the security's office, where my mom and sisters were already waiting. I feel extremely lucky for the security guard being at the right place at the right time that day. I'm very grateful for the extra second of time he took that could have made all the difference. So the other night, I was working this post that was pretty much shut down with roadblocks, 
to check any and all personnel that try to enter the facility. Both roads that led to my gate were blocked off, one less than a mile and a half just north of me, and another a little over two miles to my southwest, around a bend that was completely out of sight. Well, the one just north of me, when people do pull up to it late at night, the headlights would just be visible for me on the cameras. I was sitting there drinking some coffee to try to keep myself awake. I had hardly seen anybody. My sight was inactive due to what we call a hard down, with only essential personnel being granted entry. A truck had just come pulling up to the guard shack just north of me as I watched on the camera. And as the truck is pulling up and coming to a stop, I see a reflection in the camera that I thought was just the lights of the truck. Till I opened up my eyes a little wider to focus, and I saw it move. What it looked like was a complete silhouette of a person, and I thought maybe someone was walking up to my gate in the dark, and it made me jump out of my seat to look out the front window to confirm a visual. As I'm out looking, I see absolutely nothing, and I look back to the monitor, and there it is on my screen. The silhouette of a man that looks to be wearing a hazmat suit. I kept looking back and forth from the window to the camera. As I'm doing this live, I'm just catching glimpses of what the camera is picking up. I radio the two other guards, asking if they let any personnel through the checkpoints, and I get a negative response back asking me what's up. I told them to stand by as I went to review what I just saw on the recordings. To my absolute disbelief, I watch stunned as a truck comes pulling to the north guard shack. Its lights shine on some movement. What I could make out was a silhouetted figure of a man wearing a hazmat suit, walking. When the truck comes to a stop, the man also stops. He looks towards the truck and does a double take from me to the truck and just walks across the road and disappears. I thought I was going crazy and maybe seeing things because of my lack of sleep. I clipped and saved that portion of the video and waited till shift change to show the other guards I worked with over the night and the ones coming to relieve us. I never said anything back that night or anything to the guards coming on shift. I just played the clip for them. Everybody's jaw dropped as they saw exactly what I did without me pointing out anything. This is a regular occurrence out where I work. Most of the guards that have been here for a while have seen things and they have stories. I just finally got what I've been waiting for. Solid proof for myself. I am a single female with a two-year-old daughter. A little while ago, my sister and a few of her friends came over to hang out, have some beers, and play some cards against humanity. My studio has an enclosed patio, save for a door-sized opening. Since my child was sleeping, I had everyone chill outside on the patio. We were having a great time, joking, talking, and listening to low-playing music when the security guard entered my patio. I said, hi there, are we being too loud? Has someone placed a complaint? The guard replied, no, no, you guys are fine, just doing my rounds. He lingered for a minute more and then strolled out into the night. We continued our activities and didn't really give him a second thought. He returned about 25 minutes later, right after most of my group had left. Only my sister, her friend Cody, and I remained. He was an overweight, late 40s, early 50s, white male, and wore glasses. He strolls onto my patio once again and strikes up conversation. We learn he is a retired cop that had to quit the force after suffering a heart attack on duty. He states he had to undergo a quintuple bypass surgery, and after recovery, he started night security jobs. I felt sorry for him because of the medical history and sat and listened to him for quite a while. He must have stayed at least 30 minutes before my sister got uncomfortable and loudly announced that we were going to bed. He bid us goodnight and left. Once inside, my sister said that she didn't like the way he was looking at me and she thought that he took a liking to me. I initially told her she was reading too much into it and that the dude was just lonely and had a long shift ahead. A week and a half later, my sister is visiting again and we are sitting inside my place, talking. My studio has a black screen door, which is visible enough to see through, and then a wood door. I had the screen locked and the wood door wide open to let some air in. My sister is talking to me and I have the sensation that someone is looking at me, 
so I glance up. The security guard is standing at the doorway of my patio, staring. I say hello, and he jerks forward, as if expecting me to say come in or something. But I turn my attention back to my sister, and when I glance back again, he is gone. A week on Tuesday, I took a shower and threw on my red silk Japanese style robe. I was washing dishes for about 25 minutes and had poured a glass of wine. I turned from my kitchen to sit on my couch and I strangled a scream. The security guard is almost pressed up against my screen door, staring straight at me through the foot long crack of the wood door. I was so startled and shaken, but the first thing I did was make sure my robe wasn't exposing me. I ran up to the screen. You scared me, I said. And with no emotion and no apology, he replied, I was just doing my rounds. My scalp is crawling and I'm still shaky. Okay, well I'm going to bed now. He is still right up next to the screen door, all the way inside my patio, and turns and looks at my beach cruiser parked against the wall. Oh, you have a bike? You should put it inside because someone could take it. I replied, yeah, I'll get to it. I pretty much slam the door shut and lock it. I sit down with the wine and calm my nerves. I was shaken up, but wasn't sure if he was being a creeper or just a lonely individual that was looking for someone who had expressed interest. After a debate with my friends and sister, I contacted the property manager. I was actually surprised at how quickly it escalated. They took my verbal incident report over the phone and just informed me today that the guy had been fired. The property manager told me to call the police if I ever see him on premises again. When I first got out of college back in 2002, I worked the overnight shifts at a Walgreens about a mile from my parents' house. Because it was overnight, we had a security guard. Usually it would only be the same person a few nights in a row. It tended to be people who had other jobs or hadn't slept in several days because of working so much. Then we got a regular security guard. At first, he seemed fine, and my supervisor and I liked having the security. Being women working the overnight shift alone on Long Island wasn't super dangerous, but enough of that. It was good to have a third person if one of us was on break. Then things started to get weird. When I would restock the shelves, I would notice the security guard just staring at me. Not for a minute or two, but once, I watched him out of the corner of my eye as I reset and stocked the entire deodorant section, which was at least 30 minutes. Not moving, just staring at me. This behavior went on for a few days, but I didn't really say anything about it because he wasn't coming anywhere near me. He would just stare from the very end of the aisle. He would also disappear for an hour, at several times in the night. He didn't really talk to me or my boss, which was odd, because all the other security guards had been at least somewhat talkative. At the beginning of a shift, his supervisor came in for some reason and was trying to find him. My boss said that he might be in the back, and apparently his supervisor found him sleeping in the break room. While the supervisor was calling the company, the security guard grabbed his phone and got into a fight with him. He then started yelling and basically freaking out. The cops were called, and the security guard had to be tackled and carried out of the store by about three cops. In order for this to happen though, my boss had to say to his face that he was no longer allowed in the store. He came back a few days later, specifically looking for my boss and I. Thankfully, we were both off for the day. After that, we got pages for if something happened, and the head of the security team came in and hung out with us for a few days after the old security guard had come by. I felt so much safer with pagers. I never saw him again, but every night when I would be by myself on the floor, I would hide the door in case he came back. I'm an overnight security guard for a large building parking ramp. It's generally a really quiet job with a lot of free time, but occasionally I do have to kick out homeless people. It's a horrible part of the job, and I do my best to direct them to the next safest place to sleep. Most people are understanding, as they unfortunately go through a lot of this. If anything, they want to vent, and I try to be an open ear. Our protocol is to ask them to leave. If they don't, tell them to leave. 
and if all else fails, we have to contact the police. I've only once gone to that step. It's important to note my general routine at work. I sit in a shack in the parking ramp for an hour, then I go for a walk around the building and then back to the shack. The doors are all locked, but there's an entryway with an ATM that's open 24-7. This is usually where I find people looking for a place to sleep. For more context, I'm a smaller woman and unarmed. On this night, there was a woman trying to sleep by the ATM. I followed protocol, and after the first two warnings, I had to contact the police. She yelled at me, which is out of the normal, but understandable considering her position. It must be frustrating, being constantly kicked out of every semi-safe place. Police arrived, and because I was a little scared, I always am. I watched from inside the building, out of view, to make sure they got her out. If she was yelling at me, she was full on screaming at them. This goes on for about half an hour before she leaves the building. Unfortunately, that's all the cops are required to do. So she makes her way to the bus stop right outside. The problem with this is the bus stop is parallel to my shack. She just sits and stares at me with hatred in her eyes. This gets uncomfortable pretty quickly, so I decide to take another walk. When I'm passing the door that leads out to my shack, I decide to take a peek out of the tiny door window. I don't usually do this, but I felt uneasy knowing she was probably still in the area. And it's a good thing I did. I can just barely see it, but behind my shack, I see the slightest wobble. There she was, hiding right behind my shack. It's not a big thing, maybe a 10 foot cube, made of large windows and metal, right at the entrance to the parking ramp. I have no doubt she was waiting for me. I call the police and just keep watching from the tiny door window. While I'm waiting, she eventually lets out an angry scream, kicks the miscellaneous junk in front of the shack, and storms up the stairwell in the parking ramp. For an extra kick of anxiety, the floor above me had a broken door that wasn't locked all the time. Eventually police get there, and after some harsh words, they get her to leave again, and this time she walks into the night. What really scares me was what I found on my next walk. There's a mirror next to the door I was watching her from. I couldn't see it from inside, but from this side, it was obvious. She had broken the mirror, and a large piece was missing. Maybe I've allowed my anxiety to build all this up in my head, but from my perspective, she had taken a large, sharp object, hid behind my shack, and waited for me to walk up. You tell me if I'm overreacting. But to my nameless potential assailant, I wish you had better times and a bed to sleep in, but I also hope we never meet again. About four years ago, I worked as a laundress. I worked 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. and would often work alone. We usually have a security guard posted near the parking lot. They carry a radio and pepper spray, and later in the day, they patrol the building. A new guy started, and I never saw him watching over the parking lot when I came in each morning. Throughout my shift, he would come into my laundry room. He was talkative, but I noticed he would look at my body a lot when he thought I wouldn't notice. One day I came into work and started putting my stuff away and getting ready to begin. I hadn't turned on all the lights yet, so there are a few parts of the room I couldn't see. Suddenly, I hear radio static in the corner of the room, and I see a red radio light. I turn on the lights and the new guy is in the corner of the room, hiding and watching me. When I asked what he was doing there, he said he was just hanging out and started laughing. It was obvious he was waiting for me. He ended up doing this often enough, and I got used to it. I came in early one day and was working in one of our smaller areas. He came into the smaller room to talk to me. He is a big guy, so I couldn't get around him. He was just talking to me, but I couldn't move or leave the room because he's blocked the door. He asked me why I came in early that day, and I told him it was because I had to leave early later. He told me that I was required to tell him all of my hours, so that he always knows where I am. He was leaning over me, as he was very tall, and I felt like he was trying to upset me. I had this horrible feeling in my stomach that he was about to try to do something. So I pushed past him and called my supervisor, who said he would keep an eye on him. I told him that I had a bad gut feeling about this guy and that I needed to leave for the day. The next day he was fired, apparently, he wasn't in the guard tower at the start of his shift, 
because he would spend mornings in the woods near the parking area, recording girls walking in for their shifts each morning. They also found a huge collection of pop and soda cans and coffee cups in his locker that he admitted he had dug out from various trash bins around where the other girls and I worked. His wife shortly left him and took full custody of the newborn baby. By the way, he still tries to contact me via Facebook on an account that he and his wife shares. So, crazy security guard, let's not meet. I work at a jewelry store in a small mall, somewhere remote in Canada. It's a fun job. I love my co-workers, love the customers, and love the fixed schedule working in a mall gives me. It's nice to know I'll be off by 6pm every night. Gives me plenty of time to socialize and study outside of work. The mall is a single loop, with probably about 50 stores operating on average. They employ a staff of about 30 people to keep the mall operating. Half of this staff works admin, and the other 15 or so work security. As a regular 40 hour a week employee, I've had my fair share of interactions with security, having them escort me to the bus stop on the occasional night inventory, had me work late, or calling them into the store to help me deal with an irate customer. Over the years, I became good acquaintances with a few of the security guards. My favorites were Will, April, and Mark. Will was the friendliest. He'll pop his head into my store and say good morning to me when I'm opening. April was the most, by the books, security guard. She usually helped me deal with the difficult customers. Mark was one of the evening security guards, so my only interactions with him were escorts late at night to the bus, during which he was quiet but polite. A schedule shuffle last year put Will on parking lot patrols, April mostly on the evening shift, and put Mark on day duty. Not the end of the world. Just kind of sucked, no longer having a friendly conversation with Will as I opened the store, and not having badass April around to step in when customers got unruly. Mark was a lot more quiet than his two counterparts, and just wasn't quite as friendly. I didn't interact with him much for the first few months after this new schedule started. I'd give him a smile as he walked by my store, and had him help out a few times with shoplifters, but beyond that, nada. No great friendship blossoming out of the schedule rotation. About two months after the schedule had changed, I had my first bad encounter with Mark. I was walking through one of the mall staff hallways to take a washroom break. Mark happened to be walking just ahead of me, also going to the washroom. When we reached the doors, he looked me up and down, and then remarked, This is going to be hard. I got a bit of a chill when he said that, but assumed there was an issue with the men's room. Someone passed out in a stall or something. So I asked him, oh no, why? Because I'm nosy and was excited to have a bit of mall gossip to share with my co-workers. He got a cold, distant look in his eyes and said, my doctor's advised against heavy lifting, and then winked at me. I ran into the girl's washroom and texted my manager freaking out about what he had just said, knowing full well what he implied with that remark. Mark is a 45-year-old man with graying hair and a bit of a beer gut. He stands about 6 foot 2. I'm a tiny 5 foot 7 girl who was about 20 at the time. It creeped me out so much that I reported it to April my next shift, who promised me she would handle it. I stopped seeing Mark doing patrols and assumed he had been switched back off of day shift. For about two weeks, I heard nothing from him or any of the other security guards. I was just about to end my shift one evening, with about 15 minutes left, before we closed for the day. I heard someone enter my store, and look up to see Mark walking towards me, with just a look of pure hate on his face. I wasn't working alone, so I stepped into the back room, to avoid dealing with him. It didn't work. Mark threw the door open to my back room, and stood there screaming his lungs out at me. How it was my fault he'd lost his job, how I had ruined his life, and how I was going to pay for my mistake. He viewed the sexual comment he made to me as a joke and thought I was a bitch straight from hell for reporting him. He screamed at me for a few minutes and the second he paused for a breath, I calmly told him to get out of my store because I was calling the cops and security. He ran out of the store and a moment later Will sprinted in. He just screamed at me, where did he go? And I pointed as I started to cry. I was shaking from the confrontation as I gave my statement to the police and the mall security. Mark had been fired after my report, 
but security was adamant and it wasn't my fault. Mark had racked up a bunch of complaints over his years, and it was just the last straw that broke the camel's back. He was banned from the mall premises the day he got fired, and criminally trespassed when he came in to scream at me. Authorities issued a warrant for him, and it took weeks for him to reappear and be arrested. During those weeks, I was very scared. Mark knew what bus I'd take. Mark knew my work schedule. Mark hated me. Every time I turned a corner, I was scared he'd be there. I believe he's out of jail now, but Mark, let's not meet. I'm a 19 year old female who is studying in a university in England. Entering my second year last month, we decided to stay in my university town the day before I was due to move into my student home so I could get there early and move all my stuff in and gave me the rest of the day to relax before we started freshers week. The night before moving day, me and my mother stayed in a hotel located in my university town. We were greeted by a very friendly man called Jeremy. Jeremy was very attentive and showed us to our room and stayed around 10 minutes telling us the history of the hotel and repeatedly asked us if we needed any help unpacking and stuff, which we kindly rejected. It was a Friday, so me and my mother went around the town and had a few drinks. Nothing too heavy, as fresh as week started the next day, so I wanted to be fresh for the Saturday night. Before going out, Jeremy explained that he never works the weekend, so he told us to have a good night and wished me luck with the rest of my university journey. He gave me a hug and gave my mother a hug and a slight kiss, whilst moving his hand down towards a bum, which he found weird but brushed it off as nothing. My mom is 37, but looks young for her age, and Jeremy is easily in his 40s, so we just thought Jeremy may have fancied his chances with her. Moving on, me and my mom had a great night around town, and watched a couple of live bands, and had a few wines, so we're a little tipsy. We got back to the hotel, and the bar is still open, so we decided to have a nightcap. Whilst we're having a drink at the bar, Jeremy emerges from the back room, and spots us, and makes a couple of jokes. Jeremy then proceeds to watch a video on his phone, on full volume, of a woman screaming on the top of her lungs, as if she was being murdered. The screaming was blood-curdling, and made me and my mom unsettled, and also another couple in the bar looked a bit concerned too. The video went on for three to four minutes, before Jeremy laughed and went into the back room. When we make our way to bed, my mom had taken her shoes off after they had become painful for her dancing in the bars earlier. Jeremy emerges from the back room and puts his arm around my mom and says, Oh, let me help you to your room, honey. You must be wasted after all that drinking. My mom isn't actually that drunk and insists she's fine, but Jeremy persists and basically follows us to our room and proceeds to come in. But I bid him good night and close the door pretty much in his face before locking it. The next morning, we're up pretty early and make our way down for breakfast. A young girl working takes our breakfast order, only for Jeremy to bring them out, insisting the eggs are cooked to perfection, although he claimed he never worked weekends. Me and my mom are weirded out by Jeremy at this stage and check out straight after breakfast. Jeremy sees us out and says these exact words to my mom. I'll be seeing you very soon, Christy. Anyway, at the time, it doesn't strike us as unusual, and my mom drives us to my new home and helps me unpack stuff. She helps me to unpack, and then leaves in the early afternoon, as she had work that evening in our local bar. The rest of the day goes by without much going on, but that night, I'm out drinking with my housemates, and I get a call from my mom, saying that Jeremy had just come into the bar where she works. This is no coincidence, as when we were having a nightcap, Jeremy would have heard us talking about the bar where my mom works, and he also had our address, which was required by the hotel for whatever reason. He had also said to my mom, when she was pouring his pint, that she should go around to his friend's house after a shift, which was just around the corner. This call really scared me. About half an hour later, my mom called me and said that Jeremy had left the bar after she rejected his offer to go to his friend's house later. But Jeremy had said he'd be back for her later. This was really worrying 
and I told her to make sure a customer was with her as she was locking up on her own that evening. After this call, I felt sick and didn't join my friends in going to nightclubs. In the meantime, I called my dad, who no longer speaks to my mom. They're not on bad terms, they just chose not to keep in contact with each other after they split a few years ago. My dad is a club bouncer, but he wasn't on duty that night. But I called him and begged he just drive down there to make sure everything was okay. My dad clearly knew by my shaky voice that I was panicked, scared, and helpless. 1am rolled around and I didn't get a response from either my mom or my dad's phone. I was worried sick and hoped that Jeremy had been waiting around the corner and done something to my mom when she was locking up. At 1.30am, my mom finally rang me up in hysterics. As she'd been locking up, Jeremy had pulled up in a car with three other men and shouted for her to get into the car for a ride. My mom declined his advances and he got out of the car and approached her and told her that he won't tell her again. He said she had been flirting and teasing him ever since she checked in last night. She told Jeremy that is complete bullshit and she wasn't at all into him. As Jeremy got closer to her, she could smell heavy liquor. As Jeremy went to grab my mom, my dad pulls up behind the car and beeps his horn. This causes Jeremy to go back to the car and climb back in and tells my mom that he knows where she lives and that he'll be waiting. The car screeches off. My dad then gets out of his car and tells her that I told him to check on her. Scared to go home alone, she asks my dad to drop her off at my grandmother's as she didn't want to be alone. After that night, we never saw Jeremy again, but my mom did make a report to the police about him and gave them a full account of what happened, but she hasn't heard back from them. I'm just so relieved that my dad turned up to the pub when he did, as Jeremy would have easily been able to get my mom in that car, as she is only very small in stature. I just hope that scumbag got what was coming to him and is behind bars. My mom has been pretty badly affected by this and is only just now comfortable being alone in her house. So Jeremy, I hope you rot in hell and let's never ever meet again. Several years ago, I was using a dating app. It was all fun and games. Sometimes I met people for hookups, sometimes I didn't. And most of the time, I didn't even reply to those who sent me certain types of pictures, unsolicited. One day, this guy shot me a message on there. He is four years younger than me, meaning he was 18 at the time, and I was 22. I didn't really consider him my type, but at the same time, I also didn't think it would hurt to get to know him. I mean, looks are just looks. And there has been plenty of times where I fell for a guy, not just for his looks, but for personality. So maybe that could have been the case too. I just came out of a pretty toxic relationship that involved lots of cheating and trust issues and insecurities. So I wasn't really looking for a new relationship, but it did feel good to get positive attention from guys. We started texting back and forth, nothing out of the ordinary. But I realized pretty soon that the part of his personality he let me experience considered nothing more than a hookup. And look, no shaming, because I wasn't opposed to it. As I said, I just had a nasty breakup and was looking for some fun. So I said yes. We exchanged numbers, agreed on a date, time and a place, and then we went back to our normal lives for now. I had a lot going on at the time. It was only a few months until I moved to a different place, so I already started planning for all of that. And not just that, but a friend of mine invited me to come on a trip with him to Amsterdam, which obviously had to be prepared for as well, since that trip was scheduled two weeks before I was supposed to move. Therefore, it comes to no one's surprise that I kind of forgot about the guy, until the day we were supposed to meet up. He texted me a few hours earlier, if we were still clear. After I scolded myself for forgetting, I told him that we were meeting as planned, even though that it would throw my schedule off a little. So, I got ready for the date, and I kid you not, not even an hour before we were supposed to meet, he cancelled. It's not too big of a deal, it happens that you can't always make it. So we scheduled another day, which he proceeded to cancel as well. Cancellation after cancellation, week after week. Seven different dates. Each time, it allegedly was a sick relative or pet. So clearly, 
I took that as he didn't really want to meet me, which would be fine, I'm not everyone's type either, but he could have at least had the decency to not lead me on, so I told him off about his shitty behavior and blocked him. Maybe that was a little of an overreaction, but I just didn't want to waste my time with the guy that seemingly always found excuses not to meet me, when I could focus on either the moving process, vacation process, or with another guy who was actually interested. But then, he messages me on the dating app. How dare I block him? He wanted to meet me, but I was just an unappreciative bitch. Obviously, after that, I blocked him on the app as well. I thought that I heard the last of him, so I went on with my days. I already started forgetting about him after a few weeks. And then, another account messaged me, fake pictures and all. But it didn't take me too long to figure out it was him. He basically admitted it in the first place. So another block followed. Another account, another block, day after day. I thought, what even was going on? He didn't want to meet me in the first place. He creates new accounts on the daily to contact me. What the hell? So I just had enough and wanted to tell him off again when he started apologizing for his behavior, that he was in the wrong and that he was willing to meet me if I was still willing to meet him. Trust me, I really wanted to blow him off. But in my mind, if I just met him and just be really bad in bed or something, he'd just never contact me again. Stupid, but hey, it was worth a try. So we scheduled a meeting a few days before I was supposed to leave for the trip to Amsterdam, which I stupidly told him about. And since I didn't have a car, he offered to come to my place. Now, I would never give a stranger from the internet my address, but back then, I did. I mean, he couldn't possibly be a creep, right? So we met, he came into my house, we sat down on my bed, exchanged basic pleasantries, and then he stopped talking altogether. He didn't even look at me. I wasn't a catfish. I looked exactly how I did in the pictures. Only when I asked him something, he would reply with very few words, until I asked him directly about if we'd hook up or not. Then he suddenly started kissing me, and, well, I don't have to go into detail. So when he's done, he just sat next to me, staring at the wall, not saying a word. At that point, I was pretty annoyed. I mean, I get being shy and all, but if it's that intense, how did you muster the courage to go and get a hookup? Anyway, after I went to the bathroom to freshen up, I told him my roommates would be back soon. So we jumped up, said goodbye, and left. I got no other messages from him after. Flash forward to my trip to Amsterdam. My friend Joe and I had lots of fun roaming through the streets of Amsterdam, day and night. We relax in our pretty fancy hotel, and do the usual stuff tourists do. One day we were just walking down a very busy road, very close to the main station, when suddenly I hear a car honk loudly next to us. The traffic light was on red, so the person wasn't driving. I thought nothing of it, and didn't even look, until the guy started to call my name. That voice was very familiar, and the face that belonged to it was still in my memory. It was my hookup. When I looked, he smiled widely and called out for me to come over. But when he saw Joe, who at that point asked me who he was, the smile faded. I was dumbstruck, so I didn't say anything. That wasn't necessary. The traffic light just turned green. People started getting agitated that my hookup wouldn't immediately go. So finally, he focused on the road again and drove off. That was a hell of a coincidence, right? That he would be in Amsterdam at the same time. But why wouldn't he say so when I told him my plans? If he didn't want me to know, why call out to me in the middle of a busy road? I didn't allow my mind to think about him intentionally going there to find me. That was impossible. He wasn't interested in me anyway, right? Back at home, my phone started to blow up. Calls, angry texts, new profiles. Didn't matter that I told him to stop. Didn't matter that I threatened to block him again. He told me that I was a slut for going out with another guy, despite being in a relationship with him. That I was just like everyone else. That he deserved better than me. And then, he said that he had just been coming to Amsterdam for me. To surprise me. When I tell you I changed my number and deleted the dating app quicker than I possibly could have dreamt of, I mean I sprinted to my car and drove to the closest shop to get a new number. Not long after, I moved into the new place. 
I had two new roommates that were both in the same college course I was in. We got along fine, and the house was pretty big. One of my roommates inherited it from my mom, and moving went smoothly. I didn't get another text, I didn't get any messages on my social media, and he didn't show up to my old place. Eventually, a few months later, I basically forgot again. For more context, the house is in a village, not even a small town, but a village. There were no shops, no nothing. Shopping, we'd have to go into the next town, that was approximately four miles away. My room was on the ground floor. The window of that room was right next to the entrance door when you were looking at the house from the outside, and right beside my room outside was the carport. The ground was covered in gravel, and once anyone moved, the light of the carport would turn on. It was a pretty hot summer, so I sometimes slept with my window open. I wasn't afraid of that, because once again, it was a small village, and barely anybody would drive through here. So one night, I was just sleeping, I even had my back toward the window, and then I started to hear someone walking on the gravel towards my window. Immediately, I turned around, of course, and I saw a guy walk past my window. Though he didn't look inside, he walked to the mailbox and seemed to throw something inside. Then he left again. I was stunned for a few seconds, but at least it wasn't a murderer, I thought. So as soon as I could move, I closed the window and kept it closed from that point onward. This actually happened a few nights, that someone would walk past our mailbox in the middle of the night, but nothing was ever inside. At least that I knew of. It was weird, but maybe one of my roommates were receiving something personal that they just didn't want to share. Cut to a few nights later, I was minding my own business, when suddenly I hear some gravel again. My roommates had just gone to bed about half an hour ago, and I didn't hear anyone leave, so I thought it was just a mailbox guy. But this time, he didn't walk to the mailbox. He just walked to the carport. I know that, because the light turned on. Immediately I texted my roommates about a guy in our carport. One of my roommates, Sarah, who had her room just across the hallway from mine, while Mary, the other roommate, had hers upstairs, texted back in our group chat that we'd meet up with weapons at the bottom of the stairs so we could investigate. I grabbed a pair of scissors I had in my room and went to our meeting point. Turns out, my weapons were the most useful, since Mary came downstairs with a ukulele, and Sarah thought an empty plastic bottle would suffice. After laughing at the absurdity of our weapons of choice, we started getting back into serious mode. Going to the side door that led to the carport, Sarah looked through the window of the door but didn't see anyone. The light was turned off too. Just in that moment, we heard someone tampering with our mailbox again. I'm not gonna lie, I probably just peed my pants a little bit. Immediately we ran to the front door, opened it, and looked outside. But there was no one, at least, not that we could see. After looking the mailbox, which was empty of course, we went back inside. Not even two minutes later, I get a text from an unknown number, saying how cute I looked in my nightgown. That no makeup even made me look prettier. He hoped I'd come out alone, so we could have some fun together, like before I moved. But he was sad to find two other people with me. Needless to say that none of us slept that night. The police were immediately called and did a sweep, but no one was found on the property. He didn't exactly say it, but I know it was that guy. So I filed a report the next day. Nothing really happened with it, but since nothing else happened like that, I thought he got the message when we called the police. Sometimes I still get messages from an unknown number, but they're pretty harmless, and don't really bother any further when I ignore them. But the fear in the back of my mind that one day he could be back stays, of course. In the meantime, I took up self-defense classes. So, dear stalker, we better never meet again. I'll begin by giving a little background. I'm a female, and at the time this happened, I was 16, working at a chain coffee place while in high school. I'm now 19 and in college, seven hours away from said place. This happened at a time in my life in which I was super shy and had a tough time standing up for myself. In retrospect, I could have dealt with it a lot better. I used to work closing shifts with my best friend after school. It'd be 3 to 10 p.m 
were 5 to 10 p.m. We worked at a relatively dead store, so we spent a lot of our time playing music and talking. We did our duties like taking the trash out and restocking, etc. Although both of us always dreaded taking the trash out, as we had to go out to the back. The dumpsters were behind the store, in a dimly lit area next to a sketchy liquor store. One night, a man came in. It wasn't unusual to have customers come near closing. It just wasn't uncommon to see anyone we didn't already know. Our store was mostly just regulars. He was lanky and probably around 30. I mostly just remembered his eyes. They were piercing, the type that never break a stare. I remember initially thinking he was attractive. Yikes. The way he spoke was short and concise, just ordering a small hot latte. I made his order and that was it. I told my friend about how I thought he was attractive and we then started referring to him as a small hot latte guy. We always call people by their drink orders. He came back a bunch of times after that, each time staying a little longer and longer and talking a little more and more. One day he came with a woman, presumably his girlfriend. I remember I felt a little weird, like she was staring at me or they had spoken about me beforehand. She glanced over at him and said, Wow, she is pretty. I didn't think much of it, said thank you, served them, and thought that would be the end of it. He then began showing up and talking to me a lot without her. He started off as being friendly. I honestly don't even remember what we talked about. I think music. Then he got kind of flirty. Initially, I was just flattered. But being underage and immature, I didn't even think about the fact that it was kind of alarming. He began to stay for a while. Sometimes he would bring a laptop or notebook. I could feel him staring at me and listening to our conversations. But at that point, I wasn't getting creepy vibes from him. As my co-worker and I had dealt with our fair share of creeps, he then somehow got my number. To this day, I honestly don't know how. He texted me and somehow I still wasn't creeped out. We would talk a lot about music then I began to learn more about him. He was in his late 30s and had prior problems with substance abuse that he never really got into. He went back to school for art and would show me his pieces. He'd also sent a lot of pictures of nature. I thought they were nice. Looking back, they were actually pretty creepy. For example, a picture of his backyard sent at like 3 a.m. He'd stay out and work on his art as well. He then told me he barely enjoyed hot lattes. He just wanted to come see me. He would come in and began giving me gifts. This was the point I finally started realizing that I did not like the situation. He began by just giving little snacks or drinks. I would accept them, but never eat or drink them. It wasn't that I necessarily thought he had ill intentions. I just had a hard time accepting gifts. I remember one night, he brought me a book about one of his favorite artists. I reluctantly took it, but it tried to decline before. I remember telling him about one of my favorite musicians and sent him a link to a performance I really liked. He started being kind of sexual while still talking about the song. He then began talking super suggestively and I would laugh it off and decline when he'd asked to send pictures. I began talking less and less and told my friend about the situation. She agreed it was getting creepy and said I should maybe change my schedule. I told her I'd be fine, because I'm stubborn. He'd still come in every week at closing time, and he'd even stay in his car till we closed. Meaning, he'd watch me go to the back to take out the trash. I began making excuses as to why I couldn't talk, and began going out to the back of the store when I'd see him. He then sent me a bunch of texts about how graceful I looked while working. I didn't respond. He kept texting me and I told him I didn't want to talk anymore. He sent a bunch of messages describing how much I meant to him and how he wouldn't be okay. I started freaking out. I blocked his number. Still, I returned to work. I honestly thought he'd stop coming, which unfortunately, I was wrong. I felt uneasy the whole shift. My friend said that if he came, just go to the back and wait it out. I saw his car coming and my heart sank. I was on the verge of tears and hurried to the back. I could hear them talking, but couldn't decipher what exactly was being said. Then, about ten minutes later, she came to the back. I could visibly see that she was upset. We ended up both crying and hugging each other. She told me he kept asking to see me, and asking how I was. 
and she just kept refusing. She told him how I was underage and how he made me feel uncomfortable. He wouldn't give up. Eventually, she threatened him and he left. We were both shaken up, but I thought it was over. It was time to take out the trash and lock up, and we both felt okay. I was opening the door while juggling like three bags of trash and saw something on the ground. I was confused at first, but then realized what I saw. It was flowers and a note. I felt sick to my stomach and looked around the parking lot. I didn't see his car. I threw them out immediately and told my friend I didn't want to read the note. She read it and told me I had to. It was something to the effect of, I've never felt so connected to someone. You're breaking my heart. Please don't do this. I'm sorry. Looking back, I honestly didn't lead him on, but initially, I just had felt as if I was in the wrong. Nonetheless, we turned the corner to take out the trash and both prayed the parking lot was empty. It wasn't. Let's just say the trash was not going to get taken out that night. I continued working there and still work there on my breaks from college. I had different hours after that and the summer I was going to leave for my freshman year, I saw him again. It was around 3pm. It was busy. We made eye contact. And then he left. That was the last time I saw him. Looking back, I was so naive and could have handled the situation so much better. I am forever thankful to my friend. So yeah, small hot latte guy who forever tainted my love for espresso, let's not meet again. I met this girl, we'll call Elle, in an online chat room and hit it off with her. She was literally everything I ever wanted in a woman, except for one thing. Al lived in Portugal, over 35,000 miles away from where I lived in the US. We got close though, despite the distance, and decided we wanted to make a go of it. And so, we entered into this long distance relationship. A few months later, and I got a new better paying job, planning to use the extra funds to save up for meeting Al in person one day. Instead, I met this girl at my new job, Alice. We worked in a factory where you would work on two-person teams on a single machine. The teams would vary, so one day you would be working with person X on machine 4, and the next with person Y on machine 2. I had been with the company for a couple of weeks and got assigned to work with her, and for the most part we got along fine. We made idle, mundane conversation as we worked, as one does, talking about nothing serious when out of the blue, she asked me if I was single. I responded that I was not, and that I'd been dating this girl called Elle for a few months, and left it at that, thinking I'd put the gabosh on whatever she was thinking may happen between us. The conversation went on mundane as ever, when she mentioned her boyfriend, and I thought maybe she didn't have any ideas about anything after all, and was just being nosy. Our shift ended, and as such, so did the conversation. Over the next little while we worked together again, off and on, and at one point, she asked if she could add me on social media, and I said sure, not thinking much of it. That is until the next day at work, when she mentioned some posts she read on Elle's wall that I hadn't seen or could find. I asked her where she'd seen it, and she said it was an older post. The post was from seven years previous. I asked Alice if she'd gone through Elle's entire history, and she said yeah, that she was bored and had nothing else to do. So after going through mine, she went through Elle's as well. That kind of set off alarm bells in my head, because who goes through the entire post history of a complete stranger in a single night? I guess my face showed my thoughts, because she quickly apologized and stated that she didn't mean to be so over the top about it, but we post so rarely that she would go through just a few and suddenly find herself looking at years old posts. This wasn't untrue and so seemed reasonable, but still weird, as she had no connection whatsoever to L, and so had no business on her timeline. I mentioned it to L later that day, and helped her adjust her privacy settings so it couldn't happen again. A bit later on, and I was working with Alice again, and the conversation was again fairly mundane. 
when all of a sudden this guy walked over to our machine and just stood there glaring at us. First her for a while, then me, and then back to her, etc. After about 20 minutes, there was a call over the intercom and he sauntered off to answer it. Alice looked like she was about to cry after that, and it was fairly creepy, so I asked her what that was all about. Turns out, that guy was her boyfriend, and they'd just broken up. I made the mistake of asking if she was okay, just trying to be polite, while secretly hoping she wouldn't go into detail about it. Which, of course, she unfortunately did. As it so happens, he'd repeatedly had told her from day one that after a bitter divorce, he wasn't interested in a monogamous relationship, that he wanted something open, no strings attached, no commitments, and no expectations. She confided in me that she did want those things, and just went along with them since she could see his potential as a husband from day one. Just like she could me, there went those alarm bells again. Anyways, he was apparently serious about wanting an open relationship, because he'd gone behind her back and signed them up for a swingers weekend a couple of cities over. When she'd found out, she said no, and that she wasn't ready for that yet, but agreed to sleep with the guy her boyfriend knew while he watched. After he dropped into the conversation, how he just helped a woman down the street move in, and there was definitely a spark. And when the day came for her show with the stranger, and she backed out last minute, he got pissed, called the whole thing off, and went to sleep with the woman down the street. They ended up getting into a huge fight, and he broke things off with her for not being honest about what she wanted in the relationship. She then told me, I just got so nervous, thinking about sleeping with a complete stranger. I'm just not that type of person, and there's very few guys I would sleep with, present company included of course. I cringed at that last remark, and reminded her that I was seeing someone for almost a year at that point. A comment she basically ignored. I got the impression at this point that in her head, just because me and Elle hadn't met yet in person, that meant our relationship was somehow less than real. She also told me how they'd slept together a few times since, but she knew he was only coming around whenever the other girl was busy or didn't want to sleep with him. She also told me that he'd been doing that to her any time they worked the same shifts. He would just show up and glare at her until someone called him, and he'd been doing this for almost a month. I told her that she should just report him to the supervisors, and she decided that she could never. So I told her she should find a new job. She told me she couldn't, because at her previous place of employment, a popular national chain sandwich shop, she'd stolen large amounts from the till, and only avoided prosecution because she made restitution. And because of her criminal record, no other place would hire her. And there went that alarm again. Over the next few months, things got worse. She would randomly walk up to me at work and start talking about how we'd be great together and how she always wanted a boyfriend like me who was kind, thoughtful, a great listener, tall, handsome, yada yada yada. I would always cut her off with a short but succinct, not to mention spoken for, and she would storm off. Alice would get all excited when we had work together and post something along the lines of, working with my BFF today, I love this man and tag me in the post, then delete it before I could see it, but not before Elle did, who eventually saved a screenshot and sent it to me. When I confronted Alice with it, she basically blew me off, saying that it wasn't a big deal. I unfriended her and blocked her after this. Still, she would often walk up to me or tell me when we were working together about her favorite positions and how promiscuous she is. Now I'd been in the Navy prior to this, so the contents of these comments didn't bother me much, as I'd heard much, much worse from the mouths of US Navy sailors. What did bother me, though, was if someone heard these incredibly one-sided conversations and said something to Elle, and how much trouble I'd be in with a woman I'd grown to deeply care for. Not that there was much threat of that actually happening. I always told Elle whatever Alice would say to me, but still, it needed to stop. So I went to my direct supervisor and asked him not to put me with Alice anymore, as there were issues there. I didn't go into detail, as I didn't want her to lose her job, but I did say that I was uncomfortable with working with her. That's when things got really creepy. She started texting me, and when I asked how she got my number, she ignored the question. I changed my number, and a few days later she was texting me at my new number. So I changed it again, 
and then within a few days, she was sending me texts again. I didn't keep these messages, and to this day, I have no idea how she was getting the numbers. And her messages were responses to in-person conversations I had with other people. At one point, a friend and I were working 12-hour shifts, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., and I had said something about how I was going to order a pizza when I got home and grab a shower. While I waited for the delivery guy, I got a text from her that night saying she'd overheard that I was getting a pizza and suggested I bring the pizza by her place so we could hang out. And another immediately after saying that, when I got to her place, I would have to be naked as she was a naturalist when she was at home and expected the same from her guests. I ignored the messages and blocked the number only to get another message from her the next day from a different number. This one was a picture message of her in nothing but three slices of strategically placed pizza, telling me to pick which topping I'd like to eat first. In another instance, I was texting a friend about heading to the mall that weekend to pick up a birthday present for a mutual friend and setting a pickup time and such. Later that day, I got some texts from her saying she could give me a lift to the mall as she was going to Victoria's Secret to get some new lingerie and needed someone to help her in and out of the lingerie as she tried it on. I got an email later that weekend. Again, no idea how she got my email address. It was a series of pictures from her in various states of undress as she modeled her new lingerie for the camera. That week at work, I requested to be put on weekend shifts permanently as she worked the morning weekday shifts and that would mean I would only have to see her once during the week and not have to work with her. Alice's response to seeing me less was starting to show up in places I was. I went to a small party store in town where I could get a hard to find flavor and brand of soda I like and as I walked up to the register Alice was suddenly there just standing in the doorway. I paid for my sodas and then just kind of stood there. I didn't want to call the police and get myself tied up with legal issues since I was still planning to travel Europe to spend some time with Elle and I also didn't want to go home as I was afraid she would follow me home and then know where I lived. So I just stood there looking at her not really sure what to do, when suddenly she turned around and left without a word or purchasing anything. She showed up one night at my favorite burger place, a little hole in the wall bar, and sat down at my table right across from me, and had the gall to ask me if I was going to buy her dinner. I moved to the bar where I stayed until the bar closed at 3am, and then some. The barkeep was a friend who gave me a lift home. I caught her following me around a major chain superstore late at night, and when I finally shook her and was able to go home, I got pictures sent to me of her doing inappropriate things in the pharmacy department. How she got away with that one, I'll never know. Unfortunately, at this point, Elle's mother was diagnosed with final stage colon cancer, and she died less than two weeks later. Feeling like I really needed to be there for Elle, I got my documentation in order, bought a plane ticket, and put in my two weeks notice. I saw Alice two more times in my regular spots in the coming weeks as I prepared to depart for a three month stay to help Elle with anything she may need. Once outside my bank, when I stopped to shift some funds around for my trip, and the other as I was getting some new socks and underwear for the trip, she walked up and recommended what she would like to see me in before slithering away. A couple weeks later I was sitting in the airport terminal waiting for my plane and I got texts from her asking if I was ready to man up and sleep with her. I shook my head and ignored it. Three months later, I was back in the States, just in time for the 4th of July. I didn't see Alice all summer, nor did I give her much thought. Al came to visit at the end of September, and in November, we got married, after being together and traveling back and forth for three years. Later that month, my hometown was holding their annual Christmas tree lighting ceremony, and Dill had never been to one before and so we went. While we're standing there singing Christmas carols, me rather off-key, I felt these arms wrap around me from behind and clasp at my waist. Initially thinking it was Elle, I put my hands on hers, about the same time that I realized Elle was standing next to me. So she couldn't be the one wrapped around me, nor were these hands wearing her wedding rings. I pulled the person's hand away and twirled around, coming face to face with who else? Alice. She'd spotted me in the crowd and decided to say hi with some guy in tow. 
Al turned around and Alice spotted her, and I could see Arkham Asylum flash across her face, and I saw her take a cup of hot cocoa away from the guy with her, and I pulled Al slightly behind me. As Alice lowered the cup, as if to throw it all over Al, I asked her who her date was, and she froze, and looked at him, and then quickly said he wasn't her date, just a friend. This seemed like news to him, as he got angry and stormed away. I watched him go, and when I turned back to Alice, she was sizing up Elle, so I asked Elle if she could get me a cup of that cocoa. Elle left, and Alice asked, so still dating her, eh? I responded, no, we're married now. Alice froze, looked me dead in the eye, and recited my address, described the layout of my bedroom in extensive detail, and promised that she would show me what real Americans did to Euro trash before she ran off into the dark night. Elle and I stayed at my parents' house the last few days we were there. I called the cops, but nothing ever came of it. I also called my former landlord and told him he should be on the lookout for someone trying to break into the empty apartment. At the end of November, we got on a plane bound for Portugal and left Alice behind. Me and Elle now have a baby named after Elle's mother. I feel bad for whoever Alice latches onto next, but I'm glad there's a whole ocean between us now. And Alice, if you're out there and you're reading this, please, for the love of God and all that is holy, let's not meet again. I was working in an orthopedic operating room as a nurse when I first met Neil. He was a new co-worker and I heard he was a bit weird, but nothing could prepare me for that moment. Though he looked like a fairly normal middle-aged man, my stomach completely turned. You know that feeling in the pit of your stomach where you know something isn't quite right, but you can't pinpoint it? That's the feeling I felt as soon as I laid eyes on him. I tried to shake it off, but I just couldn't. He was a bit weird and had an unconventional personality that made him seem quirky. That's the nicest way to put it. He would do yoga poses in the middle of an operation, loved to talk, but completely off subject of the surgery, and was almost overbearing. But he was overall very polite and kind to everyone he met, making him seem harmless. I still couldn't shake my gut feeling though. I ended up confiding in one of the other nurses I work with, Kayla, that something about him made me feel uncomfortable. She took me to the corner and said she felt the same, but had no reason why she felt this way. We agreed to keep an eye out for each other and just keep our distance from him. Kayla and I are pretty friendly people and often got some questions of why we obviously didn't want to engage him. We were polite and talked to him when it regarded patient care or the procedure, but would avoid any other conversation with him, especially the ones of him talking about his son's behavioral issues, an upcoming sudden divorce from his wife, and how he broke his wrist. He would ask about our families, children, and personal lives often. We would find a way out of the discussion kindly and run for the hills. We look like unfriendly assholes to a harmless man going through a hard time, all because we couldn't pinpoint something about him that made red flags go up. Kayla and I tried to shake it off, but we just couldn't. We started second-guessing our instincts and almost felt guilty about not engaging him like we would with our other co-workers. Until two months ago, Neil was supposed to show up to work, but never did. Management called and called and eventually decided on a wellness check after not getting in touch with him for a day. Our wellness check policy came about when another nurse never showed up to a shift because she had ended her life, and they were fearing he might be thinking the same thing since he was having such a rough time. I went on my day as usual during this time, and suddenly Kayla busted into our operating room after we just finished a long operation. I had just helped the patient get out of the room when she shoved her phone in my face, and I finally understood where we had our primal instincts kick in as soon as we met him. I saw his mugshot, his face twisted into harsh malice, and his charges, human trafficking and sexual assault. Kayla and I looked at each other in complete disbelief. Though we knew something was wrong, we never would have thought this. We were sickened and honestly grateful for the gut feeling. So Neil, from a protective mother and serious patient advocate, let's not meet, ever. I work at a store of a big fast food chain to pay for my university. 
Our staff changes frequently because of a lot of students and migrants working at our place, so you don't get to know each other very well. Everybody has their own social life, and it is very, very rare for co-workers to establish friendships outside of working hours. Still, you know the people on your shift, and the night shift has particularly few workers. One of my co-workers, Jasir, started to get interested in me. Not that I noticed. I am young and dumb. I like being friendly, and, important for later, have a hard time saying no. In December 2019, our store threw a Christmas party at a pub. I went and had a great time, but I also made plans for later that night. Because of that, I wanted to leave early, which made Jasir also want to leave early, despite the fact that he neither needed nor planned it beforehand, which made me uncomfortable. Unfortunately, he didn't know how to get to the train station, and I did. I couldn't say no, and just let him tag along. When we arrived at the train station, it came to light. There was no train he could take to get home. None. He did not check beforehand. He did not ask me. He just wanted to tag along. With me. Super uncomfortable. Instead of taking the train to the main station, he got into my train, and only got out when I insisted he change his trains at another big station. In January 2020, Jesser asked me out for a coffee, and I agreed. I thought, he just wants to be friends. He doesn't have any, and can only rely on his co-workers. If something happens, I can just know about, and so I went. First it was okay-ish. We mostly talked about work-related stuff, because we don't share any hobbies. We are not the same age, and we do not have the same mother tongue. Jasir didn't like talking about work and work, and nothing more. He started talking about how different I was from the other co-workers, how nice of a person I am, and how good my charisma is, and he asked if we could get to know each other better. I genuinely didn't want to, and still don't. Jasir is not my type. Neither is a person, nor from his looks, especially his looks. Even if I sound superficial, well I am in my early 20s, Jasir is at least in his early 30s. I have no problem with age gaps, but I am not attracted to men that dress like teenagers. Instead of telling Jasir a straight no, I told him I was not interested in having a boyfriend. He didn't take that seriously and told me I would change my mind. I told him I wouldn't. He, again, was not really on board with that opinion, so I elaborated my opinion three times in German and one time in English to get it very clear. He always changes to English if he does not get something or thinks he's misunderstood. Even if he heard it clearly and just doesn't like it, we left the conversation with him still not convinced and me really not being interested in the second meeting. He quit soon after and I foolishly assumed I was free. But whenever he came to my workplace to place an order, he would ask me out and eat something. And every time I would reiterate whatever I said the last time, because of finals, because of travel, because of anything I could get my hands on. Then came COVID-19, that hit Germany in March, and I didn't see him anymore. I blocked him on social media in April, and hoped that would be the last thing to happen. But oh boy, that was not the case. Today I finished my shift at 3am, and left with my female co-worker, Wei, to catch the next train. We take different trains, so we decided to wait in the main lobby, until I needed to go to my platform. And that time, Jasir appeared. He just finished his shift and was on his way home. Wei asked him which train he needed to get, and he said he was walking home. While the conversation went on, I got closer to Wei to get some space between me and Jasir. Wei did not grasp how uncomfortable I was in that situation, and she just walked away. So what did Jasir do? He placed himself between me and Wei, right in my line of vision. Every fiber in my body felt how he barged into my personal space. I decided I could not take a private conversation with him, and said, Oh look, I need to go to my platform, just to end it. But Jasir followed me, through the main lobby, through the station, into the elevator, and then into the train. I was internally screaming, and walked through the train until I saw another passenger. I sat down in the row of seats next to them, and Jasir followed. As if every bit of luck had just left me, the other passenger moved seats and went away. So I was back to being alone. Jasir talked and talked, and I showed clear signs of not wanting to continue the conversation. I hoped he would leave before the train departed, but he didn't. Mind you, the train goes in the opposite direction of his house, and is one hour walking distance to my workplace. 
There was no way in hell this man could get anything out of taking that train, except following me and continuing the conversation. I was freaked out and told him in English that he was acting weird. Maybe I should have used a different word, but English is not my first language, and at that point, I only thought about escaping. I could not let him see my station, or he could easily find my home. I don't live rural, but at 3am, there is nobody on the streets, so him following me home was terrifying. I thought about getting off the station earlier, but then I would need to grab a cab, for which I did not have the cash on me, or I would need to walk the rest, and he could still follow. I decided to get up at the next station, let him get out of the train first, and then just stay inside while the doors closed. It fortunately worked, but only after telling him clearly that this wasn't my station. I would not get out, and he would not get back in. I even held my hand out to stop him from coming back. He stayed outside after the conductor shouted at us to let the door close. I work overnight at a store. I'm a stalker. I'm a 25 year old female. When I first started, a guy around my age got hired a couple months after me. He started hanging around another co-worker and I on break, and we eventually became friends, even hanging out alone on break sometimes. He seemed pretty normal at first, agreeable and a good conversationalist. He told me he was autistic. I was in a bad place mentally at the time, and having someone validate me felt nice at first, but then he started getting touchy. I would eventually be telling him more personal stuff, and he would start to rub my back. I didn't want to be rude at first, so I didn't say anything, but then he did it more often. I told him to stop, and he seemed to be sorry, until doing it again eventually. I was alone with him for all these incidents, and the look on his face when he did, eventually, showed predatory vibes, and not like the friend I thought I had. Around the same time he started doing this, he also confessed to me something he did in the past to a friend of his. You can probably guess what it's along the lines of. He acted quite remorseful and said him and the friend are now civil, and that it was a long time ago. I think he also cried a bit. I'm generally a compassionate person who believes in second chances, so while this is when more red flags started going off, I still hung out with him a bit, although more distantly. It didn't help that his general demeanor is one of a pitiful person, nice act. He hung out with my boyfriend and I a couple of times. He lives near us, so we were kind of excited to have someone to hang out with at first, but he just kept getting weirder and weirder the few times we hung out. He also seemed to be trying to subtly one up my boyfriend in a sarcastic manner. It was also a strange time when he did a deep belly laugh, he had an explicit sexual song playing on his radio that my boyfriend and I just kind of felt uncomfortable about. He'd make a point to not drink that much around us when we were drinking, despite bragging about how much he could down. He rubbed my back, yet again at one point, while I was drunk when my boyfriend left the room, trying to pass it off as comforting. He generally tried to be flirtatious whenever my boyfriend left the room. Eventually, enough was enough, and I cut him off, although I still have to work with him. This was last summer. We weren't even friends for that long. Since then, he has come in early every night to put out my work stuff for me. Leaves me food and water and gifts, stuff that I've mentioned in conversations before. Parks near me and waits for me to leave the parking lot so we can drive together, I guess. One time he waited half an hour as I was chatting with another co-worker. Waits in front of his house for me to pass by him to get home, which I have to turn on his road to get to my road. Still says weird phrases my boyfriend and I used messages despite being ignored left a note saying you really do hate me on my work cart after months of ignoring him he's written my full initials on a work cart in marker and leaves the same one out for me every day i always try to erase them but the next day i'll see he wrote them on again oh and whenever he walks by me he looks sad or pissy managers have talked to him and a report is going through hr right now but I just hope he doesn't escalate. Despite being talked to, he still leaves the cart and stuff out for me with some water and rewrites my initials. But nothing has really seemed to happen with HR so far, except for him no longer waiting for me in the parking lot. I guess the manager talked to him about that. I told him to stop leaving carts out for me and he acted like I was being unreasonable. And now he wrote my initials again on my work cart while I wasn't looking. 
as well as this, a smiley face which it seemed he also drew on every window of my car the other day. Guess I left my doors unlocked, because one was drawn on the inside. He's so obsessed. This happened to my sister about 15 years ago, when she was in high school and I was in middle school. Our mom had worked as a house cleaner and always became good friends with everyone whose home she cleaned. One of the homes was owned by an older couple who had no kids, but had a huge house and a really nice pool that they always invited me and my siblings to come swim in. The husband worked as a chief operating officer of a large airline company and they lived in a really nice neighborhood on a large lot with a forest of trees. When you were in the backyard, you couldn't see any of the houses at all, just trees. It felt really secluded and almost spa-like with a waterfall and a short iron fence, so you had a good view of the forest. Their house was really angular and architecturally interesting with multiple levels made from walls of stone, even on the inside. Pretty much every room had huge floor-to-ceiling windows that looked out over the backyard and gave great views during the day. At night, however, the reflection from the inside lights prevented you from seeing out, so it's always a little unnerving to walk by them since you couldn't see what was out there. The couple also decorated with old Native American art and masks, which was a little creepy to a middle schooler. But the couple wasn't creepy, so I never got too scared. They had an older golden retriever named Samson that lived up to his name and was massive but had a sweet and gentle temperament. They had also rescued a husky mix named Sadie who was quite the opposite. Psycho Sadie, as we so lovingly called her, had intense separation and stranger anxiety. She would destroy their house when they left her inside, jump their short fence if they left her outside, and if they took her with them to run errands, she would destroy their car and howl non-stop until they returned. So, since they were wealthy and had extra money, they would pay for me or my sister to come over and dog sit while they were out. We got paid $20 an hour, so we were always excited to go over there and watch cable and swim in their awesome pool. Normally, everything would be fine and both dogs would just lay around, but occasionally, Sadie would realize I was a stranger and go nuts and start barking at me. One time she backed me into a corner and would not stop barking and I watched her eyes literally turn red. I was convinced she was going to attack me, but she eventually calmed down after I got up on the couch and showed her how big I was. But I digress. This particular incident happened over Easter weekend while the homeowners were out of town for two days. They were paying my sister to stay there over the weekend and I stayed with her the first night because it was a big house and kind of scary to stay there all alone and we stayed up late watching chick flicks and eating junk. The next day, we swam in their pool and hung out, but for some reason I didn't spend the night again, and I'm so glad I didn't, because what happened that night scarred my sister for life. It all started when my sister was working out on the treadmill. Their workout room was on the bottom floor of their home, which was a walkout basement. Just outside the room was a huge sliding glass door that opened to their patio and pool, she had the TV on in their workout room, watching the Ten Commandments that is always on the night before Easter. As she was running, she thought she heard the house alarm beep like it did whenever a door was opened. She stopped the treadmill and went to look around and saw that the sliding glass door was open. Now, this door is huge and there is no way it could have possibly opened by itself, so she was instantly freaked. However, the dogs were just laying there in the workout room and she figured they would have gotten up to investigate if someone had come inside, since they have those kind of instincts. And because Sadie was so schizo and hated strangers, so she made excuses that she accidentally left the door open, and she must have imagined the beep of the alarm, and it could have been the TV or the treadmill. She closed and locked the door and went back to working out, but a couple of minutes later, she had the distinct feeling of someone watching her. She looked around but didn't see anyone. She finished her workout, but couldn't shake the feeling of being watched, so she decided to just go to bed because she was a little creeped out and just wanted to forget about it. She went around and made sure all the doors were locked 
The owners didn't give her the alarm code, so she couldn't set it. Then she took a shower and locked herself in the guest room with both dogs, just in case, and then eventually fell asleep. A couple hours later, she awoke to both dogs growling at the door of the room. It was fairly normal for Psycho Sadie to growl and bark for no reason, but Samson had never barked or shown any signs of aggressiveness at all. So immediately, my sister knew something was up. She was shaking and trying to convince herself that the dogs had just heard an animal and that it was nothing. But then, she heard that dreadful door alarm beep. She called my dad in a panic, crying and screaming, and he told her to hang up and call the police. While he was on his way over, she called the cops, and my dad made the 15-minute drive in under five minutes. When she opened the bedroom door to go let my dad in the house, the dogs took off running and barking throughout the house, and downstairs to the basement. My sister ran screaming all the way through the house to the front door to let my dad in, and he took a quick look around the upstairs levels, but didn't see anything unusual. The police arrived a few minutes later and looked around, and found that the back gate was open, as well as the sliding glass door again, but not enough to let the dogs out, just barely, like it had been slammed shut and bounced back open a little. They said it did look like that someone had entered the home through the sliding glass door, because the lock was tampered with, but they determined that whoever it was hadn't stolen or disturbed anything. When my dad asked why someone would break in and not do anything, especially with the dogs locked up, the police said that they had been notified by the homeowners earlier that month that the husband received a death threat because of some decision he made at his job that put a lot of people out of work. They had gone to the police about it, but didn't bother to tell my sister to keep an eye out for anything suspicious. Thanks a lot for the heads up. Needless to say, we never dog sat for them again, and they moved out of state within a few months because he had lost his job, and he deserved it. So, my parents have decided to take a well-deserved holiday away, just a couple of hours from where we live. My mother has been working non-stop due to the COVID cases, as she works in a local hospital, and my dad wanted to treat her to a relaxing break. I currently live with my boyfriend, and my parents have asked me to stay at the house for the week that they're away, and look after our lovely dog, Millie. Now, Millie isn't the most wonderful of guard dogs. She's cute, and white and fluffy, and a little bit fat, but she does the job. Any weird sounds like the house creaking, or anyone lurking around outside our house or on the street, she barks. But she does spend most of her time sleeping, or lounging around on the sofa, unless I take her on a daily walk. I've house sat for my parents, and I used to live with them, so I'm pretty comfortable within the house. However, between 12am and 5am are usually when I feel the most uncomfortable there. Just something about the atmosphere changes, and I can't quite explain it. For the five years that I lived in this particular house, with my parents and younger brother, my bedroom was just above the kitchen, and I have my own bathroom, so I had quite a bit of privacy. And whenever I couldn't sleep, or needed to use the bathroom, I would rarely wake my parents, as my room is on the opposite side of the house from where the other bedrooms were. So not much noise would travel from my side of the house to the other, and vice versa. When we first moved in, it was in November, so winter time had just arrived. The house was quite gloomy initially, with the lack of furniture and personalized decoration, but it was, and still is, a beautiful house nonetheless. I think I started noticing the weird noises it would make. At around the second week of having moved in, we had not set up the Wi-Fi yet, so I was using my limited data to browse my phone when I eventually ran out and had nothing to do to entertain myself or pass the time. So I decided to lay off my phone for a bit and try to sleep. That's when I noticed the sound of muffled voices, which sounded like they were below my room, in the kitchen. I couldn't exactly make out what they were saying, but it was easy enough to distinguish that the conversation was between a man and a woman. I could hear both voices chiming in and have what seemed to be a long-winded conversation. At first, the possibilities of it being my parents came to mind, but was quickly debunked as I remembered that my father wasn't currently moved in with us yet. He 
He was staying in our old house for the time being, as we were still back and forth moving furniture. And as we lived not in the most loveliest of areas, if word got out that there was an almost empty house for sale, it wouldn't be an extreme assumption to think that people may try to squat there or break in. So, my dad most definitely wasn't downstairs in the kitchen, and it certainly wouldn't be my brother, as at the time he was only a little boy, and the voice I heard from downstairs sounded like a man. Still, the woman's voice could well be my mother's, but who would she be talking to at 3am in the kitchen if it's not my dad or my brother? And it wasn't someone on the phone, as I could hear two voices having a conversation as if they were in the same room. I eventually fell asleep and kind of forgot about it until it happened again and for every night after that, for the whole five years I lived there. It became just the sound of the house, almost normal like the way a house creaks on a windy night. My parents still claim to not have heard it, and to this day, they say they never hear it. But my dad has started seeing things around the house, just shadows, but you know, still creepy. Back to present day, I'm in my bed as Millie lays at my feet. Millie and I were chilling. I'm on my phone scrolling through Reddit, and I hear a voice of a woman, almost like a yelp, coming from downstairs. As clear as day, and much louder than the voices usually sounded, Millie jumped up and started barking like mad, and I just sat frozen for about a minute before I got up and decided to take a peek over the banister. But it's just complete darkness downstairs. Millie was at the top of the stairs looking down and barking down, but I couldn't see exactly what she was looking at, just this dark abyss. I looked out the window over the street just to see maybe if it was some drunkards outside, but no one was there. I guess I'm freaked out a lot more than usual as I can't even describe the noise perfectly, and I can't emphasize how clear and loud it was too. Just a woman yelping, one single yelp. I'm spooked and so is Millie, I guess there'll be no sleep for me tonight. I'm currently looking after a house and a dog from my dad's friend. All has been going pretty well and it's a nice house, but on day one I noticed the camera in the living room and flipped it straight away. I asked the owner if I could have friends over for my birthday, to which he allowed. I noticed the day after the camera was flipped back up again, figured it may have just been a mate of mine who thought he knocked it. Today, after I was watching YouTube on the TV, and had the volume up at a reasonable level, but the memes kept going really loud and distorted, causing it to be way louder. The neighbor begins to bang the door, so I let him in, and he says, Stop abusing the house. You've been loud two days in a row, and I know you keep flipping the camera because the owner says he can't view it. I was very shook at this moment, as my suspicion that someone had a key to the house and was coming in while I was gone was proved. He also told me I was doing a good job cleaning because he came in to check when I was out. He had also proven that the camera was for spying. I really don't know what to do. I've got to look after the place for a week longer, and I'm not going in the living room now as I can't flip the camera, but I also don't want to be spied on. This so better be worth the money. So last year in December, I was looking for a job. A friend of mine said that one of her friends knew a lady that needed someone to look after her cats while she was on vacation, and that pay was good. I contacted the lady, and she told me she was going to some island for three weeks and was ready to pay me 600 to take care of four cats. The only thing special, and that's why the pay was so high, was that she wanted me to sleep in her home. Why, you may ask? because she had two very old cats that needed medications daily, and she wanted someone there to check on them any time during the day. I needed the money, even if I thought it was weird. I mean, an old lady that never had kids and lived alone in her house. I could understand her. Her cats were like her kids to her. She loves them very much. I visit her to see what the house looks like, and so she can tell me more about the cats and what she wants me to do. First thing that should have made me say no 
She had cameras, a camera in the kitchen, one in the living room, and one outside. She told me about them and that they were very visible. Told me they worked only during the night, so she could be sure all of her cats came home every night, and that yes, she could check on them when she wanted, and see through the camera with an app. It made me a bit wary, but nowadays, with thief and psychos that hurt animals, I could understand. Some days passed, and it finally came to watch over the cats. She gave me 300 bucks before leaving, and told me she would give me the rest when she came back. Okay, I understand wouldn't want me to starve the cats and pay me completely before leaving. The second thing that should have made me say no, her cousin lived near, like very near. I never met him before leaving, and for some reason he didn't want to take care of the cats, but she told me he had an emergency key in case of something happening. Great, see he had a key to the door of the house. First thing I did was check on the cameras in my room and bathroom in case she was more than a crazy cat woman. Luckily, there wasn't more. A week and a half passed. I slept in a guest room, took care of her cats, gave her updates. Easy. Then I came home from uni and was making myself some noodles. I remember it was around 8 p.m., so it was dark outside since it was December. The cats were all with me, and they were all nice and cuddly, when suddenly I hear the door open and someone shouting, I am the Midnight Ghost. I have come to meet you. The cats ran away. I was alone and my phone in the bedroom. Strangely, I didn't panic because I knew the only other person who had keys was the cousin of that woman. I always locked every door and window when I came home. He enters the kitchen, laughs, presents himself. He is indeed the cousin. I didn't panic, but I was stressed. Hell, he just barged in the house at 8 p.m. He sits at the table and says, let's talk. All right, what can I do or say? I was alone and he didn't seem dangerous, just a little crazy like the cat lady. He talks, makes jokes. I'm starting to get annoyed and my noodles are getting cold. I try to make him leave, saying I'm tired and I want to eat and go to sleep. When he makes the most terrible joke, and formulates a sentence that will always traumatize me. While laughing, he says, Well, I did say to my cousin, I was going to come abuse you. There. I was scared. The next day, I contacted the lady and tell her what happened. She tells me he is boorish and was trying to be funny. Yeah, very funny indeed. In the end, he never came back. And when the lady came back, she gave me the rest of my money and proceeded to tell me that she will leave for two weeks in March. No thank you, I don't want to come back again. I blocked her and hope I will never see them again. I should not have done it. I got scared for life, even if nothing happened to me. I've always been a bit of a skeptic when it comes to paranormal experiences. My family is religious and believes in spirits and demons, as I do as well, but I never exactly bought into the actual stories of entities inhabiting houses and stuff. Now, however, I'm not so skeptical. If anything, I'm downright terrified. I still have no idea what really happened. My boyfriend came over last night to watch a movie and chill. Nothing out of the ordinary. I'm currently dog-sitting for some neighbors down the street. Nothing big. I've done it quite a few times for them before, so I know the routine and everything. Never really felt nervous at night or anything. At around 10 p.m., my boyfriend and I left the house to walk the dog. It was dark out. We were just chatting as we went down the street. We approached the driveway, and I got this weird feeling in my stomach. But I chalked it up to being a stomach cramp and continued up the driveway. I opened the garage door and walked inside. As I'm walking in, my boyfriend just stopped dead in his tracks in the middle of the garage. I kinda assumed he didn't want to go in, since it's an unfamiliar house and all, so I continued on. There's two layered doors leading into the house, a big wooden one followed by a glass door. I opened the wooden one and instantly got this weird feeling in my gut. Let me preface this by saying that I personally am not a fan of the dark, 
and prefer to keep the lights on, especially when I'm alone in someone else's house. For this exact reason, I'd always make sure to keep a few lights on in the house for when I went to dog sit at night. As I opened the glass door, I realized that every single light in the house was off. The only sliver of light I could see was coming from the closed bathroom door. I murmured something about it to my boyfriend, who also noticed the bathroom light and was still standing in the garage. I finally stepped inside the house and instantly faltered. The atmosphere was just so oppressive, I felt extremely vulnerable and exposed the second I walked in. The dog's kennel and food is directly left of the door, so I turned to take her out. As I was getting ready to open her kennel door, I just got this inexplicable urge to look behind me. Turning around, I stared directly into an empty and dark living room, and my heart just stopped. I felt waves of nausea and fear start to wash over me. It was like something was staring right back at me from within the darkness. The raw primal fear was something I've never felt before. It felt as if whatever was watching me from there was just waiting for the chance to hurt me. Every instinct in my body was screaming at me to run and just get out of there. My boyfriend was saying things to me from the doorway, but I genuinely couldn't understand him. Too scared to talk. I finally turned to look at my boyfriend, who stared straight back at me and whispered that we needed to go right then and there. He looked like he was about to throw up. I could tell from the look on his face that he was feeling the exact same fear I was. I opened the kennel as fast as I could, grabbed the dog, and we bolted. I was instinctively tearing up as we left the garage from pure fear, and I could tell my boyfriend was as well. We waited until we were at the entrance of the driveway to even risk talking. My boyfriend told me how he felt like something was horribly wrong in the house, and that he felt as if he was about to vomit from fear and nausea. I got even more freaked out hearing him describe the same symptoms that I felt. If I'd been the only one to experience this, I would have chalked it up to a simple fear of the dark reaction. But hearing his words just made it so much worse. At first, I was assuming this was a part of a home invasion, convinced someone was waiting in the dark with a gun. I contacted the owner of the house, who confirmed that they owned automatic lights, but they shouldn't have gone off like that at all. Truly wonderful words to ease my fears. I then called my mom who was still at our house, telling her what happened as we walked the dog down the street. My boyfriend was attempting to calm himself down as I talked, and I think we were just both super shaken up at that point. It felt like we'd escaped a near-death experience. After some persuasion, she agreed to go back to the house with us to help us check everything out, but it was clear she didn't exactly believe us. To be honest, I didn't care. I just wanted to have an extra person with me in case of a home intruder or something. You see, I didn't really think it could have been anything paranormal at that point. I was just terrified that there was someone in that house with a weapon. She walked with us back to the house and would explain the terror we felt inside of it and our gut feeling to instantly book it. We approached and walked up the driveway cautiously, careful for any signs of a break-in. As we finally approached the garage door, however, the dog just started going crazy. Absolutely wild. Snarling and growling at the garage door like something was on the other side. And the fear and nausea came back in full force, to the point where I couldn't stop crying. My tears were just coming down my face. The closer I got to the garage door, the worse I felt it. I practically begged my mom to back up from the garage door. She seemed pretty concerned at this point and contacted the owner again as the dog continued to growl. After a quick conversation, we all eventually decided to open the garage door with bated breath. Nobody was inside. Walking into the house, I felt the terrifying presence fade a bit, but the atmosphere was still just really eerie and unsettling. We turned the lights on and after a few moments of tense silence, kind of relaxed. The dog ran to a food bowl, all was calm and then my boyfriend pointed out that the bathroom light, which had previously been on, was off. The door was also cracked slightly open, and we sort of nervously laughed about it. And after seeing the dog finished eating, I went to put her back in her kennel. The door to the kennel was latched shut. I knew I hadn't shut it when we left, and just pushing it closed wouldn't have been enough to completely latch it shut. 
It's one of those dog kennel doors that you need to push the latch in two different directions to properly close it. The cold chill came back to me, and I shared a worried glance with my boyfriend. My mom then abruptly stood up and announced that it was time for us to leave. We all walked back to the house in relative silence, and my boyfriend and I just kind of cuddled for the rest of the night. He mentioned that he felt like this experience was supernatural or paranormal, and I agreed with him. There were no signs of an intruder. It definitely felt like some kind of malicious entity. But maybe it wasn't. Everything that had just happened was just so surreal, and I'm not even sure anymore. I get the chills thinking about it, though. Could it have been some sort of demon? I live in a regional town of Australia. There is no sex trafficking problem here. It doesn't exist. There is no gang activity, no unsolved murders, and no missing people or unsolved crimes. Just to give you the lowdown of the sort of area I live in, I'm a trans man. I'm a pre-trans, so I don't often pass for a male, despite me trying to. And that is probably somewhat obvious by my profile picture in Facebook, where I look pretty feminine. Now onto the story. This happened today, and I'm still unsure whether I should do anything about it, or if the police would even bother. I flip furniture as a hobby. I like to pick up free or cheap worn out furniture, repair it, repaint it, and then sell it on. It keeps my mind occupied. Facebook Marketplace is my usual go-to where I find stuff. So this morning, I found a post for a free table. I messaged the person asking if I can pick it up today. As I am messaging them, their Facebook profile picture disappeared. I thought that was weird, but maybe they had just changed it. They agreed to a time and flicked me the address. No worries, it's on the edge of town. They sent me a random obscure message. Are you coming alone or will you have your husband with you? Okay, I'm not married and this is slapping me in the face with red flags. But I think maybe the table is heavy and they think I might need help to carry it. I respond with nah, it's all good, I'll be alright. There is no response. I have this uneasy feeling that something isn't right with this. I've never felt this way before, and I don't know why I do now, but I figure it's the middle of the day. I've got my phone, and I'm driving, and this is a safe town. Maybe I'm just overthinking the whole thing. So I hop into my car and head to the agreed place. I couldn't find the exact address on my GPS, which I thought was odd, but nevertheless, I find the street. There's nothing there. By that, I mean there is a creek that runs by the side of it, empty lots with bushland and tall overgrown grass, a disused isolated somewhat motel, and three warehouses. By this stage, I'm feeling really off. Everything inside me is saying, dude, there's something wrong with this whole situation. I'm paying a little more attention to that feeling at this stage, but keep going. Two of the warehouses have no signage, but there's a couple of cars out front, and I can tell they're used as a business of some sort. Their address isn't the one I was given though, even though the motel looked like it hadn't been used in years. I see a mid-40s guy sitting on the step of one of the units, smoking. I think to myself, that's a bit bloody creepy. But maybe he owns the place and is doing some work there and is just taking a break. Or maybe he's just a squatter. So I drive down the street a bit further and find the last warehouse. The address is where the pickup is meant to be, so this must be it. I start thinking, maybe they got the number wrong. I mean, this place has tall weeds surrounding it. Rubbish out the front and surely hasn't been used since it was built. I might like free furniture but I'm not an idiot. I decide I don't want it anymore and message the bloke that I was sorry, but I couldn't find the place. I get a message back saying, are you in the utility vehicle? I saw you drive up and down a couple of times. Are you alone? There's no cars or any sign of life at this warehouse. And by now, my intuition is screaming at me to get out of there. Yes, I have a utility vehicle, but I don't see anyone around. How did they know that? I reply, yeah mate, sorry, can't find the place, cheers anyway. I get no response for about an hour, no sorry, no anything. 
Just a response saying, it's the old motel. You have to get out of your car and walk to the back of reception. The same worn down isolated motel with overgrown weeds that hasn't been used for many years. The same one with the weird guy sitting on the step. I message back, what are you talking about? That place hasn't been used in years. I get no response, nothing. So I head home and sit down for a drink and to Google this place again. I've forgotten the exact address he gave, so I go back to Messenger to find it, except it's gone. So I go back to Facebook Marketplace, and the whole ad is gone. It's just disappeared as if it didn't happen. Did I just avoid something sinister happening? My gut says I did. So, creepy free table guy, who was likely planning on doing something really bad to an unsuspecting freebie hunter. Let's not meet. Around first grade, I became friends with this kid named Stan. He was a couple of years older than I was, but he had a sister that was my age, who I also was friends with. I also had a wicked crush on their oldest brother James. I was the type of girl who chased poor, uninterested boys all around the playground. I lost contact with all three, around middle school. Of course, when Facebook happened, I began getting in touch with people I'd gone to school with. It was a moderately sized kindergarten through 8th grade school, so you were basically with the same group of kids through each grade. This makes for some pretty strong bonds, I believe, because there's a lot of us who kept in contact after moving on to high school for a little while, before drifting apart. Because of this, I was always really excited when I got back in touch with those people. However, not all these connections have been positive. I got a request from Stan one day, under a different name. The messages were the typical, how's it going, what have you been up to, etc. And he started sending me messages that were about my looks. They weren't obscene, but they did make me a little bit uncomfortable. He started pushing to meet up, I can't explain it, but I just had a really off feeling about him. So I would avoid making any kind of plans. He continued to be pushy about things, and finally, I just stopped responding to his messages. I should also mention here that when I first accepted Stan's friend request, he literally went through every single one of my pictures and liked them. That should have been my first clue, but I just let it go. Then I started getting messages from friends and even some family members asking me about him. Stan was going through and basically sending everyone friend requests. By this point, I'm like, what the hell, this is weird. But things got really nuts when my cousin informed me that Stan had not only tried to friend her, he'd also sent her a message asking all sorts of questions about me, like things I liked or places I'd like to go. My cousin was concerned that he was sending those kinds of messages to other people who might actually tell him what he wanted to know. I debated sending Stan a message telling him to back off, but just decided to block him and changed all my Facebook settings to make it as private as possible. I also sent out a mass message to all of my friends and family, informing them of the situation and to kindly not give out any of my personal information. I had been friends with James, but ended up blocking him as well, just to prevent Stan from getting access to anything. Things were quiet for about a week, then the friend requests from random accounts started coming in. Some didn't have pictures, some had random images. They were accompanied by messages that made it very clear who they were all from. Stan. Full of skeevy comments on my looks and how he wanted to hook up. And that's putting it mildly. Every day I had an account that needed to be blocked. I contacted Facebook about the situation, though that didn't really offer any kind of help. It finally came to a stop when I threatened Stan with police intervention. My boyfriend at the time threatened to disembowel Stan and feed him whatever came out with a side of fava beans and a nice Chianti. The piece lasted for about a year. Then I got a request from a girl I'd also gone to school with named Kelsey. We talked pretty frequently both online and over the phone. She wanted us to hang out, so we talked about it a bit. But then she started bringing it up more frequently, persistently. I started to get that weird feeling again that something wasn't quite right. 
Then came the bombshell. Kelsey and Stan were dating. We'd all been in the same classes, so the fact that they knew each other wasn't strange. But for them to be dating... I confronted Kelsey about it and blocked her, but because we talked on the phone, that meant they had my phone number. Of course both began calling and texting crazy things non-stop. I finally had to get my number changed. It's been over 10 years since all of this, and I haven't heard from Stan once. Kelsey did try to friend me recently with a different account, and a look through her Facebook shows she's married to another man and no evidence of Stan. I'm not taking any chances though, so she's been blocked. About a month ago, I got a Facebook request from someone who I didn't recognize. But we had a lot of mutual friends, so I figured we must have met before, and I just didn't remember him. Immediately after accepting his friend request, he tried a video chat with me on Facebook Messenger. I didn't respond, and after a few tries, he gave up. Last week I got a phone call from an unknown number, and I answered it, because I've been waiting to hear back about a possible job I applied for. When I answered the phone, a very excited voice said, Hey Kira. When I asked who it was, he said he just added me on Facebook. I told him that wasn't my name, and he had a wrong number. He then started to ask me a bunch of personal questions in a row, like where I lived and what school I went to. I kept telling him I wasn't comfortable with his questions, but he just didn't stop, so I hung up. He called again the other day, but as soon as I heard his voice, I hung up. If he calls again, I'm just going to block him. The creepiest part of this is that I don't really have any personal information on my Facebook page, and I definitely don't have my phone number on there. I don't think any of our mutual friends would have given him my number either, so I don't know how he got it. This story takes place from 2013 to 14. I'm a female, and at the time of the story, I was 15 to 16 years old. At this age, I was a bit more naive than I'd like to admit. I had made a Facebook without my mom's permission at the age of 12, and had been using it to talk to random people. Most often, older men. At the time, I didn't see any sort of problem. Boys my age weren't very into me, so when older men started talking to me and giving me attention, it made me feel normal and mature. I never told any of them where I lived or where I went to school. My Facebook had my city and state listed on my profile, but that was it. In 2013, Chris Grantham sent the first Facebook message asking me to hang out. I didn't respond because I may have been naive, but I still had my guard up to some extent. He tried again a few months later, this time offering to smoke some weed with me. And this time I respond, and entertain the idea for a few messages, just asking how he likes to smoke, and trying to make conversation and give him the benefit of the doubt. Eventually leaving him on red once, he keeps sending messages asking to hang out or to see me. I stop responding at this point altogether, because I'm not interested, and he's pushing too much, and really starting to make me uncomfortable. Skip ahead a few months, and it's midsummer and I just got home from my family's summer home. I have my friend Sarah over spending the night, and we're smoking and chilling out. I haven't responded to Chris in months, and honestly, forgot about him. It's a little after 11pm, and there's a knock on my front door. My mom gets the door and yells upstairs that someone is here for me. I sent Sarah down to get the door, assuming it was a boyfriend, as he was the only person we were expecting. A few moments go by, and she comes back up, telling me the door is for me. At this point, I'm confused and a little annoyed because I have no idea who would be at my house looking for me at this time. Guess who's at the door? Chris. I awkwardly answer and realize it's him. I recognize him from his Facebook immediately. I start to panic internally, but I don't want him to know I'm scared. I ask him what he's doing here, and he says, I wanted to see you and chill. 
and I tell him he needs to leave, as I'm not gonna leave my house again today. Luckily this works, after some convincing, and just as quickly as he arrived, he was gone. I get one more message from him after he left. Yeah, sorry about stopping over. I'm depressed, and I've lost a lot of people in my life. I know what it's like to have depression. To an extent, everyone's different, but that has never made me stalk anyone. I'm finally overbiting my tongue. Just ignoring Chris clearly doesn't work. I ask him why he would show up at my house like that, and how he figured out where I lived. He claimed I told him over Xbox Live way before. I've never had Xbox Live in my life, and I for sure have never played games with this guy. When I told him that was impossible, he said he must have got me confused with my sister, as she was the one he played Xbox with. This was also not true. No one in my family had Xbox Live, ever. The last message I sent to him was, you make me uncomfortable. I didn't tell you where I live. I would never do that. And then Chris replied, Yeah, well sorry, I won't stop over again. Then I blocked him. Fast forward about one month, I see an article on Facebook. The top line said, Man gets arrested for attempted murder on sister. He cut her multiple times, and when the police arrived, he stabbed one of the officers as well when they were trying to detain him. Just a few days after getting arrested, Chris had one hand shackled to another inmate as they were filling out paperwork. He then lunges and stabs the other detainee multiple times in the neck with a pen, just barely missing his vital arteries. I still don't know how he got my address or anything. I can't help but wonder what would have happened to me if I had actually befriended him and hung out with him. This happened years ago, when I'd gotten my first actual job. I didn't think much of it. I figured it was harmless. I could find people around the country to chat with, learn about some other cultures, you know, all that kind of stuff. I wouldn't give out personal information about myself. No phone numbers, address, any of that. I wasn't stupid. I was bored. No friends in my city. All of my friends were back in my hometown, and I wanted to fill the time in loneliness and talk to people. I heard about these websites to meet pen pals around the world. I made a simple profile, stated what kind of friends I was interested in making, just basic stuff. After about a month, I receive a message from a man. I don't remember it word for word, but it basically said, Hi, I found your profile, and I'm super interested in being friends. He then stated that he lives in the same state as me. Though I know maybe it was rude to be snobby about someone in my state contacting me, I did politely say on my profile that I was trying to make some pen pals outside of the US. I responded politely though, and I replied to a few of his messages for a while. I found out that he lived in the same city as me, and he messaged me. I see you like anime. I love anime. I also see you've been to Japan. I have been to Japan too. Do you go to anime conventions? Maybe we could go to the next convention that comes to town. I felt a bit uncomfortable. I put right on my page. I have no intention to meet up with anyone. Just have an online pen pal. I politely told him that, and he didn't like it. Instead, he said, I just thought we could be friends, since we have similar interests. I again politely told him that I'm not interested in meeting anyone in person from the website. He pretended to be fine with it, and went right back to rambling about his interests. I logged out of the website for a few days, and just focused on my personal life, going to work and doing schoolwork, and taking care of my disabled father. One day, I woke up to notifications on multiple of my instant messenger apps, all stating basically the same thing. Hey, it's me, from the pen pal website. He messaged me on four of my chat apps, including Facebook, which I did not give him. How did he find it? I was really annoyed. As polite as I could, I messaged him on the pen pal website. Hey, so... I don't know how you found my IDs for my chat apps, but that was kind of over the line. That wasn't really appropriate. Not one app, but you messaged me on like four. 
To which she replied, I'm sorry, but I really wanted to talk to you, and you haven't been on the website for a few days. And I responded by saying, that doesn't make it okay. I also have a personal life and a job and family. I cannot spend all my time on here. That's why I messaged you on those apps, he said. I don't have them listed on my profile. How did you even find them? He avoided my question. I'm sorry I did that. I'm just trying to be your friend. I just want to be friends with you. And then I told him, that isn't the way to do it. I'm very uncomfortable that you somehow found that information that I didn't give to you. I don't think we should talk anymore. I don't want to be friends with you. I'm sorry. Please do not contact me again. I immediately blocked him on all of those apps and the pen pal website. For a few months, everything was fine. Suddenly, I got a message on one of those apps and the user wasn't in my friends list. The message was basically as follows. You stupid, fat, ugly bitch. No one will ever love you. You'll never find a man to love you. You're so fat and ugly. Why don't you just end yourself? Do the world a favor. I rolled my eyes and blocked the account. Throughout the course of a year, every few months, across multiple social media platforms, I was being harassed. I had completely forgotten about the man until I received a message on the pen pal website. The account didn't have a name or photos. It was a random username. The message I received was the same nonsense as before, calling me fat and ugly, saying I'm a bitch, telling me I should die. Once I got the message on that website, I knew it had to be him. I'd had no other issues with anyone. I replied, saying that guy's name, telling him I know it was him, and that his behavior is really sad and pathetic. Then he told me, I just wanted to be your friend. Watch your back. Then the account blocked me. For a few more months, nothing really happened. I got one or two messages from fake accounts again, but I had grown used to it and just immediately blocked them. Then one day, I received a Facebook message from a police officer. He was contacting me about a profile I apparently made on a website called Ashley Madison. It is used for people to have affairs and hook up. I had never heard of it before then, and absolutely did not have an account there. I had a long talk with him, where he told me his department investigates human trafficking, and thought I was an underage girl, possibly in danger. It had my personal Facebook account listed on the profile, as well as other ways to contact me. I was in shock. He advised me to contact the website and ask them to take down the profile, but said to me, You seem like a sweet girl. I don't know who you pissed off, but don't read the profile. My curiosity got the better of me, but I should have taken his advice. Using some of my normal selfies, an account was made, and the profile stated a lot of horrible things. Very derogatory. It made me sick to my stomach to read some of the things it said I apparently wanted to have done to me. Thankfully, the website took quick action to take down the profile. The next time I got one of those hate messages online, I snapped. I didn't hold back cursing him out for being so immature and disgusting just because someone simply didn't want to be his friend. The account blocked me without answering. I didn't get a message from any accounts for a while. One day, when I was the closer at work, I was waiting outside for a family member to pick me up. I didn't have my own vehicle, and my family would give me rides to and from work. As I was listening to music, waving goodbye to my manager as they drove off, I got a notification on one of my apps. You ugly bitch. I sighed, rolling my eyes as I opened the message. As I was typing, another message came in that made me stop typing and freeze up. You're all alone now. I could hurt you right now if I wanted to. No one would ever find you. I backed up against the building. I didn't have keys. Only the manager did, who just left. I looked around the parking lot. Not a car in sight. The street lights shined dimly around me. My heart started to race as more messages came in. You are so ugly, you know that. No one would ever fall in love with you. Your family probably won't even miss you. You are disgusting. I should just end you right now. I started to cry, the phone shaking in my hands. 
Just as another text came in, a car pulled up in front of me. It was my family member coming to pick me up. I took a deep breath and quickly got into the car. Sorry I'm late. I got stuck at two red lights. Your manager already left. They just left you alone out here. Just drive, I accidentally screamed at them, tears streaming down my face. What's wrong? Did something happen at work? I was crying, shaking. They took my phone and looked at it, seeing the messages. What? Who the hell is texting you? I said I don't know who it is. Just drive. I want to get out of here. We went back to their place and they wanted to call the cops, but I told them not to. I had no idea who they were, where to find them, or any other information to make a police report against them. Instead, they called another family member who works in the IT field. After they heard the whole story, everything I've endured for almost two years, they told me I should have made new accounts from the beginning. I listened to them right then and there, and made new accounts on all my social media. I worked that job for about another month, but my family member had told my manager what had happened, so I was never put on closing shifts again. I was only given morning shifts, where I clicked out when the sun was still out, but I still didn't feel safe. They knew where I worked. My manager understood when I quit. All the harassment stopped. To this day, I still haven't received any more of those messages. Now I'm married, I still live in the city. And I don't live in that neighborhood anymore. I feel comfortable and I don't feel afraid that this person will find me again and stalk me. But even now, anytime I get a random message from someone who isn't on my friends list, my heart races for a second. Several years ago, I was off school for summer break. I was 16 at the time. My younger siblings were both at sleepaway camp. My parents both worked full time, and most of my friends were away. I ended up spending about a month almost alone at the house. Our phone system has always been a bit strange, since one of the phones has never worked. I didn't realize it, but my father had replaced the faulty phone. I spent my time eating and reading, lazing around the house. I started to notice something a bit strange happening with the phones. The phone would ring, and I would pick up. Shortly afterwards, the person on the other end would hang up. I didn't think anything of it, attributing it to the strange phone system. Sometimes I would forget to pick up the phone, and it would go to the answering machine, which I would be able to hear. And there was never a message left. I didn't find it particularly odd, because there was a good deal of normal calls as well. Now. One weekday, I ignored one or two calls. I was too lazy to get up and pick up. I heard the machine answer, and no message was left. I assumed that if it was important, the person would leave a message. I was in my room, reading and listening to music, when I heard the creaking of the front door. I got up from my bed, and walked out the long hallway towards the front door. I assumed the wind had blown it open, but it was a sunny, beautiful summer day, and there was barely a breeze. Suddenly, I froze. I heard the creaking of the floorboards, the wood in front of the door. Both of my parents were at work, and nobody should be coming over. I mustered up my energy and shouted out, Hello? I listened intently, waited for a few minutes, and peeked around the hallway. No one was there, but the front door was wide open. I hurried over and slammed it shut. A few hours later, my parents came home. I explained the front door, trying to justify it, telling them that it must have been my mind playing tricks. They responded by saying I should be really careful, because there had been three robberies in the neighborhood in the last few weeks during the day, when the robbers had checked that no one was home. I asked how they'd confirmed that no one was home, and my mother explained that they'd simply called the house to see if anyone would pick up. I was around seven years old, and very close to my uncle and aunt that lived a few towns over. We had a house phone, and I was allowed to make calls to people that were on the address book. I would call them once a week, 
just to know how they were and ask silly questions. Like, how's your day? How are your dogs? Or when are you going to come by? One day I accidentally pressed a wrong number while dialing and called someone else. A lady answered the phone and I started talking as if I was talking to my aunt. I guess as a kid, I didn't find her voice much different to my aunt's. I asked her how she was. She said she was okay, but asked what my name was, because apparently my number appeared as unknown. I told her, Tia, this is Grace. I'm using mom's phone. Her voice changed, and she started talking to me as if she knew me. She asked me questions about school, which I found odd, because she knew I was homeschooled. So I reminded her of how I was homeschooled. This went on for about three days. Around the same time each day, she would call. I would run to the phone and answer. We would talk for about half an hour. My mom would only allow me to make calls for less than 10 minutes to out of town numbers because they were expensive. So I told the woman who I thought was my aunt to call back when she wanted to because we couldn't pay the calls. We got close, talking about her day, how she was a teacher. I told her about stuff I liked and I never felt so close to her. Then one day, she asked me for my address. She said she had forgotten where I lived and wanted to visit. And that was a big red flag for me, as my uncle and aunt knew exactly where I lived. I got a bit scared and hung up. I started thinking about the weird stuff she said to me, like if I had a boyfriend, or what my favorite places to visit were. Questions my aunt would never ask. Next time she called, I told her I knew she wasn't my Tia, and that we couldn't keep talking anymore. But she responded saying, You are too friendly. It's sad we can't be friends anymore, but I know where to find you. We will see each other soon. And then she hung up. I got scared and went looking for my mom. I told her I called the wrong number and hoped she wouldn't ground me. She checked the number in the caller ID and then the address book. The phone number was different from my aunt's for only one number. It was a private phone, so it didn't appear on the big regional phone book. She called back, but no one picked up. I never told my mom what happened, just that I called the wrong number once. So creepy a lady of my childhood, let's not meet, ever. So this happened to me almost seven years ago now. I should give some background information before getting into things. At the time that this all happened, I was around 16 years old. I had a friend called Karen, who was dating a boy named John. At this point in time, Karen and John had been dating for maybe six months. And after going out with Karen and John on many occasions, they decided that they wanted to hook me up with John's friend, Cameron. At this point in time, I had met Cameron in person once. He was nice, so I gave him my social media, and we had chatted a couple of times. It's important to note that he didn't have my number or know where I live. Fast forward to a night, maybe a week or two after I met Cameron. I'm laying in bed, it's about 2 or 3 in the morning, and I get a call from an unknown number. I thought to myself, why is an unknown number calling me at this time of night? I decided to answer it and see who it was. So I answer the phone and say hi, and a man responds saying hi back. Since I didn't recognize the voice on the other end, I ask the person who they are. Instead of answering the question, the man tells me to look outside my window. Thinking it's a prank call, I tell the man off and hang up the phone. Once I did this, the number calls back again, but I didn't answer it. The person proceeds to call me another four times until I finally answer the phone. Which again, I ask who's calling. This time the person responds and tells me that one of my friends gave him my number. My stupid 16 year old mind is trying to rationalize this. And the only person I can think of is Cameron. Before I can say anything, he again tells me to look outside my window. And then I began hearing noises outside my window. Now, I should mention that my room is right beside my parents room. And being stupid, my first thought was that this fool was going to wake them up, and I'd never hear the end of it. Let me tell you, that thought soon turned into the last thing I would worry about that night. Anyway, at this point I'm starting to get creeped out. I'm thinking to myself, if this is Cameron, and Karen did give him my number, how the hell would he know where I live? 
So I reply to the man and say, Cameron? The man says yes and tells me to look out my window. I reply telling him to go home and hang up the phone again. Weirded out, I decide I'm going to get up and go to my basement and call Karen so that hopefully my parents don't hear me talking in my room. To get to my basement, I have to pass a door that is partially made of glass. So I get downstairs and call Karen. She answers and clearly she's half asleep. I tell Karen about the unknown call, which I'm assuming is from Cameron, and how he is telling me to look out my window because he's outside. And on top of this, that I can hear someone out there. Karen, now clearly awake, tells me that she had never given my number to Cameron or my address and calls John quickly from her home phone to see if maybe he did. John answers and tells Karen that not only had he not given out my information, but that he is with Cameron. They tell me if someone's outside, I need to hang up and call the police immediately. So I hang up the phone. And before I can even dial for anyone, I get another call. Guess who? It's the unknown number. So stupidly, I answer again. And before I can get a word in, the man tells me that he knows I'm in my basement. He saw me walk by my back door. Now I'm clearly disturbed, as I did just walk by my back door to get downstairs so I know someone is outside. Again, before I could say anything, the man tells me to come outside. So stupidly, I tell the person I'm calling the police and hung up the phone. Why I didn't call the police at this point, I really don't know. Probably because I was 16, stupid, and literally in panic mode. Not more than a minute later, I get another call. Unknown number. I answer again. The man tells me to come outside, or he's coming inside to get me. Clearly panicking at this point, I have this deep gut feeling that if I go outside, I'm never coming back. However, I do have to go by the back door again to get back upstairs. And that was equally terrifying to me. So I hang up the phone again and muster up the courage to run upstairs because the last place I wanted to be was in the part of the house no one else was in. I get more calls. The unknown number won't stop calling. Again, my 16 year old stupidity answers. This time, the voice on the phone sounds shook and says to me that the police stopped him outside my house and want to speak to me to make sure I know him. The phone gets passed off to someone who identifies himself by name with some title that I no longer remember and ask if I know the man outside my address. I quickly tell the voice on the phone I don't have any idea who the person calling me is and hung up the phone. I never did get another call again. However, I did sit there all night holding a bat and had problems sleeping for months. I want to also mention I didn't have many friends at this point in my life and looking back on this night, I thought maybe this was a prank taken too far. I begged the few friends I did have for months to admit which ones pulled this off, and they all to this day insist it's none of them. So, whatever got this person to stop calling me, thank God. And to the unknown caller, let's not meet. My family has always been big into the paranormal and they all have their own personal experiences with ghosts and things they couldn't explain. I always believed in ghosts, even though I'd never had a personal encounter. That was until one fateful night when I was awoken by my cell phone. This happened about seven or eight years ago when I was in sophomore in high school. My parents had recently went through a divorce and I was living with my dad at the time and my mom worked the night shift at a casino as a drink girl just to make ends meet. It was the middle of the night on a school night when I awoke to my cell phone going off. I looked at the caller ID to see who would be calling me that late at night. It said, caller unknown. I picked up the phone anyways, and what I heard on the other end still haunts me to this day. Hello, I said. I heard what sounded like wind on the other end. As if someone was running, I said hello a few more times before I heard a woman screaming my name pleading for me to help her. She kept giving off a blood-curdling scream, followed by, Ben, Ben, help me, Ben, help me. The wind coming through the receiver was so loud, it almost drowned out the woman. 
My first thought was that my mom was getting attacked after getting off her shift. I screamed back hysterical, Mom, Mom, and the woman replied with the same panicked and desperate cry for help. This continued for what felt like three minutes, and then the call ended. I ran upstairs in tears to wake my dad and tell him what had just happened, and I think that mom is in danger. I don't know how he calmed me down, but he did, and managed to convince me to go back to bed, and that he would try to get a hold of my mom. The next morning I woke up, hoping that I was just having a terrible nightmare. I opened my phone and go to the call log, and the unknown caller was still logged. I checked exactly to see how long I was on the phone for, and it said 8 minutes. Which is weird, because it didn't feel nearly that long. At school that day, I asked all my friends if they prank called me last night, and none of them owned up to it. And I believed them, because who would prank someone at 3am on a school night? Thankfully, I found out my mom was perfectly fine, and was not being attacked that night. But what my dad told me the next night, as I was getting ready for bed, is what really sent chills down my spine. Turns out that my great-grandma had passed the same night, about an hour before I got the phone call. At the time, I was still in college, but my hometown was a short drive away, so I ended up working at my local library. This part is relevant because I believe the subject of this story I obtained my information through these means. I've had numerous creepy encounters with people, mostly men, throughout my life. I'm a straight, cis male, but my short stature and boyish looks tend to attract a certain subset of creeps. Though not as much as a woman has to suffer, I can at least say I understand the psychological terror it can instill. But the library seemed to be like the epicenter of creeps, like this creepy dude who wanted to paint me in private. So, one morning during the summer of that year, after a pretty heavy night of drinking with some friends, I get a phone call from an unknown number. It's the early 2000s, so I wasn't one to ignore calls at the time, and it was coming in at a ridiculously early time, so I worried it was something serious. Well, on the other end was this guy who sounded like he lacked confidence. You could hear the quivering in his voice. He asked if he could speak to Charles. It was concerning some kind of business proposal. I told him he had the wrong number, but he kept insisting that it was okay, and he talked to me instead. Since this happened so long ago, and I was certainly hungover, I can't remember the details of what came next, except that it was very persistent, somewhat nonsensical, and very annoying. So I hung up on him after a little bit. A week or two would go by without incident, but one early morning, and another hungover one at that, another call came from a different unknown number. Same MO, asking for someone I didn't know about another deal, or home being sold. Whatever he could come up with, again, I told him he had the wrong number, and this time promptly hung up on him after he went through this spiel that it was okay and he could talk to me instead. This started happening with more frequency, seemingly at random, since he wasn't consistent with what day he'd call, but it was always super early. I still don't know why I continued to pick up unknown numbers, but even with the unsettling nature of the calls, I still wasn't 100% creeped out. Until one morning, when I got another call. Same setup, except after I once again told him he had the wrong number, and that I didn't want to hear another proposal or whatever, he said in a really creepy whisper that he wanted to see my nether regions. I told him if he didn't stop, I was going to call the cops. I heard him stutter, and then he hung up himself. I've never heard from him again. Now the reason why I think the library is relevant is because the place was mostly run by elderly women. They were as sweet as can be, and I loved working for them, but they had this penchant of trusting random weirdos with personal information about their staff. The creep who wanted to paint me, for example, learned my full name and what I was studying in school simply by asking one of them when they were stationed at the desk. Knowing I was immediately uncomfortable in his presence, he began to come in and linger around me when I would be stationed at the checkout. He liked to lean in real close, breathing heavily onto me, gross stuff like that. So I wouldn't be surprised if the phone creep got my information the same way, if he and the painter weren't one and the same. So creepy morning phone call guy 
Let's not meet. This takes place about six to seven years ago, when I was 17. I worked as a soft line sales associate at a large chain department store. My job was to walk around the floor and essentially keep everything organized. I would fold clothes, clean out the fitting rooms, put items that had been returned back in the right place, and help out any customers who needed it. Generally, I liked the job. It was easy, and all the girls I worked with were around my age, and really cool. One of my least favorite parts of the job was answering phone calls. The customer service desk would put relevant calls through to the phone in the appropriate department, and whomever was assigned to that area for their shift would answer it. These calls usually consisted of speaking to an employee from another store location about finding an item and putting it on hold for a customer, or speaking to a customer directly about whether or not we had the item they were looking for. It wouldn't have been so bad if the phones were cordless, but they were not. I have too many memories of having to run back and forth between the phone and the rest of the store as I looked for whatever the person on the other end wanted. I digress. One particular summer day, there was a call for the kids department. I made my way over to the phone and took the call. It was a man speaking in a low voice, as if he was trying to be quiet. The conversation went something like this. Hi, do you have any socks? Yes, we do. How big are they? Do you mean like what size? The kid socks are sized just like shoes are, so we have socks that fit a range of sizes, like 4 to 6 and so on. Yeah, but, like, how big are they about? I was very annoyed now, because what does he want from me? I don't know how to answer you. What shoe does the kid you're shopping for wear? Oh, uh, I'm using them for something else. It's, uh, an experiment. That's the last part of the conversation I remember. It was at that point that I was creeped out by more than his voice. He just sounded like a weirdo. I don't remember how the call ended. I know for sure I maintained my professionalism and found a way out of it. Because I can remember telling the girl I was working with at the time. I ended up telling most of the girls who worked there in soft lines with me. Because, all creepiness aside, I found it genuinely funny. It might be worth mentioning once again that all of us who worked in the clothing departments in the store were high school aged girls. It didn't take long for one of my colleagues to get a similar call. We happened to be working together and she came to tell me about the weird phone call she just had. We compared our experiences and decided at this point we should tell our manager since it apparently wasn't a one-off thing. The manager at the time was a woman around my mother's age who also happened to have daughters in high school. I was relieved when she looked disturbed as we recounted our stories and told us to come get her should he call back. If you guessed he did indeed call back, you get a cookie. The next few times he called, the same colleague got him and she said the conversation always started with him asking for socks and becoming progressively more creepy. He would always ask really specific details about how big the socks were and what colors we had. When asked anything about what he needed them for, he always gave some vague creepy answers like an experiment. The way she described it, he seemed to be escalating from his first few calls. It seemed he would ask more questions or be breathing more loudly as he called back more often. What bothers me the most about this now though is that it always had to be kids socks. He always called the kids department and he always confirmed he was looking for kids socks when asked if he would rather be put through to the men's department. The next time I got the call, I tried to be subtle about the fact I was getting the manager. I think that someone else made the mistake of saying something like, hold on, let me ask my manager. And by the time the manager got the call, he had already hung up. As soon as I heard, do you have any socks? I fought the urge to vomit as I tried to be casual. As he asked his inevitable, weirdly specific questions about sock sizes, I told him I had to place them on hold so I could go check. Of course I bolted for the manager's office at the back, probably looking like a lunatic. My manager dropped what she was doing to come back to the phone and take the call. The man was still on the line when she picked up, but as soon as she introduced herself and asked how she could help, he hung up. I didn't hear anything about him calling again after that, and I sincerely hope he got scared enough to knock it off. 
More likely though, he probably just started calling somewhere else. This may not seem that creepy, at the time I thought it was relatively harmless, but I've since heard similar stories about weird calls to retail workers. So dude with the weird affinity to children's socks, let's not meet. This happened when I was 19. I'm now in my mid-twenties. I still remember this very clearly because of how creeped out I was. Back then, I was living over 600 miles away from my parents in a different state. Even though there was a distance, my mom and I still talked on the phone at least twice a week and we were still very close. So when we found out her cancer was back, I didn't think twice about dropping everything to drive down to see her. A plane ticket would be too expensive, and I had a 10-year-old Toyota that might have been a bit beat up, but still got me from A to B cheaply and quietly. My parents weren't thrilled at the idea of me driving the 11 hours by myself, but my mind was made up, so they offered me a deal. I would stop at a rest stop every 2 to 3 hours and stretch my legs and call them, and in exchange for this courtesy, they would pay for my gas. If I didn't call within the 3 hour window though, they would assume I was in an accident and call me repeatedly, interrupting the audiobook or podcast they knew I would have on. I accepted the deal, and that's why I was at this particular rest stop at 2.45am. This was actually one of the nicer stops. Well lit, multiple vending machines that didn't have huge cages around them. The payphone wasn't broken, and it looked clean. There were a couple of cars with people sleeping in them. I still had 15 minutes before I had to check in with my parents. I got out of my car and stretched, and then almost jumped out of my skin when I heard a man's voice right behind me. Miss, can I ask you a favor? I turned around, and he's leaning against my car. I have no idea how he got there so fast. I didn't see him when I parked, but there he was, uncomfortably close to me. He looked like he's in his 40s. He didn't look dirty or twitchy. He was too close, but his body language wasn't screaming, threatening. And even though I was 19 years old, barely over 5 foot, and at a point in my life at 110 pounds soaking wet, and even though I had already binged a lot of true crime media, and knew the dangers of a girl my age alone at night, with an out-of-state license plate, my dumbass asked what he needs. He told me that he accidentally locked his keys and his phone in his truck. And could he borrow my phone real quick to call his friend? It will just take a second and it would really help him out. And I almost handed my phone over. I was reaching into my pocket to hand it to him with the Pollyanna, no problem. And then I actually looked at his face. Like I said, this rest stop was surprisingly well lit. And this guy looked really normal, except for his eyes. He had dead shark eyes. You know what I'm talking about. It's the Ted Bundy, Dick Cheney, actress in a Glade commercial, who is trying to convince us she's in love with a dumbass who doesn't know how air fresheners work eyes. They're smiling, but the eyes are vacant and creepy and staring way too hard. I got that feeling, that runaway feeling. I knew immediately not to hand this guy my only way to call for help. So I put on my best customer service smile and told him, Oh my god, I'm so sorry, I don't have a charger, and I need to save all my battery for the tracking app my parents have on my phone, and I need all that juice to call my parents, which I actually have to do right now. But good luck. And I turned and walked about 20 feet away, and he doesn't leave. He was still just leaning against my car, watching me, and now I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to leave him alone with my car, because he creeped me out, and he has a serial killer face. So going to the bathroom is out, but I also wanted to get away from him, prove I'm not going to help him, and maybe he'll leave. I could technically get in the car, but I would have to get really close to him, unless I crawled over my passenger seat side, and he's not moving. So I did the first thing that popped into my mind. I called my dad. And my dad, for the first time that night, didn't pick up the phone. When I heard his voicemail, I glanced back. The guy still hadn't moved. He's still just staring at me. 
So I faked a phone conversation with my dad. I angled my body so that the guy couldn't see that I hung up and loudly said that I should be at home in 30 minutes. When in reality, I was still at least four hours away. I mentioned exactly where I was and reassured the fake caller that this was a good rest stop with plenty of lighting and a couple visible security cameras. The guy still hadn't moved and I'm running out of steam on this fake conversation. In the years since, I thought of a lot of things I could have said while pretending to talk to my dad. But in that moment, I was beginning to seriously freak out and my mind went blank. So I hung up and didn't know what to do. I had hoped the fake phone call would scare him off, but he was still leaning on my car. I stalled for another couple of minutes. I bought cookies from the vending machine. I walked around a bit. At this point, he's been leaning against my car, staring at me for at least 10 minutes. I honestly debated waking up one of the men, sleeping in their cars, and asking for help. And just the thought of having to wake someone up to help me get in my own car annoyed me enough that I stopped stalling and headed back to my car. I decided that unless he touched me, I'm just going to pretend he isn't there. He waited until I was unlocking my car before he started talking to me again. He told me again that he really needs to use my phone. He's stranded here unless he can call a friend to bring him spare keys. He's not angry or begging. His voice sounds weirdly friendly, but he's been creepily watching me for way too long while blocking my exit, so I'm not falling for it. I almost pointed out the working payphone just in case I'm wrong about this and I was being a bitch to a guy who needs help. But then he leaned forward as I was getting in, and I lost all nerve. I slammed and locked the door as fast as possible. He didn't move until I started the car and put it in reverse. And then he finally stepped back and let me pull out. I didn't even have my seatbelt on. I was so focused on getting away from him. And then halfway out of the rest stop, my mom called me. My mom, who would freak out if I don't pick up, and who was already sick. I needed to put my seatbelt on. I could still see him in my mirror. He was standing right next to where I was parked, with his back to me. He was far enough away that I felt okay parking again to answer the phone, but I kept my engine running, and I kept watching him. I don't want to worry my mom, so I told her everything is fine, where I am, and when I'm expected to get there. Now that I was in my locked car, away from him, I was beginning to feel like I overreacted. She scolds me about speeding, and I turn her out because this guy is moving now. As my mom lectures me about road safety, I watch the guy cross to a truck, unlock the door and get in. The keys being locked in no longer seems to be an issue for him. I watch the truck head out to the freeway and drive out of sight. I had to pretend to be fine to not upset my mom. I didn't get back onto the road for another 20 minutes. And when I did, I didn't speed. I didn't want to see that truck. I only found out years later that the closest city to that rest stop has a major problem with sex trafficking. And that girls who look like they don't live nearby, or maybe look like they're living out of the cars, tend to be targets. I don't know if that's what was happening, or if he was just trying to scare me into handing my phone over. Either way, creepy guy at the rest stop. Let's not meet. In the summer of 2014, my band was on a semi-professional tour around the US. We started west and played through Salt Lake, Vegas, and into California. We played a couple cities in California before heading north towards Portland, Oregon. We played every night, and with a demanding performance schedule, we would often need to drive our van through the night to make it to the next city in time. Luckily, our drummer and trombone player love long distance driving and would take the wheel almost every leg of the tour. And the night after our show in Berkeley, California, we decided to drive the 10 hour trek to Portland overnight, so we wouldn't have to deal with the day traffic. This journey involves driving up the I-5. It was late into the night when we crossed the Oregon State boundary. As is usual for road trips, we consider a pit stop to gas up, use the bathroom, get snacks, etc. was in order and we looked up gas stations on our GPS. Luckily there was one coming up in a small town, and we crossed our fingers that it would be open. 
I apologize, but due to the rigorous tour schedule, lack of sleep, and day drinking at the time, I do not remember the name of that town. However, I will say that I knew the name of the town when this all happened, because I found it odd that it did not show up on any highway mile markers. We got to the gas station around 2 or 3 in the morning, and immediately felt like something was off. The town was a type of tiny, rink-a-dink rest stop towns you are used to finding on road trips, but the only building with any lights on was the gas station. There were a number of other buildings, but they all seemed dead. There were no illuminated storefront signs or any kind of activity. There were also no cars anywhere. We could of course chalk the weirdness up to the town being closed for the night, but it didn't help the immediate heebie-jeebiness that we all felt. The gas station was open and we stopped the van to gas up. Some of us stayed in the van to sleep, while the rest went into the gas station to get drinks and snacks. This is where things started to get weird. The night attendant was blasting uncensored tracks from Limp Bizkit and Corn. In retrospect, it isn't all that weird for a bored late night clerk to play his music loud during a shift, but it did nothing to help the unease we all felt. When we came in, about five of us or so, he politely turned the music down. Our trumpet player went to use the restroom and found that it was locked. A moment later, a girl came out. She wasn't wearing a uniform, so she must have been another customer. Both the attendant and this other customer were very friendly to all of us at first, asking us welcoming questions like where we were headed and about the tour. Soon, the questions turned from welcoming to strangely pointed. Both people asking us things like, so would you describe your hair as brown or black? That's a nice tour van. What's your make and model? Your name's Bob. Well, what's your last name? We got what we needed and left the store. The girl had become chummy with us and followed us out, asking more questions. We remained friendly, but when we got into the van, we expressed a mutual sentiment of, let's get out of here. We drove back to the highway and chalked the whole experience up to late night, small town weirdness. I was done for the day, so I curled up on my seat and started to doze off. The next thing I heard was a loud thud and the drummer who was driving saying, what the hell? My waking brain thought immediately that he had fallen asleep at the wheel or hit an animal or something. I was further confused when he sped the van up instead of slowing down or pulling over. As my grogginess subsided, I realized that almost all of us had been asleep aside from the drummer who was driving us and they were equally confused. The trombonist was in the front passenger seat, and I saw that there was a huge crack in the van's windshield right in front of him. Our guitarist was in the seat behind the driver's seat, and he was trying to brush something out of his hair. Our trumpet player was screaming, What happened? What's going on? Some dude on the side of the road just threw a boulder at us. We were driving well over the speed limit at this point, and we were all awake with general panic. Our trumpet player picked up her phone and dialed 911. She explained the situation to the operator and was only on the phone for about a minute before she said, No, we're not doing that. We're going to keep driving. I couldn't hear the operator on the other end, but our trumpet player's face suggested that this person did not like our answer. The call ended and she explained that emergency services wanted us to pull over immediately and wait for the cops. Hell no, we said to that. The dude who threw the rock obviously wanted to cause us harm and was probably planning on his throw to shatter the windshield instead of just crack it. He wanted the van to stop so he could rob us or worse. When things de-escalated, we recounted what had happened with our drummer. He couldn't make out any details about the guy other than he was tall, white, and looked homeless. We asked if he wanted to rest while someone else drove. But he said there was no way he was sleeping tonight and that he thought it was fine to drive. The night went on as usual and we made no more stops until daylight. We stopped at a car wash in a bigger Oregon city and vacuumed all the glass from the inside of the van. We spoke a lot about the whole experience in the next few days and realized how weird the encounter in the gas station was. We didn't have many explanations other than it was all just a freaky hills of eyes kind of night and we continued the rest of the tour. Fast forward to last year, I was talking to a musician friend of mine. 
about surreal tour stories, and she brought up this ghost town her band had found while driving from California into Oregon in 2017. Her story was similar to ours. Driving through the night, needed a pit stop, came to this small town that they didn't expect to find. When they got there, every building was boarded up on the doors and windows. The gas station was there, but it was inaccessible. The only sign of human life were porta potties installed outside the gas station. My friend described them as recently cleaned. A chill went up my spine when she told me this, and I immediately shared my band story. I could not do a whole lot of research on this town, as I did not remember its name or its exact location. I did stumble across a rumored concept of military built and operated puppet cities, where the army or air force will run a town as a front to hide weapons testing or other experiments. The towns act as a sort of buffer to civilian passerbys who might otherwise stumble onto classified stuff. I think this may have been what we experienced, since the gas station people were so interested in exactly who we were. Maybe a big white van driving through the middle of the night was just a little too suspicious for whatever operation to take lightly. The attack on the van and the emergency services telling us to stay put could have been an effort to keep us in town to interrogate us, but I doubt the military would resort to throwing large rocks at cars when there are safer methods to detaining people. I also considered that the town could have been home to a cult or drug ring. All I can know for sure was it was a series of increasingly odd experiences that made a story I will tell forever. About two years ago, me and my family moved from New Jersey to Florida for a fresh start. Before I start my encounter, I want to iterate my mental state at the time, because it contributes to how I acted at the time of the story. So the night of the move, my mother got a call from a close family friend. She had just become pregnant and had started to have complications and feared she had lost the baby. My mother, being the awesome woman she is, went over to help and watch her young son and calm her down and told her to go to the hospital to be sure and get herself checked. She and her husband rushed to the hospital and luckily she hadn't lost the baby. But it wasn't until one in the morning until my mother got back and I was still up waiting for her to get back. So yes, we were dead tired the next day. We had to pack everything up for the long trip to our new home in Florida while my father, who had just slept through the whole ordeal the night before, was not. But that's just me complaining. Anyway, I'm driving with my mother while my father is in a separate car, and I'm not exactly happy about the move. So tired and upset, we continued with our trip. We've always driven from New Jersey to Florida for years, and never had any really weird experiences out on the road. I'm not sure about my parents, but they've never talked about anything creepy in my 22 years I've been alive. And I've traveled with them, and trust me, they love to tell stories, and I do too. So when this happened, I was wholly unprepared for it. I certainly didn't help what happened the night before either. So we stop at one of the many stops on our way to Florida, and I think we're in the Carolinas or somewhere near there when we stopped. Now if you've never traveled before by car, a rest stop is a kind of place like a civic center or a rest area. These places are for travelers who either need a minute to stretch, go to the bathroom, or a place where they can safely rest for the night in their cars. These places are usually well lit, and they have vending machines for anyone who needs a snack or drink. It was late, maybe about 9 at night, and we stopped to stretch our legs and go to the bathroom. I wanted a few snacks, so I asked my mother for some dollar bills. She gave them to me, and I entered a nice little enclosed area that contained the machines. So I'm standing there alone, picking what I want, when this woman comes in. She's a short, skinny older woman who's dressed nice with bleach blonde hair. When I glanced at her and smiled politely, she comes right up to me and holds her hand out for a handshake and introduces herself. Dumbfounded, I shake her hand back and stupidly told her my name. After that, she launches into this whole tale of woe about how she lost her wedding ring, had a head wound, and that her car was out of gas, and that she needed some money, and other things I can't honestly remember. And 
I'm just standing there listening and trying to figure out how to get out of this situation. Now you have to understand, this was literally the first time anyone approached me at one of these stops. I don't think I have the most friendliest of faces for people to approach for help, even though I'm a girl. I'm tall, around 5'5 five five to 5'6. Five I'm taller than most girls, especially for this woman. Broad-shouldered, and I resemble my father, who doesn't have the most welcoming of faces either, and acts it. But me, I'm a bleeding heart, and I never want to be rude to people. But in this situation, I would have been if it hadn't been so out of the blue. When I'm in situations that are new to me, I tend to freeze up and can't think. I don't know how to act or what to do in situations that I'm not expecting. As you can guess, I'm a big introvert and socially awkward, but I don't have a problem with telling people to piss off. But in this situation, I'm outright panicked and just want to get away from this weird woman. And I say weird because that head injury I mentioned, she didn't have one, not even a bruise. And she was talking so fast and non-stop, I couldn't even tell her no, I can't help her, or even try. For some reason, being polite was more important than getting out of the situation. So I'm standing there, exhausted to my bones, about to shove what little money I have at her, so she just goes away. When my mother walks in, my badass of a mother comes right in and says that I can't, and tells me to come with her. This woman takes a step back, and I realized just how close she was. I hadn't even noticed she was steadily coming closer to me as she was talking. She tells my mother how beautiful and nice I am, when really, I look like a greasy mess, because I don't care about my appearance when I take a road trip. My mother doesn't really respond, and she has me by the arm walking me towards the bathroom, asking if I'm okay. The woman got out of there, and goes in the opposite direction of where she said her car was, Looking back on it all, at the time I thought I was just weird, and I was certainly weirded out by it all, but I just thought whatever. But after listening to YouTube Reddit posts of let's not meet and such, I realized how lucky I was, two years later that the situation hadn't escalated. I think the reason she approached me was because of the dollar bills I mentioned earlier. They were folded, and it looked like I had a lot on me, when in reality, I only had six or seven dollars. And because it was probably obvious to her how tired I was, and how much of an easy score she would have gotten in my tired, grumpy state. I hope you aren't planning on traveling alone, but if you are, be careful of people. Even completely normal looking ones, you can never be too careful. Especially all the people looking for an easy score. So weird woman who was lying through her teeth, wanting the six bucks in my hand. Let's never meet. In September of 2002, my wife was in her seventh month of pregnancy with our first child. We lived in Ohio at the time, and she wanted a baby shower. Since most of her family and close friends lived in Baltimore, Maryland, we planned that we would travel to Baltimore and have the baby shower there on Saturday, October 19th, 2002. But October 3rd and 4th brought the horrifying realization that a serial killer was on the loose in Baltimore, D.C. area. We naturally re-examined our plans, but decided to go through with them all the same. After all, the likelihood of being this sniper's victim was practically zero from a statistical point of view. My wife and I listened to the news of the Beltway sniper in the days leading up to our trip. It was getting a bit more scary as the death count raised to nine, and there were two additional people who had been wounded. In the eleventh hour, we decided we would still go but we would take the Pennsylvania Turnpike over to I-70, and then I-70 through to Hagerstown, Maryland, then Frederick, Maryland, and then into Baltimore. Around 5 p.m. on Friday, October 18th, 2002, my wife and I pick up my mom and my stepsister, and we set out for Baltimore. The trip was going slowly, but it was otherwise uneventful. We had used the time to review the plans of what to do when we needed to stop, during our trip out. The plan was that we all get together. We don't dilly-dally. We get out of the car and into a building quickly and vice versa. And no one stays in the car alone. Well, as happens eventually, around 2.45 a.m. on Saturday morning, we all needed a restroom break. We pulled off into a rest stop near Frederick and parked right in front of the door to the bathroom facility. The rest area was largely empty, but 
There was a dark blue, late model, four-door sedan, parked heading in, facing the door to the restroom. I parked next to it, and we all quickly reviewed the rules. If I finished first, I would wait for them, and we would all return to the car together. We then got out and raced to the restrooms. As I ran into the restroom area, I didn't pay too much attention to the car that we parked next to, other than to make sure they didn't open their doors. The night was crisp and full of moisture. I finished first, and so stood out by the exit, but stayed inside the building. The doors and the walls were all glass, so I nervously scanned the parking lot for anything off-looking. Satisfied that there was nothing ominous in the parking lot, I turned my attention to the blue sedan. I travel a lot, so I naturally took note that the license plates were from New Jersey. In the front seat were two African-American males. The one behind the steering wheel was middle-aged. He was awake and staring back at me. Next to him was a sleeping teenager. I remember feeling a chill go down my spine as I watched him watching me. At this time, the authorities hadn't released information on the snipers, and they didn't know the ominous role the car played in the killing spree, so I was ignorant of the danger these two really presented. A few minutes passed before my family returned, and we all ran back to the car. In a flash, we sped away and continued on to our destination. I remember noticing something weird about their trunk. My family was poor growing up, so sometimes we had to pop out a broken lock and couldn't afford to fix it right away. So we would rig the trunk to open using a screwdriver. I remember thinking that's what they must have done with their trunk. It turns out it was the hole they can shoot out through while staying concealed. The baby shower went well and my wife had fun. We did not go out for our meals, but slept and ate at our mom's house in Baltimore. On Sunday morning, it was time to go. We took a much more northern route, going home, just to be safe. About a week or so later, once they captured the Beltway snipers, you can imagine the renewed chills running down my spine, when in the newspaper, the face of that man that had been staring at me when we stopped to go to the bathroom at the rest stop, John Allen Muhammad, was staring back at me again. It was also a photo of the car we had parked next to, and scarier still, the reports that they had been captured in the exact same rest stop where we had parked next to them about a week earlier. I can only assume that the teenage boy that had been asleep next to him was Lee Boyd Malvo. Fortunately, they both were in the front seat, and this is where they had planned to hide out and sleep, so they wouldn't have likely killed at this rest stop. Therefore, I feel we weren't in danger during this encounter. Had it been elsewhere, though, we may have well been. This happened to my wife while we were dating. When we started dating, I lived in South New Hampshire while she lived in Philadelphia. Most of the time, I would come down and visit her. Since she works at a college, she had a few weeks off in December. She decided to come up and stay with me. She packed a week's worth of clothes and her cat inside of a car and drove up after work. Driving on the interstate at night means coffee, which means bathroom breaks. She pulls into a rest stop in Connecticut. By rest stop, I mean a bathroom, vending machine, and a rack of tourist brochures. As she's walking towards the building, a man, wearing jeans, an army jacket, and knit cap, walks out between two cars, startling her. The man immediately reaches out and grabs her head with both hands. He is standing in front of her, arms out straight. She's not able to pull his hands off her head. He's staring into her eyes with a detached expression. As she's described it, it's the same expression I use when I'm trying to debug code or figure out why something isn't working. He's moving her head back and forth, keeping her off balance, while keeping her at arm's length. She stares back. He seems to evaluate her for a minute or two, then lets go and quickly walks into a wooded section. She runs into the rest stop and finds an attendant. She uses the bathroom, then tells the attendant, the attendant is willing to walk her out to her car and make sure that she leaves safely. She walks out with the attendant and notes that a white van that was previously in the lot is gone. She gets in the car, thanks the attendant, and drives off. About ten minutes later, she processed what happened and calls me. The bit about the van worried her, but terrifies me. We talk for a little bit. She is familiar with law enforcement and offenders, and has a belief that this wasn't just a failed mugging. She talked to the police, 
but they didn't seem to be too interested in the incident. What worried her the most was that her cat would have suffered in the cold if something happened to her. After that, every time I drove between New Hampshire and Pennsylvania, I'd stop at that rest stop for a few minutes and look for white vans or that man. I don't know what I would have done or what could be done, but perhaps it's some small way of talking myself into believing that we have control over our lives. Perhaps there's a man in a green army jacket who believes he's found a different way of believing he has control over what happens in his life. I was in a group on Facebook where people share different kinds of stories, mostly funny stories. I usually post comments there using my dummy account and most of the people there use dummy accounts as well. I had a fun conversation with this guy using a dummy account named Luffy, who claimed to be 21 years old. We exchanged messages on Facebook without actually adding each other. We both found out that we lived nearby each other, so we decided to meet up and have lunch in a small mall near our school. I chose a place to meet where it's really crowded, since I had a dress rehearsal for a play. He told me that he would wait for me in a burger stand near our school. The night before, we sent each other pictures. I was excited to meet him since he looked pretty fun to hang out with. By 4pm, I stood beside the burger stand. A heavily tinted red car stopped at the street in front of me. Then I received a text message from him asking me to go inside the red car. Since I've read a lot of Let's Not Meet stories, I decided to go with my instinct and sent him a text saying that I wouldn't get in the car unless he gets out and shows himself. What happened next made me promise myself that I would never meet anyone from the internet ever again. A man, most likely in his 30s, got out of the car and started to clutch me by my arm and kept tugging me. I screamed like I've never screamed before, making it noticeable since there are civilians there as well. The guy who watched over the burger stand came to us and asked what's wrong, clearly concerned. She's my daughter. She's in big trouble. She ran away from the house. Was this creep's defense? I denied it every time, and the burger guy told him that he would alert the guards from our school. That's when Luffy let go of my arm, got inside his car, muttering to himself, and drove away. When the guards came, I told them everything, and I was never let out of the school that day without my guardian picking me up. So Luffy, whoever and wherever you are, let's not meet again. I am a 29 year old female, so I switched my career in healthcare to follow my dream of learning to work on cars. I was hired this past May at a dealership as a quick service mechanic and fell in love immediately with everything about it and my co-workers. I had noticed how cute my trainer was. Not only was he cute, but he was very patient with training me. I was so new to working on cars, I needed to learn the basics, and he was so cute and nice about everything. His name is Nick. Me and Nick hit it off in every way. He asked me on our first date to go geocaching, swoon. Nick and I have been side by side since then. I loved everyone I worked with, always laughing and playing pranks on each other, but always helping each other and busting our asses to make the customers happy. I should add that my best friend works there, and another good friend of ours had gotten hired too. We were a close-knit family in the quick service department. Well, I didn't make it past my probationary period because I was just a bit slower. So Nick has a full mechanic garage at his dad's place and I'd meet him after work so we could make some side money. So about a month and a half ago, Nick and I decided to get an apartment together and it's been amazing. I've been bringing him to work, grabbing him on lunch break and picking him up, which I love because I can say hey to all my old coworkers. That being said, I should add that Nick doesn't have any social media and we are together literally all the time, except when he's working. Here's where it gets crazy. I get a message request on Facebook from some random girl saying, I can't believe what I'm seeing. Nick is my man and he's in your profile photo. He's been my man for seven months. I immediately went into panic mode. I called him at work asking who the girl is. He was just as confused. The more I talked to this girl to try and figure out what the hell's going on, 
the more she said weirdly specific things about Nick. Like the truck he drives, the meet up at his dad's shop. No one would know about his dad's shop because he never talks about it. She knew his phone number and everything, but she could never provide proof. Screenshot conversations, photos of the two of them together, nothing. We got to a point where it felt like the whole thing was real and that her and I were going to team up, but she never answered my calls, only messages. But after Nick and I had a huge talk about it, I knew that something wasn't right about this girl. I had to get to the bottom of it. I started to get pretty scared when one day I dropped Nick off at lunch. A minute went by and I get a message saying, damn, Nick looks sexy in that hoodie today. This shook me up. I asked what color and she said the correct color. At this point, my first thought is stalker, like actually watching us. I told Nick about how she knew what he was wearing and he was super creeped out. Then when I pick him up, I'll usually park by the quiet side of the building where no one can really see me. This time though, a work truck drives by me real slowly. I pretend not to notice him because I was in no mood to chat with anyone and I recognize the driver as a former coworker of mine. I'd only spoken to him maybe two times during my time at the dealership, however we were friends on Facebook. Within a minute of him driving by, the girlfriend messages me saying, you're waiting for Nick on the side of the building right now. In that moment I started to freak out. This dude is pretending to be my boyfriend's girlfriend. Then after talking to Nick about it, yeah, he's the only one from work that knows Nick's dad had a shop. Nick had worked on this guy's truck before. They aren't friends, but chat here and there. Well, not anymore. But I just don't know why. He was saying such gross things to me, as he was pretending to be my boyfriend's girlfriend. If he's capable of doing this, who knows what else he's capable of. He's also a giant dude in his 40s, with children of his own. I see this dude every day, and Nick still works with him. He's in a different department than Nick, thank God. The last interaction was about three months ago. Nothing much has happened, but I still have nightmares about him. And any time I hear a creak in the house, or the cat knocks something over, I instantly assume it's him. Nick and I move into a new place, closer to his work, and I've stopped bringing him to work. Flash forward to a little after. Our house sits really close to the street, about 25 foot. And I have the curtains open, and the windows cracked, because it was a bit warmer than usual today. So I am on the couch in our living room, painting a model dinosaur I picked up today, and Nick is in the kitchen vacuuming something he spilled. It's dark out at this point, and the neighbor across the street has his porch light on. I thought I heard something outside, so I look out the window to my right, and I see the silhouette of a man standing on the street, full body facing the window, just staring at me. When my brain caught up with what my eyes were seeing, I freaked out. The dude turned and booked it down the street. I ran over to tell Nick, and he was getting ready to run outside to find the guy. I see a black truck. It was the same make and model of the stalker dude. He peeled out past my house and out of our neighborhood. I was freaking out. Nick and I went out to walk around the house just to see, and we saw freshest looking male sized footprints in the snow in our yard. Like the dude climbed our three foot retaining wall and walked a few feet into our yard and turned around and left. Then later got ballsy and stood on the street right outside my living room window. I didn't bother calling the police this time because they made me feel like the issue was just some prank or something. Anyways, I'm not sure how long the guy was watching me from the street, but damn, I thought this was all over, but I guess not. Okay, so this started when I was 17. Back in the day of the old Nokia 7210 and WAP instead of Wi-Fi, I joined a social networking site, a mix between Reddit and Facebook, all anonymous, and pictures were only just able to be uploaded. I was me, and I used my actual pictures, as did most people. Not unlike Reddit, the place was a decent community full of banter and flirting, but I never really wanted more than to chat when I was bored. I was talking to a girl. I was 17, she was 16. She is called Sophie, and we spoke for months. Almost a year, and we called each other daily. I was besotted. She was beautiful, and I wondered why the hell someone so beautiful, and actually a decent woman, would like me. After a year, we arranged to meet. She lived in my city anyway, 
so it would be easy. We decided to meet in Asda, because we were both about ten minutes from there, and we were also odd. She didn't show up. After she said she did show up, and saw me, and described what I was wearing, she stated she bottled out, because I looked amazing, and she didn't deserve me. Anyway, a month and a few more failed meets went by, and I got fed up and decided to call it a day. She called and said she didn't meet me because she lied about herself, then showed me a picture of herself, completely not my type. Fast forward nine years, and she's crossed paths with me a few times, but nothing odd. But one night, I'm in bed and hear a knock on my window. I live in a ground floor flat. I look outside, and there's a random woman there. It's her. I had a mini shit fit and told her to go away. I have no idea how she found my address, as I had moved several times over the years. I also used to get random friend requests on Facebook and random texts when I changed my number. I'd like to think I have pretty decent instincts now when it comes to knowing who has bad intentions, but I wasn't always as cautious and observant as I am now. When I was in high school, I always felt so ugly. I had low self-esteem and anxiety, which was really more of a problem rather than my looks. So if any one of the opposite sex gave me even a little attention, I would start to like them. I was pretty innocent despite how desperate I was, having only kissed one boy. So when I was 17, and a college guy put interest into me, I immediately clung to him. I used an app before Tinder, and I met a guy who lived 7 hours from my home city. His name was Brandon, and he was gorgeous. Blonde hair, muscular, blue eyes. He played soccer for his university, and was 19 years old. Honestly, he wasn't my usual type. I really like guys with dark hair and eyes. I still do. But he was really handsome, and really kind. He would shower me with compliments, and talk to me all the time. I lived alone in an apartment with just my cats, so when I would get lonely or scared, he always comforted me. A month into talking, and he started asking for pictures, not ones of my face. Now, this was nearly six years ago, and I didn't have a good concept of stranger danger on the internet. I mean smartphones had only really been around for two or three years at this point, at least in my school with my age group. 17 year old me, who was so insecure, wanted to make him happy. Because I couldn't believe I had gotten a guy like him, I was ready to do anything he asked. I never sent naked pictures, I was too insecure for that. But I would send pictures of me in my bra. He would shower me with compliments, saying how sexy and beautiful I was, and I fell for every word. With time, I started to get upset though. I wanted to see him. I would always send pictures when he asked, but he never sent me any. He would show me body pictures of him with his shirt off or things, but the pictures were always a bad quality. When I started getting too persistent, he promised he would start calling me. For some reason, this appeased me, and we talked many times a week. After a couple of months, he got increasingly more sexual with me. This made me nervous, since I only ever kissed one boy, but it also made me a little excited. It felt good to be wanted by someone I'd really grown to like. This was all during the first semester of my senior year of high school, and I was going to turn 18 the next semester in late January. As it got close to Christmas time, he started to talk about coming to see me for my birthday. This had me really excited, since I wanted to see him in person so badly. We had first talked about me going to see him, something he had insisted on, but I chickened out and said I couldn't do the drive alone. An excuse. I really didn't want to go to an older guy's house and stay with him alone. My own house made me feel more safe. We planned on a weekend after my birthday, and everything seemed fine. But then one day, in my choir class, my best friend, an exchange student from Germany, was talking with me about him. I was telling her about him and showing pictures, and she got very unsettled. Have you seen him on video? I told her no, and she gave me a skeptical look. Something doesn't feel right. There is no way he's real. Not that you couldn't date someone like him, but he's too perfect. She was very direct and blunt with me about it, something my other friends weren't. So I took her words deeply, and I'm so thankful I did. 
I immediately asked him for a picture of his face. He made up some excuse about how he couldn't take a picture right then, so I persisted, asking every day. Finally, my instincts were kicking in, and I was getting scared. I told him I wanted to do a video call. He said no. I fought him on it for hours one night, telling him that if he tells me the truth, I won't get mad. He refused. I put the name he gave me into Facebook, determined to find him on my own, if he wasn't going to give in. Nothing came up on him. I texted him telling him I couldn't find his Facebook, and he gave in, giving me a completely different name, and told me, that's me. I remember just feeling cold as I read that. I looked up the account, and everything he told me was a lie. His name, his face, his age. He was 25, not 19. I was terrified. I thought I had been talking to someone just two years older, which is legal in my state, but he was eight years older. I immediately stopped texting him. That's when he started getting obsessive. He would text me dozens of times a day, call me over and over again. He would beg me to answer him, to give him a second chance. Then he started threatening me to answer. He told me he saved all of my photos. He kept them all and told me he would send them to my friends and family on Facebook, show everyone me and my bra, and show our text messages, talking about what he would do to me sexually if we met. Looking back, all of that was more damaging to him than me. But I was young and stupid and afraid. I hated my body so much and I was terrified of people seeing it. So I started talking to him again, more reserved and cautious this time. The days inched closer to my birthday and the weekend we had planned. Our messages had become bland and short since I was trying to make him lose interest in me, but he never gave up. If I took too long to message, then he would threaten me again. My birthday fell on a Monday that year and he sent me all kinds of messages. I don't even remember what I did that birthday. I didn't have many friends and I never liked to celebrate, so it was probably small. When Friday hit, I got a text from him that morning saying he was driving to my city and that he would pick me up from my school. I was terrified. I had lost a lot of friends this semester before, so they had no clue about my situation. Out of desperation, I went to one of my guy friends, who I hadn't talked to in a couple of months, and spilled everything to him. He was a longtime friend, so he was sympathetic and promised to follow me home that day. I went straight to my car, ignoring the mass amounts of texts, saying, Where are you? And, I'm here. My friend drove behind me all the way to my apartment, which he had no clue I was living in, and stayed with me as I cried for a while. I turned my phone off, and my friend left later that night. Brandon had no clue where I lived, but I was still paranoid. What if somehow he found me? Only three people knew where I lived, four, now with my guy friend, and he didn't come in contact with any of them. When I finally turned my phone on, he was threatening me again. I was so exhausted and fed up, I started spam texting him, yelling and venting. I told him how stressed he had made me and how what he was doing was wrong. I told him to send the pictures and that I didn't care anymore. I started to attack his character, telling him how no one could love him if he hides who he is and then treats people like shit when they catch him in a lie. Thankfully for me, he had enough care for me to take my words to heart. He apologized and told me he deleted all the photos. He swore to leave me alone as long as we can still talk once in a while as friends. I agreed, even though I knew I was lying. I talked to him for a month, short responses, until he finally gave up. Even though at 22, I still see his name appear sometimes. I blocked his number and deleted him on everything, but his name still shows up sometimes on my Instagram or Snapchat when he's trying to re-add me. He is the reason I don't give my name or picture out. He isn't the first stalker I experienced. To Brandon, who lied and collected pictures of me, and then threatened me with them. Let's not meet. So this was really before catfishing became a term we used. Though the act itself has been around as long as social media has. This was back during my freshman year of college, and it was during the MySpace era. In college, I made friends with someone in my honors colloquium class, Leslie, and she in turn introduced me to many of her other friends, who then became my friends. They'd all known each other for years, but were very welcoming to me, 
and I felt very much like a part of the group. That being said, I didn't really know them that well when this happened. What they did seemed, well, not like them. But then I realized I didn't exactly know what was like them. A member of the group, Catherine, was going away to school in Boston, and so the night before, we all decided to have a going away party of sorts. We were going to visit another friend, Tamara, who was going to school in Philadelphia, which was about an hour away, and then we were going to just have fun in the city. Our designated meeting place to drive down there was Dunkin' Donuts. When I got there, Leslie was there with our friends, Samantha and Anthony, and Leslie looked pissed. She was sitting there with her arms crossed, kind of staring at nothing, but with an angry look on her face. As far as Samantha and Anthony, they kept looking at the door, and they seemed both nervous and shifty. I could tell they were on edge. I sat down at the table of awkwardness, since we had to wait on Catherine and a couple more friends, and things got awkward when no one was talking. Finally, I was just like, what is the deal with you three? Leslie replied, you should ask them, gesturing to Anthony and Samantha. They suddenly looked guilty, but before they could answer, the door opened again, and they both went from looking guilty to anxious and mildly scared. I looked at the door and just saw a normal guy, pretty nondescript. When he walked in, he just kind of glanced around the room, like he was looking for someone. Anthony and Samantha wouldn't say anything. Leslie just kept huffing and shaking her head, and all three kept looking over at this guy as he sat down. As soon as Catherine and the others got there, it was like we couldn't get out there fast enough. Catherine, our friends Evan and Julie, and I were very confused. It was on the way to Philadelphia that we learned the truth. It was Leslie who told us. Apparently, Anthony and Samantha had created a fake MySpace account, and they'd been catfishing this guy, Calvin. We didn't know the term catfishing yet, but that's what it was. They had created a fake account using a picture of an actress or singer or something. I can't remember. Only her face was obscured. Apparently this had been going on for a couple of weeks, and the conversations had gotten serious. Like Calvin, seemed to really like this fake girl they had created. I didn't know why they did this, and when I asked them, they didn't really have a reason. Mostly they were just bored. It turned out... They told him to meet at the Dunkin' Donuts at the time we were there. I think that once he showed up, Anthony and Samantha realized that this wasn't just a game. That Calvin was a real person with real feelings, and I do think they felt badly about what they had done. But it was too late. They couldn't take it back. There was no reason they had chosen Calvin. He was just some random guy they had picked. I guess Leslie had found out about it a couple of days prior and told him to end it. And that's why she was so angry at them, because they had told her what happened, that Calvin was supposed to be there. After that, I never really saw Anthony and Samantha in the same way. These weren't people I wanted to be friends with, especially when I saw the message, and saw how much they had gotten Calvin to like them. I thought this would be the end of it. I was wrong. About a week later, everyone came to my house for pizza and just hung out, and Anthony and Samantha told us they had gotten a message from Calvin. I didn't think much of it, because I already knew he'd been messaging their fake account, wanting to know why she stood him up, and he seemed really upset, especially when this fake girl stopped replying. But no, that wasn't what Samantha and Anthony meant. He hadn't messaged the fake account, he had messaged their accounts. I remember them telling me that, my sharp intake of breath, the way my heart rate increased, that unnerved me. The messages were more of the same. But Calvin also made it clear he knew what they had done, and he seemed even angrier. Anthony in particular got a very long, furious message from Calvin. I don't want to say that I thought they deserved it, but honestly, they had done a shitty thing, and there were some consequences. I figured it would die down in a couple of days, but it didn't. A few days after Calvin had messaged Anthony and Samantha, he started messaging the rest of us who had been in Dunkin' Donuts that night. Now this really scared me. Keep in mind that I was already dealing with some other stalker situation, so I was understandably on edge, and this guy had found me. I didn't know much about computers, but I thought he must have traced Anthony and Samantha's IP or something, since they'd used their own computers for the account. But when it came to the rest of us, we didn't understand. How had he found us? My theory 
is that once he found Anthony and Samantha, he looked through their friends list and recognized us from our pictures, but I don't know for sure. All of his messages came on MySpace, so at least he wasn't texting us and stuff. But still, his messages were very angry. He kept saying things like, How could you do this to me? And, You made a fool of me. How dare you? I thought about replying, but Evan had already done that already. Telling Calvin that we weren't responsible, and he didn't believe him. Honestly, Evan totally sold Anthony and Samantha out, but we figured that Calvin already knew they were the ringleaders. He just didn't know that they were the sole perpetrators. Instead, thinking we all had a hand in it. I figured there was no point in defending myself, since Calvin didn't believe Evan when he had tried. This went on for a couple of weeks, and it seemed like Calvin was getting increasingly angry the more we ignored him. Finally, I had had enough and was just like, for God's sake. I replied to him again that we weren't responsible, corroborating Evan's story. I didn't actually put all the blame on Anthony and Samantha, but I told Calvin that it was just a couple of people in the group. Then I apologized, though I think that only made him angrier. He didn't believe anything we said, so I blocked him. We all did, but he just kept making new accounts. In two weeks, he probably made three different profiles, in addition to his original one. When I finally defended myself, Calvin messaged me back and said, You made me into a fool, an idiot, and one day, you'll know how that feels, and I think you will. Maybe it was because of everything that happened with this guy, but that sounded like a threat, like he was going to personally make sure I knew how we had made him feel. We were lucky. As far as I know, Calvin never did anything beyond messaging us aggressively. It could have been a lot worse. Eventually, Calvin stopped messaging us and then deleted his account. I felt bad for the guy. Anthony and Samantha had been wrong, but what Calvin was doing to us was wrong too. The harassment. Eventually he stopped though after a couple of months and I never saw him again. I slowly drifted apart from the group. First Anthony and Samantha for obvious reasons, then Catherine, then Julie, Evan, and Leslie. I wasn't too broken up about the first two because they weren't the kind of people I wanted to be friends with. Not only had they done a shitty thing, they had brought Calvin into our lives. Like opening a door and inviting someone in. I was catfished by a creepy, much older guy. I was 17 and in the 11th grade, I usually didn't accept random requests on my Instagram, especially if we had no mutual friends. I took my page off private for a while, so anyone could follow me. This is when I get a notification that Mark started following me. The page had a normal following, not small enough to question whether it was a fake account or not. He had multiple pictures of himself with friends and family which included captions. His comments were off for all of his posts, which wasn't a red flag since I had mine off too. Immediately after following me, he went through my profile and liked all my photos. He was a fit, good looking guy, so I was flattered. Not long after, he DM'd me, replying to a story of mine, asking me if I was from New York City and that he was from there too. We immediately hit it off and DM'd non-stop for a while. It didn't feel forced, and we never ran out of things to talk about. We eventually swapped phone numbers and started texting. He told me he was studying at a really good university, which was in a city two hours away from where we both lived. Our talks escalated to day-to-day -day phone calls, which lasted for hours. I sincerely started growing feelings for him, and he made it clear he felt the same for me. We would talk about our deepest insecurities, our past, what we wanted our futures to look like. It had been about two months of talking, and I was undeniably eager to meet up in person. He would tell me he was coming to visit home on the weekend, but would always come up with an excuse as to why he couldn't make it. He gave very convincing and detailed excuses, never vague, so I didn't question it. I hadn't told any friends about him until my best friend and I had to sleep over. I ended up telling her about him, showed her his pictures, and didn't leave out that we hadn't met yet. Wanting to look out for me, she suggested I ask him to video chat to make sure he is who he says he is before meeting up. She told me she didn't want to freak me out, but that she was sure she had seen the pictures on Tumblr before. There is a tool on Google 
that can be used to locate social media accounts and articles where the pictures had been posted. While she was at that, I called him and asked him if he was home and alone, before asking him to video chat, so he couldn't make up an excuse on the spot. He said he was home and alone, but couldn't video chat because of his weak internet connection. My heart sank into my stomach. The possibility of being catfished was not far-fetched anymore. I quickly downloaded WhatsApp because I remembered him telling me he spoke to his parents on it. But before doing that though, my friend showed me the results she found, which devastated me to my core. The man in the photo was a French model and singer. We found the exact pictures that he used on his catfish profile on an actual verified Instagram account. My devastation turned into anger, then turned into absolute disgust and revulsion when I saw his profile picture on WhatsApp. He was evidently much older than he claimed he was, probably in his late thirties, lied about being a university student. I wanted to crawl into a hole and die. I started to sob uncontrollably and confronted him on WhatsApp. He went on to explain how he came across my profile and desperately wanted to get to know me. He said he knew I wouldn't be interested in who he actually is and wouldn't be attracted to him. So instead he used his fake account, which he was already using and active on prior to coming across my profile. He said he came close to coming clean multiple times, but was afraid of how I would react. He said even though his persona was fake, everything else was genuine. Turns out, he was a 31-year-old mechanic and living with his parents. He even confessed to driving to my neighborhood, finding my high school, and following me around as I went about my day. I blocked him off WhatsApp, then he quickly started texting my number, begging me not to block him off that too and to give him a chance to explain things face to face. I went on to block him off everything, feeling absolutely heartbroken and betrayed while doing so. I spent months of my life daydreaming and fantasizing what it would be like when we finally met in person and where it would go from there. I grew genuine feelings for him and even considered applying for the same university that he was supposedly studying at. I got over it eventually, but I've definitely grown to be very paranoid and distrust when it comes to meeting people online. I am happily married now, but I wonder what would have happened if he and I met in person and the consequences I would have faced for being so naive and oblivious.